Book Two, The Fugue, Part Five, Revels. Flee into some forgotten night and be of all dark long my moon bright company. Beyond the rumor, even of paradise, come there out of all remembrance make our home. Walter de la Mer, The Tryst. Chapter One, Cal among miracles. True joy is a profound remembering, and true grief the same. Thus it was when the dust storm that had snatched Cal up finally died, and he opened his eyes to see the fugue spread before him. He felt as though the few fragile moments of epiphany he'd tasted in his twenty-six years, tasted but always lost, were here redeemed and wed. He'd grasped fragments of this delight before, heard rumor of it in the womb dream and the dream of love, seen its consequence in sudden good and sudden laughter, known it in lullabies. But never until now the whole... The thing entire. It would be, he idly thought, a fine time to die, and a finer time still to live, with so much laid out before him. He was on a hill, not high, but high enough to offer a vantage point. He got to his feet and surveyed this newfound land. The unknotting of the carpet had by no means finished. The raptures of the loom were far too complex to be so readily reversed. But the groundwork was laid: hills, fields, forest, and much else besides. Last time he'd set eyes on this place it had been from a bird's eye view, and the landscape had seemed various enough. But from the human perspective, its profusion verged on the riotous. It was as if a vast suitcase, packed in great haste, had been upturned, its contents scattered in hopeless disarray. There appeared to be no system to the geography, just a random assembling of spots the seer kind had loved enough to snatch from destruction. Butterfly copses and placid water meadows. Layers and walled sanctuaries, keeps, rivers, and standing stones. Few of these locations were complete. Most were slivers and snatches, fragments of the kingdom ceded to the fugue behind humanity's back. The haunted corners of familiar rooms that would neither be missed nor mourned, where children had perhaps seen ghosts or saints, where the fugitive might be comforted and not know why, and the suicide find reason for another breath. Amid this disorder, the most curious juxtapositions abounded. Here, a bridge parted from the chasm it had crossed sat in a field, spanning poppies. There, an obelisk stood in the middle of a pool, gazing at its reflection. One side, in particular, caught Cal's eye. It was a hill which rose almost straight-sided to a tree-crowned summit. Lights moved over its face and danced among the branches. Having no sense of direction here, he decided to make his way down toward it. There was music playing somewhere in the night. It came to him by fits and starts at the behest of the breeze, drums and violins, a mingling of Strauss and Sue, and occasionally evidence of people too, whispers in the trees, shadowed figures beneath a canopy which stood in the middle of a waist-high field of grain. But the creatures were fugitive; they came and went too quickly for him to gain more than a fleeting impression. Whether this was because they knew him for the cuckoo he was. Or simply out of shyness, only time would tell. Certainly, he felt no threat here, despite the fact that he was, in a sense, trespassing. On the contrary, he felt utterly at peace with the world and himself. So much so that his concern for the others—Susanna, Apolline, Jericho, Nimrod—was quite remote. When his thoughts did touch upon them, it was only to imagine them wandering as he was wandering, lost among miracles. No harm could come to them, not here. Here was an end to harm and malice and envy too. Having this living rapture wrapping him round, what was left to envy or desire? He was within a hundred yards of the hill and stood before it in amazement. The lights he'd seen from a distance were in fact human fireflies, wingless but describing effortless arabesques around the hill. There was no communication between them that he could hear, yet they had the precision of daredevils. Their maneuvers repeatedly bringing them within a hair's breadth of each other. You must be Mooney. The speaker's voice was soft, but it broke the hold the lights had on him. Cal looked off to his right. Two figures were standing in the shade of an archway, their faces still immersed in darkness. All he could see was the two blue-gray ovals of their faces, hanging beneath the arch like lanterns. Yes, I'm Mooney, he said. Show yourselves, he thought. How do you know my name? News travels fast here, came the reply. The voice seemed slightly softer and more fluting than the first, but he couldn't be certain it wasn't the same speaker. "It's the air," said his informant. "It gossips." Now one of the pair stepped into the night light. 
The soft illumination from the hill moved on his face, blending its strangeness. But even had Cal seen it by daylight, this was a face to be haunted by. He was young, yet completely bald. His features powdered to remove any modulation in skin tone. His mouth and eyes, almost too wet, too vulnerable in the mask of his features. I'm Boaz, he said. You're welcome, Mooney. He took Cal's hand and shook it, and as he did so, his companion broke her covenant with shadow. You can see the Amadou, she said. It took Cal several seconds to conclude that the second speaker was indeed a woman, the processes of his doubt in turn throwing doubt on the sex of Boaz, for the two were very close to being identical twins. I'm Ganza, said the second speaker. She was dressed in the same plain black trousers and loose tunic as her brother, or lover, or whatever he was and she too was bald. That and their powdered faces seemed to confuse all the clichés of gender. Their faces were vulnerable, yet implacable, delicate, yet severe. Boaz looked toward the hill, where the fireflies were still cavorting. This is the rock of the first fatality, he told Cal. The Amadou always gather here. This is where the first victims of the scourge died. Cal looked back toward the rock, but only for a moment. Boaz and Ganza fascinated him more. Their ambiguities multiplied the more he watched them. "'Where are you going tonight?' said Ganza. Cal shrugged. "'No idea,' he said. "'I don't know a yard of this place.' "'Yes, you do,' she said. "'You know it very well.' While she spoke, she was idly locking and unlocking her fingers, or so it seemed, until Cal's eyes lingered on the exercise for two or three seconds. Then it became apparent that she was passing her fingers through the palms of the other hand, left through right, right through left, defying their solidity. The motion was so casual, the illusion, if illusion it was, so quick that Cal was by no means certain he was interpreting it correctly. "'How do they look to you?' she inquired. He looked back at her face. Was the finger trick some kind of test of his perception? It wasn't her hand she was talking about, however. The Amadou, she said. How do they appear? He glanced toward the rock again. Like human beings, he replied. She gave him a tiny smile. Why do you ask? He wanted to know. But she didn't have time to reply before Boaz spoke. There's a council been called, he said, at Capra's house. I think they're going to reweave. That can't be right, said Cal. They're going to put the fugue back? That's what I hear said Boaz. It seemed to be fresh news to him. Had he just lifted it off the gossiping air? The times are too dangerous, they're saying, he told Cal. Is that true? I don't know any other, Cal said, so I've got nothing to compare them with. Do we have the night? Ganza asked. Some of it, said Boaz. Then we'll go to see Lowe, yes? It's as good a place as any, Boaz replied. Will you come? he asked the cuckoo. Cal looked back toward the Amadou. The thought of staying and watching their performance a while longer was tempting, but he might not find another guide to show him the sights. And if time here was short, then he'd best make the most of it. Yes, I'll come. The woman had stopped lacing her fingers. You'll like Glow, she said, turning away and starting off into the night. He followed, already full to brimming with questions, but knowing that if indeed he only had hours to taste Wonderland... He should not waste time and breath asking. Chapter 2 At the Lake and Later 1. There had been a moment back in the auction house when Susanna had thought her life was at an end. She'd been helping Apolline down the stairs when the walls had creaked and it seemed the house had come down around their ears. Even now, as she stood watching the lake, she was not certain how they'd escaped alive. Presumably the men's room had intervened on her behalf though she had not consciously willed it to do so. There was much she had to learn about the power she'd inherited, not least how much it belonged to her and how much she to it. When she found Apolline, whom she'd lost in the Fuhrer, she would find out all the woman knew. In the meantime, she had the islands, their backs crowned with cypress trees, to wonder about, and the lisp of the waves on the stones to soothe her. We should go. Jericho broke her reverie as softly as he could, touching the back of her neck with his hand. She had left him at the house that stood along the shore, talking with friends he'd not seen in a human lifetime. They had reminiscences to exchange, in which she had no place, 
and which she sensed the others had no desire to share. Criminal talk, she'd uncharitably concluded as she left them to it. Jericho was a thief, after all. Why did we come here? she asked him. I was born here. I know every one of these stones by name. His hand still rested on her shoulder. Or at least I did. It seemed a good place to show you. She looked away from the lake toward him. His brow was furrowed. But we can't stay, he said. Why not? They'll want to see you at Capra's house. Me? You unmade the weave. I had no choice, she said. Cal was going to be killed. The furrow deepened. Forget Cal, he said, his tone toughening. Mooney's a cuckoo. You're not. Yes, I am, she insisted. Or at least that's what I feel I am. And that's the important thing. His hand dropped from her shoulder. He was suddenly sullen. Are you coming or not? he said. Of course I'm coming. He sighed. It wasn't meant to be this way, he said, his voice recapturing some of its former gentility. She wasn't sure what he was speaking of. The unweaving, his reunion with the lake, or the exchange between them. Perhaps a little of each. Maybe it was a mistake to unmake the weave, she said, somewhat defensively. But it wasn't just me. It was the menstruum. He raised his eyebrows. It's your power, he said, not without rancor. Control it. She gave him a frosty look. How far is Capra's house? Nothing's far in the fugue, he replied. The scourge destroyed most of our territories. Only these few remain. Are there more in the kingdom? A few, maybe. But all we really care for is here. That's why we have to hide it again before morning. Morning? She'd almost forgotten that the sun would soon be rising, and with it humankind. The thought of her fellow cuckoos with their taste for zoos, freak shows, and carnivals, invading this territory did not much amuse her. You're right, she said. We have to be quick. And together they went up from the lake toward Capra's house. Two. As they walked, Susanna had answered several questions that had been vexing her since the unweaving. Chief among them, what had happened to the portion of the kingdom that the fugue had invaded? It was not well populated, certainly. There was the considerable acreage of Thurstiston Common behind the auction house and fields to either side, but the area was not entirely deserted. There were a number of houses in the locality, and up toward Irby Heath the population grew denser still. What had happened to those residences, and indeed to their occupants? The answer was quite simple. The fugue had sprung up around them, accommodating their existence with a kind of wit. Thus a line of lamp posts, their fluorescence extinguished, had been decorated with blossoming vines like antique columns. A car had been almost buried in the side of a hill. Another two had been tipped on their tails and leaned nose to nose. The houses had been less recklessly treated. Most were still complete, although the flowerage of the fugue reached to their very doorsteps, as if awaiting an invitation inside. As for the cuckoos, she and Jericho encountered a few, all of whom seemed more puzzled than fearful. One man, dressed only in trousers and suspenders, was complaining loudly that he'd lost his dog. Damn fool, Mutt, he said. You seen him? And seemed indifferent to the fact that the world had changed around him. It was only after he'd headed off, still calling after the runaway, that Susanna wondered if the fellow was seeing what she saw, or whether the same selective blindness that kept the halos from human eyes was at work here. Was the dog owner wandering familiar streets, unable to see beyond the cell of his assumptions? or perhaps just glimpsing the fugue from the corner of his eye, a glory he'd remember in his dotage and weep over? Jericho had no answers to these questions. He didn't know, he said, and he didn't care. And still the visions unfurled. With every step her astonishment grew at the variety of places and objects the seer kind had saved from the conflagration. The fugue was not, as she'd anticipated, simply a collection of haunted groves and thickets. Holiness was a far more democratic condition, it informed fragments of every kind, intimate and momentous, natural and artificial. Each corner and niche had its own peculiar mode of rapture. The circumstances of their preservation meant that most of these fragments had been torn from their context like pages from a book. Their edges were still raw with the violence of that removal, and the haphazard way they'd been thrown together only made their disunity seem more acute. But there were compensations. The very disparity of the pieces, the way the domestic abutted the public, the commonplace, the fabulous, created fresh conundrums, 
hints of new stories that these hitherto unconnected pages might tell. Sometimes the journey showed them collisions of elements so unlikely they defied any attempt to synthesize them. Dogs grazing beside a tomb, from the fractured lid of which rose a fountain of fire that ran like water. A window set in the ground, its curtains billowing skyward on a breeze that carried the sound of the sea. These riddles, defying her powers of explanation, marked her profoundly. There was nothing here that she hadn't seen before. Dogs, tombs, windows, fire. But in this flux, she found them reinvented, their magic made again before her eyes. Only once, having been told by Jericho that he had no answers to her questions, did she press him for knowledge, and that was regarding the gyre, whose covering of cloud was perpetually visible, its brightest lightning bursts throwing hill and tree into relief. That's where the temple of the loom is, he said. The closer you get to it, the more dangerous it becomes. She remembered something of this from that first night when they'd talked of the carpet, but she wanted to know more. Why dangerous? she asked. The raptures required to make the weave were without parallel. It required great sacrifice, great purity to control them and knit them. More than most of us would ever be capable of. Now the power protects itself with lightning and storms, and wisely. If the gyre's broken into, the weave rapture won't hold. All we've gathered here will come apart, be destroyed. Destroyed? So they say. I don't know if it's true or not. I've got no grasp of the theoretical stuff. But you can perform raptures. The remark seemed to baffle him. That doesn't mean I can tell you how, he said. I just do them. Like what? She said. She felt like a child asking for tricks from a magician, but she was curious to know the powers residing in him. He made an odd face, one full of contradictions. There was a shyness there, something quizzical, something fond. Maybe I'll show you, he said, one of these times. I can't sing or dance, but I've got ways with me. He stopped speaking and walking, too. She didn't need any sign from him to hear the bells that were in the air around them. They were not the bells of a steeple. These were light and melodic, but they summoned nevertheless. Capra's house, he said, striding ahead. The bells, knowing they were heard, rang them on their way. Chapter 3 Delusions 1 the bulletin that had gone out from Hobart's division announcing the escape of the anarchists had not gone unheard, but the alarm had come a little before eleven and the patrols were dealing with the nightly round of fist fights, drunken driving and theft which climaxed about that time. In addition there had been a fatal stabbing on Seal Street and a transvestite had been the cause of a near riot in a pub on the dock road. Thus by the time any serious attention had been paid to the alarm call, the escapees were long gone, slipped through the Mersey Tunnel on their way to Shearman's house but on the opposite side of the river, just outside Birkenhead, a vigilant patrolman by the name of Downey caught sight of them. Leaving his partner in a Chinese restaurant ordering chop suey and Peking fried duck, Downey gave chase. The radio alert warned that these miscreants were extremely dangerous and that no attempt should be made to apprehend them single-handedly. Patrolman Downey therefore kept a discreet distance, aided by a thorough knowledge of the area. When the villains finally reached their destination, however, it became apparent that this was no ordinary pursuit. For one, when he reported his location to the division, he was told that things were in considerable disarray. Could he hear a man sobbing in the background? And that this matter would be dealt with by Inspector Hobart in person. He was to wait and watch. It was while he was waiting and watching that he had his second proof that something untoward was in the air. It began with lights flickering in the second-story windows of the house then exploding into the outside world, taking wall and window with it. He got out of his car and began to walk toward the house. His mind, used to filing reports, was already scrabbling for adjectives to describe what he was seeing, but he kept coming up wordless. The brilliance that spilled from the house did not resemble anything he had witnessed or even dreamed of before. He was not a superstitious man. He immediately sought a secular explanation for the things he saw, or almost saw, all around him, and seeking, found. He was viewing UFO activity. That was surely it. He'd read reports of similar events happening to perfectly ordinary Joes like himself. It was not God or lunacy he was facing, but a visitation from a neighboring galaxy. Content that he had some grasp on the situation, he hurried back to the car to put his report through to headquarters. He was stymied, however. There was white noise on all frequencies. No matter. He'd informed them of his location on first arriving. 
They'd come to his aid presently. In the meanwhile, his task was to watch this landing like a hawk. That task rapidly became more difficult, as the invaders began to bombard him with extraordinary illusions, designed no doubt to conceal their operations from human sight. The waves of force that had burst from the house threw the car on its side, or at least that's what his eyes informed him. He was not about to take it as gospel. Then vague forms began to roil about him. The tarmac beneath his feet seemed to sprout flowers. Bestial forms were performing acrobatics above his head. He saw several members of the public similarly ensnared by these projections. Some stared up at the sky. Others were on their knees praying for sanity. And it came by and by. Knowing that these images were merely phantoms gave him strength to resist them. Over and over he told himself that what he was seeing was not real, and by degrees the visions bowed to his certainty, grew faint, and finally faded almost entirely. He scrambled into the overturned car and tried the radio again though he had no idea if anybody was hearing it or not. Oddly, he wasn't that concerned. He'd beaten the delusions, and that conviction sweetened his vigil. Even if they came for him now, the monsters that had landed here tonight, he would not fear them. He would put out his own eyes rather than let them bewitch him afresh. 2. Any further word? There's nothing, sir, said Richardson. Only din. Forget it, then, said Hobart. Just drive. We'll sniff them out if it takes us all fucking night. As they traveled, Hobart's thoughts returned to the scene he'd left behind him. His men reduced to babbling idiots. His cells defiled with shit and prayers. He had a score to settle with these forces of darkness. Once upon a time, he would not have cast himself so readily in the role of Avenger. He'd been squeamish in admitting to any degree of personal involvement. But experience had made an honest man of him. Now... At least in the company of his men, he didn't pretend to be removed from the issues at hand, but confessed freely the heat in his belly. After all, the business of pursuit and punishment was just a way to spit in the eye of one who had already spat on you. The law. Just another word for revenge. Chapter 4. Allegiances. 1. It was eighty years, give or take half a decade, since the three sisters had trodden the earth of the fugue. Eighty years of exile in the kingdom of the Cuckoo, worshipped and reviled by turns, almost losing their sanity among the Adamaticals, but driven to endure countless mortifications by their hunger, to one day have the weave world in their avenging grasp. Now they hung in the air above that rapturous earth, its touch so antithetical that walking upon it was a trial, and surveyed the fugue from end to end. It smells too much alive, said the Magdalene, lifting her head to the wind. Give us time, Immaculata told her. What about Shadwell? The hag wanted to know. Where is he? Out looking for his clients, probably, the incantatrix replied. We should find him. I don't like the thought of his wandering here unaccompanied. He's unpredictable. Then what? We let the inevitable happen, said Immaculata, gently swinging around to take in every sacred yard of the place. We let the cuckoos tear it apart. What about the sail? There'll be no sail. It's too late. Shadwell's going to know you used him. No more than he used me. I would have liked to. A tremor passed through the Magdalene's uncertain substance. Wouldn't you like to give yourself to him once? She inquired softly. Just once? No. Never. Then let me have him. I can use him. Imagine his children. Immaculata reached out and grasped her sister's fragile neck. You will never lay a hand on him, she said. Not a finger. The wraith's face grew absurdly long in a parody of remorse. I know, she said. He's yours, body and soul. The hag laughed. The man's got no soul, she said. Immaculata released the Magdalene, filaments of her sister's matter decaying into sewer air between them. Oh, he had a soul, she said, letting gravity claim her for the earth beneath. But I want no part of it. Her feet touched the ground. When all this is over, when the seer kind are in the cuckoo's hands, I'll let him go his way, unharmed. And us, said the hag, what happens to us then? Will we be free? That's what we agreed. We can go into extinction, if that's what you want. 
More than anything, said the hag. More than anything. There are worse things than existence, said Immaculata. Oh, the hag replied. Can you name one? Immaculata thought for a short while. No, she conceded with a soft sigh of distress. You may be right, sister. Two. Shatwell had fled from the disintegrating house moments after Cal and Nimrod had escaped through the window, and had barely avoided being caught by the cloud that had swallowed Devereux. He'd ended up face down, his mouth filled with dust and with the sour taste of defeat. After so many years of anticipation, to have the auction end in ruin and humiliation, it was enough to make him weep. But he didn't. For one thing, he was an optimist by nature. In today's rejection, the seeds of tomorrow sail. For another, the spectacle of the fugue solidifying about him was a fine distraction from his sorrows. And for a third, he had found one worse off than he. What the fuck is happening? It was Norris, the Hamburger King. Blood and plaster dust vied for the right to paint his face, and somewhere in the maelstrom he'd lost both the back of his jacket and most of his trousers, also one of his fine Italian shoes, the other he carried. I'll sue the ass off you, he screeched at Shadwell. You fucking asshole! Look at me! Fucking asshole! He began to beat Shadwell with the shoe, but the salesman was in no mood to be bruised. He slapped the man back, hard. Within seconds they were brawling like drunkards, indifferent to the extraordinary scenes coming to life all around them. The tussle left them more breathless and bloody than they'd started out, and did nothing to resolve their differences. You should have taken precautions, Norris spat. It's too late for accusations. Shadwell replied. The fugue's woken whether we like it or not. I would have woken it myself, said Norris, if I'd gotten to own it. But I would have been ready and waiting. Had some forces to go in and take control. But this? It's chaos. I don't even know which way is out. Any way will do. It's not that big. If you want out, just walk in any direction. This simple solution seemed to pacify Norris somewhat. He turned his gaze on the burgeoning landscape. I don't know, though, he said. Maybe it's better this way. At least I get to see what I would have bought. And what do you make of it? It's not the way I'd thought it'd be. I'd expected something tamer. Frankly, I'm not sure now I'd want to own the place. As his voice faltered, an animal that could surely be found in no menagerie jumped from the flux of threads and snarled a welcome at the world before bounding off. See? said Norris. What was that? Shadwell shrugged. I don't know he said. There's things here that probably died out before we were born. That? said Norris, staring after the hybrid beast. I never saw the like of that before, even in books. I tell you, I want none of this fucking place. I want you to get me out. You'll have to find your own way, said Shadwell. I've got business here. Oh, no, you don't, said Norris, pointing his shoe at Shadwell. I need a bodyguard, and you're it. The sight of the Hamburger King reduced to this nervous wreckage amused Shadwell. More than that, it made him feel, perhaps perversely, secure. Look, he said, his manner softening, we're both in the same shit here. Damn right we are. I've got something that might help, he said, opening his jacket. Something to sweeten the pill. Norris looked suspicious. Oh, yeah? Have a peep said Shadwell, showing the man the jacket lining. Norris wiped off the blood that was running into his left eye and stared into the folds. What do you see? There was a moment of hesitation when Shadwell wondered if the jacket was still functioning. Then a slow smile broke over Norris's face, and a look familiar from countless other such seductions crept into his eyes. See something you like? Shadwell asked him. Indeed I do. Take it, then. It's yours. Free, gratis, and for nothing. Norris smiled almost coyly. Wherever did you find him? He asked as he extended a trembling hand toward the jacket. After all these years. Tenderly, he drew his temptation from the folds of the lining. It was a wind-up toy. A soldier with a drum so fondly and so accurately remembered by its owner that the illusion he now held in his hand had been recreated with every dent and scratch in place. My drummer! said Norris, weeping for joy as if he'd taken possession of the world's eighth wonder. Oh, my drummer! He turned it over. But there's no key. 
he said. Do you have it? I may find it for you by and by, Shadwell replied. One of his arms is broken, said Norris, stroking the drummer's head. But he still plays. You're happy? Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Then put it in your pocket so that you can carry me a while, said Shadwell. Carry you? I'm weary. I need a horse. Norris showed no trace of resistance to this notion, though Shadwell was a bigger and heavier man, and would constitute quite a burden. The gift had won him over utterly, and while it held him in thrall, he would allow his spine to crack before disobeying the gift-giver. Laughing to himself, Shadwell climbed onto the man's back. His plans might have gone awry tonight, but as long as people had dreams to mourn, he could possess their little souls a while. Where do you want me to take you? the horse asked him. Somewhere high, he directed. Take me somewhere high. Chapter 5 The Orchard of Lemuel Lowe 1. Neither Boaz nor Ganza were voluble guides. They led the way through the fugue in almost complete silence, only breaking that silence to warn Cal that a stretch of ground was treacherous, or to keep close to them as they moved down a colonnade in which he heard dogs panting. In a sense, he was glad of their quietness. He didn't want a guided tour of the terrain, at least not tonight. He'd known, when he'd first looked down at the fugue from the wall in Mimi's yard, that it couldn't be mapped, nor its contents listed and committed to memory like his beloved timetables. He would have to understand the weave world in a different fashion, not as hard fact, but as feeling. The schism between his mind and the world it was attempting to grasp was dissolving. In its place was a relationship of echo and counter-echo. They were thoughts inside each other's heads, he in this world. And that knowledge, which he could never have found the words to articulate, turned the journey into a tour of his own history. He'd known from Mad Mooney that poetry was heard differently from ear to ear. Poetry was like that. The same he began to see was also true of geography. 2. They climbed a long slope. He thought maybe a tide of crickets leapt before their feet. The earth seemed alive. At the top of the slope they looked across a field. At the far side of the field was an orchard. Almost there, said Ganza, and they started toward it. The orchard was the biggest single feature he'd seen in the fugue so far. A plot of maybe thirty or forty trees, planted in rows and carefully pruned, so that their branches almost touched. Beneath this canopy were passages of neatly clipped grass, dappled by velvet light. This is the orchard of Lemuel Lowe, Boaz said as they stood on the perimeter. His gentle voice was softer than ever. Even among the fabled, it's fabled. Ganza led the way beneath the trees. The air was still and warm and sweet. The branches were laden with a fruit that Cal did not recognize. They're jude pears, Boaz told him, one of the species we've never shared with the cuckoos. Why not? There are reasons, said Boaz. He looked around for Ganza, but she'd disappeared down one of the avenues. Help yourself to the fruit, he said, moving away from Cal in search of his companion. Lem won't mind. Though Cal thought he could see all the way down the corridor of trees, his eyes deceived him. Boaz took three steps from him and was gone. Cal reached toward one of the low-slung branches and put his hand on one of the fruits. As he did so, there was a great commotion in the tree, and something ran down the branch toward him. Not that one! The voice was basso profundo. The speaker was a monkey. They're sweeter upstairs, the beast said, throwing its brown eyes skyward. Then it ran back the way it had come, its passage bringing leaves down around Cal. He tried to follow its progress, but the animal moved too fast. It was back in half a dozen seconds, with not one but two fruits. Perched in the branches, it threw them down to Cal. Peel them, it said. One each. Despite their names, they didn't resemble pears. They were the size of a plum, but with a leathery skin. It was tough, but it couldn't disguise the fragrance of the meat inside. What are you waiting for? the monkey demanded to know. They're tasty, these giddies. Peel it and see. The fact of the talking monkey, which might have stopped Cal dead in his tracks a week before, was just part of the local color now. You call them giddies? he said. Jude pears. Giddy fruit. It's all the same meat. The monkey's eyes were on Cal's hands, willing him to peel the fruit. He proceeded to do just that. They were more difficult to skin than any fruit he'd encountered. Hence, the monkeys bargained with him, presumably. 
Viscous juice ran from the broken skin and over his hands. The smell was ever more appetizing. Before he'd quite finished peeling the first of them, the monkey snatched it from his grasp and wolfed it down. Good, it said between mouthfuls. Its pleasure was echoed from beneath the tree. Somebody made a sound of appreciation, and Cal glanced away from his labors to see that there was a man squatting against the trunk, rolling a cigarette. He looked back up at the monkey, then down at the man, and the voice from the beast made new sense. Good trick, he said. The man looked up at Cal. His features were distressingly close to Mongoloid, the smile he offered huge and seemingly uncomprehending. What is? said the voice from the branches. Confounded as he was by the face below him, Cal pursued his assumption, and addressed his reply not to the puppet, but the puppeteer. Throwing your voice like that. The man still grinned, but showed no sign that he understood. The monkey, however, laughed loudly. Eat the fruit, it said. Cal's fingers had worked at the peeling without his direction. The giddy was skinned, but some lingering superstition about stolen fruit kept him from putting it to his lips. Try it, said the monkey. They're not poisonous. The smell was too tantalizing to resist. He bit. At least not to us, the monkey added, laughing again. The fruit tasted even better than its scent had promised. The meat was succulent, the juice strong as a liqueur. He licked it off his fingers and the palms of his hand. Like it? Superb. Food and drink all in one. The monkey looked at the man beneath a tree. Want one, Smith? it asked. The man put a flame to his cigarette and drew on it. Do you hear me? Getting no response, the monkey scampered back up into the higher reaches of the tree. Cal, still eating the pear, had found the pips at its center. He chewed them up. Their slight bitterness only complemented the sweetness of the rest. There was music playing somewhere between the trees, he now noticed, one moment lilting, the next manic. Another? said the monkey, reappearing with not two but several fruit. Cal swallowed the last of his first. Same deal, the monkey said. Suddenly greedy, Cal took three and started to peel. There's other people here, he said to the puppeteer. Of course, said the monkey. This has always been a gathering place. Why do you speak through the animal? Cal asked as the monkey's fingers claimed a peeled fruit from his hands. The name's Novello, said the monkey. And who says he's speaking at all? Cal laughed as much at himself as at the performance. Fact is, said the monkey, neither of us is quite sure who does what any longer. But then love's like that, don't you find? It threw back its head and squeezed the fruit in its hand so that its liquor ran down its throat. The music had found a fresh intoxication. Cal was intrigued to find out what instruments it was being played upon. Violins, certainly, and whistles and drums. But there were sounds among these that he couldn't place. Any excuse for a party, said Novello. Must be the biggest breakfast in history. I dare say. Want to go see? Yes. The monkey ran along the branch and scurried down the trunk to where Smith was sitting. Cal, chewing the seeds of his second giddy, reached up and claimed a further handful of fruit from among the foliage, pocketing half a dozen against future hunger, and skinning another to be consumed on the spot. The sound of monkey chatter drew his gaze down to Novello and Smith. The beast was perched on the man's chest, and they were talking to each other a babble of words and grunts. Cal looked from man to beast and back to man again. He could not tell who was saying what to whom. The debate ended abruptly, and Smith stood up, the monkey now sitting on his shoulder. Without inviting Cal to follow, they threaded their way between the trees. Cal pursued, peeling and eating as he went. Some of the visitors here were doing as he'd done, standing beneath the trees, consuming jewed pears. One or two had even climbed up and were draped among the branches, bathing in the perfumed air. Others, either indifferent to the fruit or sated upon it, lay sprawled in the grass and talked together in low voices. The atmosphere was all tranquility. Heaven is an orchard, Cal thought as he walked, and God is plenty. That's the fruit talking, said Novello. Cal wasn't even aware that he'd spoken aloud. He looked around at the monkey, feeling slightly disoriented. You should watch yourself, the animal said. An excess of Jude's isn't good for you. I've got a strong stomach, Cal replied. Who said anything about your stomach? The monkey replied. They're not called giddy fruit for nothing. Cal ignored him. The animal's condescending tone irritated him. He picked up his pace, overtaking man and beast. 
Have it your own way, said the monkey. Somebody darted between the trees a little way ahead of Cal, trailing laughter. To Cal's eyes, the sound was momentarily visible. He saw the rise and fall of notes as splashes of light, which flew apart like dandelion heads in a high wind. Enchantment upon enchantment. Plucking and peeling yet another of Lowe's remarkable fruits as he went, he hurried on toward the music. And ahead of him the scene came clear. A blue and ochre rug had been laid on the ground between the trees, with wicks in oil flickering along its borders, and at its edge the musicians he'd heard. There were five of them, three women and two men dressed formally in suits and dresses, in the dark threads of which brilliant designs were somehow concealed, so that the subtlest motion of the folds in the flame light revealed a glamour that brought to Cal's mind the iridescence of tropical butterflies. More startling, however, was the fact that this quintet had not a single instrument between them. They were singing these violins, pipes, and drums, and offering, in addition, sounds no instrument could hope to produce. Here was a music which did not imitate any natural sound. It was not bird or whale song, nor tree nor stream, but instead expressed experiences which lay between words, the offbeat of the heart, where intellect could not go. Hearing its shudders of pleasure ran down Cal's spine. The show had drawn an audience of perhaps thirty seer kind, and Cal joined them. His presence was noted by a few who threw mildly curious glances in his direction, then looked away again. Surveying the crowd, he attempted to allot these people to one or other of the four families, but it was near enough impossible. The choral orchestra were presumably Aya. Hadn't Apolline said that it was Aya blood that had given her a good singing voice? But among the rest, who was who? Which of these people were of Jericho's family, for instance, the Babu? Which of the Yi Mi or the Lo? There were Negro and Caucasian faces, and one or two with an Oriental cast. There were some who boasted traits not quite human, one with Nimrod's golden eyes, and tail too, presumably. Another pair whose features carried symmetrical marking that crept down from the scalp. Yet others who bore, either at the dictates of fashion or theology, elaborate tattoos and hairstyles. There was the same startling variety in the clothes they wore, the formal designs of their late nineteenth-century garb refashioned to suit the wearer. And in the fabrics of skirts, suits, and waistcoats, the same barely concealed iridescence, threads of carnival brilliance in weight behind the monochrome. Cal's admiring gaze went from one face to another, and he felt he wanted each of these people as a friend, wanted to know them and walk with them and share his pittance of secrets with them. He was vaguely aware that this was probably the fruit talking. But if so, then it was wise fruit. Though his hunger was assuaged, he took another of the pears from his pocket and was about to peel it when the music came to an end. There was applause and whistling. The quintet took their bows. As they did so, a bearded man with a face as lined as a walnut who had been sitting on a stool close to the edge of the rug stood up. He looked directly at Cal and said, My friends, my friends, we have a stranger among us. The applause was dying down. Faces turned in Cal's direction. He could feel himself blush. Come out, Mr. Mooney, Mr. Calhoun Mooney. Ganza had told the truth. The air did gossip. The man was beckoning. Cal made a murmur of protest. Come on, entertain us a while, came the reply. At this, Cal's heart started to thump furiously. I can't, he said. Of course you can, the man grinned. Of course you can. There was more applause. The shining faces smiled around him. Somebody touched his shoulder. He glanced around. It was Novello. That's Mr. Lowe, said the monkey. You mustn't refuse him. But I can't do anything. Everybody can do something, said the monkey. If it's only fart. Come on, come on, Lemuel Lowe was saying. Don't be shy. Much against his will, Cal edged through the crowd toward the rectangle of wicks. Really, he said to Lowe, I don't think— You've eaten freely of my fruit, said Lowe without rancor. The least you can do is entertain us. Cal looked about him for some support, but all he saw were expectant faces. I can't sing and I've two left feet, he pointed out, still hoping self-deprecation might earn him an escape route. Your great-grandfather was a poet, wasn't he? said Lemuel, his tone almost rebuking Cal for not making mention of the fact. He was, said Cal. And can you not quote your own great-grandfather? 
said Lemuel. Cal thought about this for a moment. It was clear he was not going to be released from this circle without at least making some stab at recompense for his greed, and Lemuel's suggestion was not a bad one. Many years ago, Brendan had taught Cal one or two fragments of Mad Mooney's verse. They'd meant little enough to Cal at the time. He'd been about six years old. But their rhymes had been intriguing. The rug is yours, said Lemuel, and stood aside to let Cal have access to the performing area. Before he'd had an opportunity to run any of the lines through his head, it was two decades since he'd learned them. How much would he remember? He was standing on the rug, staring across the flickering footlights at his audience. What Mr. Lowe says is true, he said, all hesitation. My great-grandfather. Speak up, somebody said. My great-grandfather was a poet. I'll try and recite one of his verses. I don't know if I can remember it, but I'll do my best. There was scattered applause at this, which made Cal more uneasy than ever. What's it called, this poem? said Lemuel. Cal racked his brain. The title had meant even less than the lines when he'd first been taught it, but he'd learned it anyway, parrot fashion. It's called Six Commonplaces, he said, his tongue quicker to shape the words than his brain was to dust them off. Tell it, my friend, said the orchard keeper. The audience stood with bated breath. The only movement now was that of the flames around the rug. Cal began. One part of love. For a terrible instant, his mind went totally blank. If somebody had asked him his name, he would not have been able to reply. Four words, and he was suddenly speechless. In that moment of panic, he realized that he wanted more than anything in the world to please this gracious gathering, to show them how glad he was to be among them. But his damn tongue. At the back of his head, the poet said, Go on, boy. Tell them what you know. Don't try and remember. Just speak. He began again, not falteringly this time, but strongly, as though he knew these lines perfectly well. And damn it, he did. They flowed from him easily, and he heard himself speaking them in a voice he'd never have thought himself capable of. A bard's voice, declaiming, One part of love is innocence. One part of love is guilt. One part the milk that in a sense is soured as soon as spilt. One part of love is sentiment. One part of love is lust. One part is the presentiment of our return to dust. Eight lines, and it was all over. Over, and he was standing, the lines buzzing in his head, both pleased that he'd gotten through the verse without fumbling, and wishing it could have gone on a while longer. He looked at the audience. They were not smiling any longer, but staring at him with an odd puzzlement in their eyes. For an instant he thought maybe he'd offended them. Then came the applause, hands raised above their heads. There were shouts and whistles. It's a fine poem, Lowe said, applauding heartily as he spoke, and finally delivered. So saying, he stepped out of the audience again and embraced Cal with fervor. Do you hear? Cal said to the poet in his skull. They like you. And back came another fragment as if fresh from Matt Mooney's lips. He didn't speak it this time, but he heard it clearly. Forgive my art. On bended knees, I do confess, I seek to please. And it was a fine thing, this pleasing business. He returned Lemuel's hug. Help yourself, Mr. Mooney, the orchard keeper said, to all the fruit you can eat. Thank you, said Cal. Did you ever know the poet? he asked. No, said Cal. He was dead before I was born. Who can call a man dead whose words still hush us and whose sentiments move? Mr. Lowe replied. That's true, said Cal. Of course it's true. Would I tell a lie on a night like this? Having spoken, Lemuel called somebody else out of the crowd. Another performer brought to the rug. Cal felt a pang of envy as he stepped over the footlights. He wanted that breathless moment again. Wanted to feel the audience held by his words, moved and marked by them. He made a mental note to learn some more of Mad Mooney's verses if and when he saw his father's house again, so that next time he was here he would have new lines to enchant with. His hand was shaken, and his face kissed half a dozen times as he made his way back through the crowd. When he turned around to face the rug once more, he was surprised to find that the next performers were Boaz and Ganza. Doubly surprised. They were both naked. There was nothing overtly sexual in their nakedness. Indeed, it was as formal in its way as the clothes they'd shrugged off. Nor was there any trace of discomfort among the audience. They watched the pair with the same grave and expectant looks as they'd watched him. Boaz and Ganza had gone to opposite sides of the carpet, 
halted there a beat, then turned and began to walk towards each other. They advanced slowly until they were nose to nose, lip to lip. It crossed Cal's mind that maybe some erotic display was in the offing, and in a way that confounded his every definition of erotic, that was true. For they continued to walk toward each other, or so his eyes testified, pressing into each other, their faces disappearing, their torsos congealing, their limbs too until they were one body, the head an almost featureless ball. The illusion was absolute. But there was more to come, for the partners were still moving forward, their faces appearing now to press through the back of each other's cranium, as though the bone was soft as marshmallow. And still they advanced, until they were like Siamese twins born back to back, their single skull now teased out, and boasting two faces. As if this weren't enough, there was a further twist to the trick, for somehow in the flux they'd exchanged genders to stand finally, quite separate once more, in their partner's place. Love's like that, the monkey had said. Here was the point proved in flesh and blood. As the performers bowed and fresh applause broke out, Cal detached himself from the crowd and began to wander back through the trees. Several vague thoughts were in his head. One, that he couldn't linger here all night, and should soon go in search of Susanna. Another, that it might be wise to seek a guide. The monkey, perhaps? But first, the laden branches drew his eye again. He reached up, took another handful of fruit, and began to peel. Lowe's ad hoc vaudeville was still going on behind him. He heard laughter, then more applause, and the music began again. He felt his limbs growing heavier. His fingers were barely the equal of the peeling. His eyelids drooped. Deciding he'd better sit down before he fell down, he settled beneath one of the trees. Drowsiness was claiming him, and he had no power to resist it. There was no harm in dozing for a while. He was safe here in the wash of starlight and applause. His eyes flickered closed. It seemed he could see his dreams approaching their light growing brighter, their voices louder. He smiled to greet them. It was his old life, he dreamed. He stood in the shuttered room that lay between his ears and let the lost days appear on the wall like a lantern show, moments retrieved from some stockpile he hadn't even known he'd owned. But the scenes that were paraded before him now, these passages from the unfinished book of his life, no longer seemed quite real. It was fiction, that book, or at best momentarily real, when some part of him had leapt from that stale story and glimpsed the fugue in waiting. The sound of applause called him to the surface of sleep, and his eyes flickered open. The stars were still set among the branches of the giddy trees. There was still laughter and flame-light near at hand. All was well with his newfound land. I wasn't born till now, he thought, as the lantern show returned. I wasn't even born. Content with that thought, his mind's eye peeled another of Lowe's sweet fruits and put it to his lips. Somewhere somebody was applauding him. Hearing it, he took a bow. But this time, he did not wake. Chapter 6 Capra's House 1. In its way, Capra's house was as great a surprise as anything Susanna had seen in the fugue. It was a low building in a state of considerable disrepair, the off-white plaster that clad its walls, falling away to reveal large handmade red bricks beneath. The tiles of the porch were much weather-beaten, the door itself barely hanging on its hinges. Myrtle trees grew all around it, and in their branches the myriad bells they'd heard were hanging, responsive to the merest breath of wind. Their sound, however, was all but cancelled by the raised voices from within. It sounded more like a riot than civilized debate. There was a guard at the threshold, squatting on his haunches, making a ziggurat of rocks in front of him. At their approach he stood up. He was fully seven feet tall. "'What business have you got here?' he demanded of Jericho. "'We have to see the council.' From within Susanna could hear a woman's voice, raised clear and strong. "'I will not lie down and sleep,' she said. The remark was followed by a roar of approval from her supporters. It's vital we talk to the council, said Jericho. Impossible, the guard pronounced. This is Susanna Parrish, said Jericho. She? He had no need to go on. I know who she is, the guard said. If you know who I am, then you know I woke the weave, said Susanna, and I've opinions the council should hear. Yes, said the guard. I can see that. He glanced behind him. The din had, if anything, worsened. It's bedlam in there, he warned. You'll be lucky if you're heard. I can shout with the best, said Susanna. The guard nodded. No doubt, he said. It's straight ahead. He stood aside, pointing down a short hallway to a half-closed door. Susanna took a deep breath, looking around at Jericho to see that he was still in tow. Then she walked down the passage and pushed the door. 
The room was large, but filled with people, some sitting, some on their feet, some even standing on chairs to get a better view of the debate's chief protagonists. There were five individuals in the heat of it. One, a woman with wild hair and an even wilder look, whom Jericho identified as Yolanda Dor. Her faction were in a knot around her, egging her on. She was facing two men, one long-nosed individual whose face was beetroot with yelling, and his older companion who had a restraining hand upon the first man's arm. They were clearly the opposition. In between was a negress who was haranguing both parties, and an oriental immaculately dressed, who looked to be the moderator. If so, he was failing in this function. It could only be moments before the fists replaced opinions. The presence of the interlopers had been noted by a few of the assembly, but the lead players raged on, deaf to each other's arguments. "'What's the name of the man in the middle?' Susanna asked Jericho. "'That's Tung,' said Jericho. "'Thank you.' Without another word, Susanna stepped toward the debaters. "'Mr. Tung,' she said. The man looked toward her, and the fretfulness on his face turned to panic. "'Who are you?' he demanded to know. "'Susanna Parrish.' The name was enough to hush the argument instantly. Those faces that were not already turned in Susanna's direction were now. A cuckoo, the old man said, in Capra's house. Shut up, said Tung. You're the one, said the negress. You. Yes? Do you know what you've done? The remark ignited a fresh outburst, but this time it wasn't confined to those at the center of the room. Everybody was yelling. Tung, whose calls for control went unheard, pulled a chair up, stood on it, and yelled, Silence! The ploy worked. The din died down. Tung was touchingly pleased with himself. Ha! he said with a little pout of self-satisfaction. I think that's a little better. Now, he turned to the old man. You have an objection, Miss Immerus? Indeed I do, came the reply. He jabbed an arthritic finger in Susanna's direction. She's trespassing. I demand she be removed from this chamber. Tung was about to reply, but Yolanda was there before him. This is no time for constitutional niceties, she said. Whether we like it or not, we're awake. She looked at Susanna. And she's responsible. Well, I'm not staying in the same room as a cuckoo, said Massimorous, contempt for Susanna oozing from his every word. Not after all they've done to us. He looked at his red-faced companion. Are you coming, Dolphi? I am indeed, he replied. Wait, said Susanna. I don't want to break any rules. You already have, said Yolanda, and the walls are still standing. For how long, said the negress. Capra's house is a sacred place, Massimorous murmured. It was clear that this was no sham. He was genuinely offended by Susanna's presence. I understand that, said Susanna, and I respect it, but I feel responsible. And so you are, said Dolphi, working himself up into a fresh lather. But that's little comfort now, is it? We're awake, damn you, and we're lost. I know, said Susanna. What you say's right. This rather deflated him. He'd been expecting argument. You agree? He said. Of course I agree. We're all vulnerable at the moment. At least we can fend for ourselves now we're awake, Yolanda argued, instead of just lying there. We had the custodians, said Dolphi. What happened to them? They're dead, Susanna replied. All of them? What does she know? Massimorous commented. Don't listen to her. My grandmother was Mimi Lashensky, said Susanna. For the first time since she'd entered the fray, Massimorous looked her straight in the eye. He was no stranger to unhappiness, she thought. It was there in abundance now. So? he said. And she was murdered, Susanna went on, returning his stare. By one of your people. Never, said Massimorous, without a trace of doubt. Who? said Yolanda. Immaculata. Not ours, Massimorous protested. Not one of ours. Well, she's certainly no cuckoo, Susanna retorted, her patience beginning to wear thin. She took a step toward Massimorous, who took a firmer grip of Dolphi's arm, as if he might use his colleague as a shield should push come to shove. Every one of us is in danger, she said. And if you don't see that, then all your sacred places, not just Capra's house, all of them, they'll be wiped away. All right, you've got reason not to trust me, but at least give me a hearing. The room had fallen pin-drop quiet. Tell us what you know, 
said Tung. Not all that much, Susanna admitted. But I know you've got enemies here in the fugue, and God knows how many more outside. What do you suggest we do about it? said a new voice from somewhere in Dolphi's faction. We fight, said Yolanda. You'll lose, Susanna replied. The older woman's fine features grew tight. Defeatism from you too, she said. It's the truth. You've got no defenses against the kingdom. We have the raptures, said Yolanda. Do you want to make weapons of your magic? Susanna replied. Like Immaculata. If you do that, you may as well call yourself cuckoos. This argument won some murmurs of assent from the assembly, and sour stares from Yolanda. So we have to reweave, said Miss Emerus with some satisfaction, which is what I've been saying from the outset. I agree, said Susanna. At this the room erupted afresh, Yolanda's voice rising about the din. No more sleep, she said. I will not sleep. Then you'll all be wiped out, Susanna yelled back. The din subsided a little. This is a cruel century, said Susanna. So is the last, somebody commented, and the one before that. We can't hide forever, said Yolanda, appealing to the room. Her call received considerable support despite Susanna's intervention, and indeed it was difficult not to sympathize with her case. After so much sleep, the idea of consigning themselves to the dreamless bed of the weave could not be attractive. I'm not saying you should stay in the carpet for long, said Susanna just until a safe place can be. I've heard all of this before, Yolanda broke in. We'll wait, we said. We'll keep our heads low till the storm blows over. There are storms and storms, said a man somewhere in the back of the crowd. His voice penetrated the clamor with ease, though it was scarcely more than a whisper. This in itself was enough to make the argument die down. Susanna looked in the direction of the sound, though she could not yet see the speaker. It came again. If the kingdom destroys you, the voice said, then all my Mimi's pain was for nothing. The counselors were stepping aside as the speaker moved through them toward the center of the room. He came into view. It took Susanna several seconds to realize that she'd seen this face before, and another beat to remember where, in the portrait on Mimi's bedroom wall. But the faded photograph had failed to convey more than a hint of the man's presence, or indeed of his physical beauty. It wasn't difficult seeing the way his eyes flickered and his close-cropped hair flattered the curve of his skull, why Mimi had slept beneath his gaze all her lonely life. This was the man she'd loved. This was... Romo, he said, addressing Susanna. Your grandmother's first husband. How had he known, sleeping in the weave, that Mimi had taken a human husband? Had the air told him that tonight? What do you want here? said Tung. This isn't a public thoroughfare. I want to speak on behalf of my wife. I knew her heart better than any of you. That was years ago, Romo. Another life. Romo nodded. Yes, he said. It's gone, I know. So she. All the more reason I speak for her. Nobody made any attempt to silence him. She died in the kingdom, he said, to keep us from harm. She died without trying to wake us. Why was that? She had every reason to want the unweaving, to be relieved of her duties and be back with me. Not necessarily, Massimerus said. Romo smiled. Because she married, he said. I would have expected no less. Or because she'd forgotten? No, never. He spoke with such authority, yet so gently everyone in the room attended to him. She didn't forget us. She simply knew what her granddaughter knows, that it isn't safe. Yolanda went to interrupt, but Romo raised his hand. A moment, please, he said. Then I'm going. I've got business elsewhere. Yolanda closed her mouth. I knew Mimi better than any of you. As far as I'm concerned, we parted only yesterday. I know she guarded the weave as long as she had breath and wit to do so. Don't waste her agonies by throwing us into the hands of our enemies, just because you get a whiff of freedom in your nostrils. Easy for you to say, Yolanda replied. I want to live again as much as you do, Romo told her. I stayed here because of my children, thinking, the way we all thought, that we'd be awake in a year or two. Now look, we open our eyes and the world has changed. My Mimi died an old woman, and it's the child of her child who stands in her place to tell us that we are as close to extinction as ever. 
I believe she speaks with Mimi's blessing. We should listen to her. What do you advise? said Tung. Advise? Yolanda said. He's a lion tamer. Why should we listen to his advice? I suggest we reweave, said Romo, ignoring her outburst. Reweave before the cuckoos come among us. Then we find somewhere safe, somewhere we can unweave again in our own time, where the cuckoos won't be waiting at the border. Yolanda's right, he said, looking at her. We can't hide forever. But facing tomorrow morning in this chaotic state isn't courage, it's suicide. The speech was neatly argued, and it clearly impressed a good number of the assembly. And if we do, said one of Yolanda's clan, who guards the carpet? She does, said Romo, looking at Susanna. She knows the kingdom better than anyone, and it's rumored she's got access to the menstruum. Is that true? said Tung. Susanna nodded. The man took a half step away from her. A swell of comments and questions now rose in the room, many of them directed at Romo. He was having none of them, however. I've said all I have to say on the subject, he announced. I can't leave my children waiting any longer. With that, he turned and started back the way he'd come. Susanna pursued him as the controversy escalated afresh. Romo, she called after him. He stopped and turned back. Help me, she said. Stay with me. There's no time, he said. I've got an appointment to keep on your grandmother's behalf. But there's so much I don't understand. Didn't Mimi leave you instructions? He said. I was too late. By the time I reached her, she couldn't. She stopped. Her throat was tight. She felt the sorrow of losing Mimi rising up in her. Couldn't speak. All she left me was a book. Then consult that, Romo said. She knew best. It was taken from me, Susanna said. Then you have to get it back. And what answers you don't find there, put in for yourself. This last remark lost Susanna entirely, but before she could question it, Romo spoke again. Look between, he said. That's the best advice I can offer. Between what? Romo frowned. Simply between, he said, as though the sense of this was self-evident. I know you're the equal of it. You're Mimi's child. He leaned toward her and kissed her. You have her look he said, his hand trembling against her cheek. She suddenly sensed that his touch was more than friendly, and that she felt something undeniable toward him, something inappropriate between her and her grandmother's husband. They both stepped back from the touch, startled by their feelings. He began to walk toward the door, his good night delivered with his back to her. She went after him a pace or two, but didn't try to delay him any longer. He had business, he'd said. As he pushed open the door, there was a roar from the darkness, and her heart jumped as beasts appeared around him. He was not under attack, however. He'd spoken of children, and here they were. Lions, half a dozen or more, welcoming him with growls. Their golden eyes turned up toward him as they jockeyed for the place closest to his side. The door slammed, eclipsing them. They want us to take our leave. Jericho was standing in the passageway behind her. She stared at the closed door for a moment longer as the sound of the lions faded, then turned to him. Are we being thrown out? she asked. No. They just want to debate the problem a while, he said, without us. She nodded. I suggest we walk a little way. By the time they opened the door, Romo and the animals had gone. About Mimi's business. Two. So they walked. He had his silence, she hers. So many feelings to try and comprehend. Her thoughts went back to Mimi and the sacrifice she'd made. Knowing Romo, her beautiful lion tamer was sleeping in a place she could not trespass. Had she touched the knots where he was concealed, she wondered? Had she knelt and whispered her love for him to the weave? The very thought of it was beyond bearing. No wonder she'd been so severe, so stoical. She'd stood guard at the paradise gates, alone, unable to breathe a word of what she knew, fearful of dementia, fearful of death. Don't be afraid, Jericho said at last. I'm not afraid, she lied then, remembering that the colors from her would be contradicting her every word, said, Well, maybe a little. I can't be a custodian, Jericho. I'm not the equal of it. They'd emerged from the myrtle copse and walked out into a field. Several huge marble beasts stood in the knee-high grass, their species either mythical or extinct, but either way chiseled in loving detail, tusk and fur and tiny eye. She leaned against the flank of one and stared at the ground. 
They could hear neither the debate behind them nor the bells in the branches, only night insects going about their business in the shadow of the beasts. His gaze was upon her. She felt it. But she couldn't raise her head to meet it. I think maybe. He began, then stopped. The insects chattered on, mocking his struggle for words. Again he tried. I just wanted to say, I know you're the equal of anything. She was going to smile at this courtesy, but... No, that's not what I wanted to say. He took a fresh breath and with it said, I want to go with you. With me? When you go back to the kingdom. Whether it's with the carpet or without it, I want to be with you. Now she looked up, and his dark face was that of an accused man awaiting verdict, hanging on every flicker of her lash. She smiled, searching for a response. Finally she said, Of course, of course, I'd like that. Yes? he gasped. You would? The anxiety fled from his face, replaced by a luminous grin. Thank you, he said. I want so much that we should be friends. Then friends will be, she replied. The stone was chilly against her back. He in front of her exuded warmth, and there was she where Romo had advised her to be. Between. Chapter 7 Shadwell on High Set me down, said the salesman to his broken-backed mount. They'd climbed a steep-sided hill, the highest Shadwell could find. The view from the top was impressive. Norris, however, wasn't much interested in the view. He sat down laboring for breath and clutched his one-armed drummer to his chest, leaving Shadwell to stand on the promontory and admire the moonlit vista spread beneath him. The journey here had offered a host of extraordinary sights. The occupants of this province, though plainly related to species outside the fugue, had somehow been coaxed by magic into new forms. How else to explain moths five times the size of his hand, which yowled like mating cats from the tops of the trees, or the shimmering snakes he'd seen, posing as flames in the niche of a rock, or the bush the thorns of which bled into its own blossoms. Such novelties were everywhere. The pitch he'd offered to his clients when tempting them to the auction had been colorful enough, but it had scarcely begun to evoke the reality. The fugue was stranger by far than any words of his had suggested, stranger and more distressing. That was what he felt looking down from the hilltop, distress. It had come over him slowly as they journeyed here, beginning like dyspepsia, and escalating to the point where he felt a kind of terror. At first he'd tried not to admit its origins to himself, but such was its force the feeling could now no longer be denied. It was covetousness that had come to birth in his belly, the one sensation that no true salesman could ever indulge. He tried to get the better of the ache by viewing the landscape and its contents in strictly commercial terms. How much could he ask for that orchard, or the islands in that lake? or the moths. But for once the technique failed him. He looked down over the fugue, and all thought of commerce was swept away. It was no use to struggle. He had to admit the bitter fact. He'd made a terrible error trying to sell this place. No price could ever be put on such mind-racking profusion. No bidder, however wealthy, had the wherewithal to purchase it. Here he was, looking down on the greatest collection of miracles the world had ever seen, with all ambition to lord it over princes fled. A new ambition had taken its place. He would be a prince himself, more than a prince. Here was a country laid before him. Why should he not be king? Chapter 8 The Virgin Blooded Happiness was not a condition Immaculata was much familiar with, but there were places in which she and her sisters felt something close to it. Battlefields at evening, when every breath she drew was somebody else's last, mortuaries and sepulchres. Anywhere death was, they took their ease, played among cadavers, and picnicked there. That was why, when they'd gotten bored with searching for Shadwell, they came to the Requiem Steps. It was the only place in the fugue sacred to death. As a child, Immaculata had come here day after day to bathe in the sorrow of others. Now her sisters had taken themselves off in search of some unwilling father, and she was here alone, with thoughts so black the night sky was blindingly bright beside them. She slipped off her shoes and went down the steps to the black mud at the edge of the river. Here it was that the bodies were finally relinquished to the waters. Here the sobs had always been loudest, and faith in the hereafter had trembled in the face of cold fact. It was many, many years since those rituals had been in vogue. The practice of giving the dead to this or any other river had been stopped, 
Too many of the corpses were being found by the cuckoos. Cremation had taken over as the standard method of disposal, much to a Macalada chagrin. The steps had dramatized something true, in the way that they descended into mud. Standing there now with the river moving fast before her, she thought how easy it would be to pitch herself into the flood and go the way of the dead. But she would leave too much unfinished business behind. She'd leave the fugue intact and her enemies alive. There was no wisdom in that. No, she had to go on living, to see the families humiliated, their hopes like their territories in dust, their miracles reduced to playthings. Destruction would be altogether too easy for them. It hurt for an instant only, then it was all over. But to see the seer kind enslaved, that was worth living for. The roar of the water soothed her. She grew nostalgic remembering the body she'd seen snatched beneath this tide. But did she hear another roar beneath that of the river? She looked up from the murky waters. At the top of the steps was a ramshackle building, little more than a roof supported by columns in which the lesser mourners had loitered while the final farewells were made at the riverside. She could just see movement there now, fugitives in the shadows. Was it her sister's? She didn't sense their proximity. Her unspoken question was answered as she crossed the mud back to the bottom step. I knew you'd be here. Immaculata halted, her foot on the step. Of all places, here. Immaculata felt a twinge of trepidation, not because of the man who emerged from the shelter of the column, but because of the company he kept. They moved in the shadows behind him, their panting flanks silken. Lions. He'd come with lions. Oh, yes, Romo said, seeing the incantatrix flinch. I'm not alone like she was. This time you're the vulnerable one. It was true. The lions were unreflective creatures. Her illusions would not mislead them, nor would her assaults easily touch the tamer who shared that bestial indifference. Sisters, she breathed, come to me. The lions were moving into the moonlight, six in all, three male, three female. Their eyes were glued to their owner, awaiting his instructions. She took a step backward. The mud was slick beneath her heel. She almost lost her balance. Where were the Magdalene and the hag? She sent another thought in hectic pursuit of them, but fear made it sluggish. The lions were at the top of the steps now. She didn't dare take her eyes off them, though she loathed the sight. They were so effortlessly magnificent. Much as the thought appalled her, she knew she would have to flee before them. She would have the menstruum carry her up above the river before they reached her. But it was taking its time to flow through her, distracted as she was. She made an attempt to delay their approach. You shouldn't trust them, she said. The lions? said Romo, half smiling. The seer kind. They cheated Mimi as they cheated me. They left her in the kingdom while they took refuge. They're cowards and deceivers. And you? What are you? Immaculata felt the menstruum begin to suffuse her shadow self. With her escape certain, she could afford to tell the truth. I'm nothing, she said, her voice now so soft it was almost lost in the din of the river. I'm alive as long as my hatred for them keeps me alive. It was almost as if the lions understood this last remark, for they came at her suddenly, leaping down the steps to where she stood. The menstruum rippled about her. She started to rise. Even as she did so, the Magdalene appeared from along the river and let out a cry. The call diverted Immaculata's attention, her feet inches from the mud. It was all that the first of the lions required. He launched himself from the steps toward her, and before she could avoid the attack, he clawed her from the air. She fell backward into the mud. Romo pushed his way through the rest of the pride, calling the animal back before Immaculata mustered her powers. The summons came too late. The menstruum was spiraling around the beast, tearing at its face and flanks. The animal could not have disengaged itself now if it had wanted to. But the menstruum's attack left little in reserve for defense, and the lion landed blow after blow, each gouging a brutal wound. Immaculata shrieked and squirmed in the blood-streaked mud, but the lion would not let her alone. As its claws opened her face, it let out a throttled roar, and its assault ceased. It stood over Immaculata for an instant. A steam rose from between them. Then it staggered sideways. Its abdomen had been opened from throat to testicles. It was not the menstruum's doing, but that of the knife now dropping from Immaculata's hand. The beast, trailing its innards, stumbled a little way, then keeled over in the mud. 
The rest of the animals growled their distress, but held their positions at Romo's command. As for Immaculata, the sisters were coming to her aid, but she spat some contemptuous words at them and dragged herself to her knees. The wound she'd sustained would have left a human being, or indeed most seer kind, dead in the dirt. Her face and upper chest had been traumatically mauled. The flesh hung in sickening ribbons. Still, she hauled herself to her feet and turned her agonized eyes, which were now set in a single wound, on Romo. I will destroy everything you ever loved, she said, her voice throbbing, her hand clutching her face while the blood gushed between her fingers. The fugue, the seer kind, all of it, wiped away. You have my promise. You will weep. If it had been in Romo's power, he would have had no compunction about dispatching the incantatrix on the spot. But delivering Immaculata to pastures new was beyond the power of lion or lion tamer. Weakened as the enemy was, she and her sisters would undoubtedly kill the rest of the animals before they reached her. He would have to be content with what their surprise attack had achieved, and hope that Mimi knew in her resting place that her torment had been avenged. He moved toward the felt lion, speaking soft words. Immaculata made no attempt to harm him, but started up toward the steps, her sisters flanking her. The lion stood their ground, waiting for the order that would unleash them. But Romo was too busy grieving. He had laid his cheek on the cheek of the dying animal, still murmuring to it. Then the words of comfort stopped, and a look scarcely less than tragic came over his face. The lions heard his silence and knew what it signified. They turned their heads to him, and as they did so, Immaculata rose into the air, a saint of mud and wounds, the Wraith sisters trailing her like corrupted seraphim. He looked up as they ascended into darkness, a patter of blood falling. Almost as the night erased them, he saw Immaculata's head loll and the sisters rise to her aid. This time the incantatrix did not despise their support, but let them bear her away. Chapter 9 Never and Again The ziggurat builder who'd stood guard outside Capra's house was shouting at them from the edge of the field, courtesy preventing him from coming any closer. "'We want you back at the house,' he called. As they walked back toward the myrtle trees, it became apparent that events of some moment were afoot. Members of the council were already leaving Capra's house, urgency in their step and on their faces. The bells in the trees were all ringing, though there was no breeze moving, and there were lights above the house like vast fireflies. The Amadou, said Jericho. The lights swooped and rose in elaborate configurations. What are they doing? Susanna asked. Signaling, Jericho replied. Signaling what? As he went to reply, Yolanda Dor appeared between the trees and stood in front of Susanna. They're fools to trust you, she stated flatly. But I tell you now, I'm not sleeping. Do you hear me? We have a right to live. You damn cuckoos don't own the earth. Then she was away, cursing Susanna as she went. That means they're taking Romo's advice, said Susanna. That's what the Amadou are saying, Jericho confirmed, still watching the sky. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. Tung was at the door, calling her in. Hurry, will you? We have precious little time. She hesitated. The menstruum offered her no courage now. Her stomach felt like a cold furnace, ash and emptiness. I'm with you, Jericho reminded her, reading her anxiety. His presence was some comfort. Together they went inside. When she stepped into the chamber, she was greeted by an almost reverential hush. All eyes were turned on her. There was desperation in every face. Last time she'd been here, mere minutes ago, she'd been an invader. Now she was the one upon whom their fragile hopes for survival depended. She tried not to let her fear show, but her hands trembled as she stood before them. We're decided, said Tung. Yes, she replied. Yolanda told me. We don't like it much, said one of the number, whom Susanna recognized as a defector from Yolanda's faction but we've got no choice. There are already disturbances at the border, said Tung. The cuckoos know we're here. And it'll soon be morning, said Mesimerus. So it would. Dawn could be no more than ninety minutes away. An hour after that, and every curious cuckoo in the vicinity would be wandering in the fugue, not quite seeing it, perhaps, but knowing there was something to stare at, something to fear. How long after that, before there was a reprise of the scene on Lord Street? Steps have been taken to begin the reweaving, said Dolphi. 
Is that difficult? No, said Mesimerus. The gyre has great power. How long will it take? We have perhaps an hour, said Tung, to teach you about the weave. An hour? What would she learn in an hour? Tell me only as much as I need to know for your safety, she said, and no more than that. What I don't know I can't let slip. Point taken, said Tung. No time for formalities, then. Let's begin. Chapter 10 The Summons Cal woke suddenly. There was a slight chill in the air, though that wasn't what had woken him. It was Lemuel Lowe calling his name. Calhoun! Calhoun! He sat up. Lemuel was at his side, smiling through the thicket of his beard. There's someone here asking for you, he said. Oh? We haven't much time, my poet, he said as Cal struggled to his feet. The carpet's being rewoven. In little more than minutes, all this'll be sleeping again, and me with it. That can't be right, said Cal. It is, friend. But I have no fear. You'll be watching over us, won't you? He clasped Cal's hand in a fierce grip. I dreamed something, Cal said. What was that? I dreamed that this was real and the other wasn't. Lemuel's smile faded. I wish what you dreamed were true, he said. But the kingdom's all too real. It's just that a thing that grows too certain of itself becomes a kind of lie. That's what you dreamed, that the other place is a place of lies. Cal nodded. The grip on his hand tightened as though there was a pact in the making. Don't be lost to it, Calhoun. Remember Lo, eh? And the orchard? Will you? Then we'll see each other again. Lemuel embraced him. Remember, he said, his mouth next to Cal's ear. Cal returned the bear hug as best he could, given Lowe's girth. Then the orchard keeper broke from him. Best go quickly, he said. Your visitor has important business, she says. And he strode away to where the rug was being rolled up and some last melancholy song sung. Cal watched him thread his way between the trees, his fingers brushing against the bark of each as he passed, commanding them to sweet sleep, no doubt. Mr. Mooney? Cal looked around. There was a small woman with distinctly oriental features standing two trees' breadth from him. In her hand she held a lamp, which she raised as she approached him, her scrutiny both lengthy and unapologetic. Well, she said, her voice musical, he told me you were handsome, and so you are, in a quirky kind of way. She cocked her head slightly as if trying to make better sense of Cal's physiognomy. How old are you? Twenty-six. Why? Twenty-six, she said. His mathematics is terrible. So's mine, Cal was about to say, but there were other more pressing questions, the first of which was, Who are you? I'm Chloe, came the woman's reply. I've come to fetch you. We should hurry. He gets impatient. Who does? Even if we had time to talk, I'm forbidden to tell you, Chloe replied. But he's eager to see you, that I can say. Very eager. She turned and started to walk away down the corridor of trees. She was still speaking, but Cal couldn't catch the words. He set off in pursuit of her, the end of a sentence drifting back to him. Not time by foot. What did you say? He asked, coming abreast of her. We have to travel quickly, she said. They had reached the perimeter of the orchard, and there stood, of all things, a rickshaw. Leaning on the handles, smoking a thin black cigarette, was a wiry middle-aged man dressed in bright blue pantaloons and a shabby vest on his head a bowler hat. This is Floris, Chloe told Cal. Please get in. Cal did as he was told, settling himself among a litter of cushions. He could not have refused this adventure if his life had depended upon it. Chloe got in beside him. Hurry, she said to the driver, and they took off like the wind. Chapter 11 At the Gazebo 1. He'd promised himself he wouldn't look back at the orchard. And he was as good as his promise until the very last, when, before the surrounding night claimed the sight entirely, he weakened and glanced around. He could just see the ring of light where he'd stood and recited Mad Mooney's verse. Then the rickshaw turned a corner and the sight was gone. Floris was responsive to Chloe's imperative. Hurry they did. The vehicle rocked and rolled, hauled over stone and pasture with equal gusto, and threatening all the while to pitch its passengers out. Cal held on to the side of the vehicle and watched the fugue pass by. 
He cursed himself for sleeping as he had and missing a night of exploration. When he'd first glimpsed the weave world, it had seemed so very familiar. But traveling these roads, he felt like a tourist, ogling the sights of an alien country. It's a strange place, he said as they passed beneath a rock that had been carved in the form of a vast, teetering wave. What did you expect? said Chloe. Your own backyard? Not exactly. But I thought I knew it in a way. At least in dreams. Paradise always has to be stranger than you expect, doesn't it? Or it loses its power to enchant. And you are enchanted. Yes, he said. And afraid. Of course you are, said Chloe. It keeps the blood fresh. He didn't really comprehend the remark, but there were other claims upon his attention. At every turn and brow, a fresh vista. And ahead, the most impressive sight of all, the roiling cloud wall of the gyre. Is that where we're headed? he asked. Close to it, said Chloe. They plunged suddenly into a copse of birch trees, the silver bark bright by the lightning flashes from the cloud, then headed up a small incline which Floris took at an impressive rate. Beyond the copse the land abruptly changed character. The earth was now dark, almost black, and the vegetation seemed more appropriate to a hothouse than the open air. More than that, as they reached the top of the rise and began to make their way along its spine, Cal found himself subject to odd hallucinations. At either side of the road he kept glimpsing scenes that weren't quite there, like images on a mistuned television, slipping out of focus and back in again. He saw a house built like an observatory with horses grazing around it, saw several women in dresses of watered silk laughing together. There was much else he saw, but none of it for more than a few seconds. You find it unsettling, said Chloe. What's going on? This is paradoxical ground. Strictly speaking, you shouldn't be here at all. There are always dangers. What dangers? If she offered a reply, it was drowned out by a thunderclap from the belly of the gyre, which followed upon lilac lightning. They were within a quarter of a mile of the cloud now. The hairs on Cal's arms and nape stood up. His testicles ached. But Chloe wasn't interested in the mantle. She was gazing at the Amadou moving in the sky behind them. The reweaving's underway, she said. That's why the gyre's so restless. We have less time than I thought. On this cue, Floris picked up his pace to a run, which threw loose earth up from his heels into the rickshaw. It's for the best, said Chloe. This way he won't have time to get maudlin. Three minutes more of bruising travel and they came to a small stone bridge at which Floris brought the vehicle to a dusty halt. Here we disembark, said Chloe, and led Cal up a short flight of well-trodden steps to the bridge. It spanned a narrow but deep gorge, the sides of which were mossy and plumed with ferns. Water rushed beneath, feeding a pool where fishes jumped. Come, come, said Chloe, and hurried Cal over the bridge. Ahead was a house, its doors and shutters flung wide. There were copious bird droppings on the tiled roof, and several large black pigs slumbering against the wall. One raised itself as Cal and Chloe approached the threshold, snuffling at Cal's legs before returning to its porcine slumbers. There were no burning lights inside. The only illumination came from the lightning, which this close to the gyre was practically constant. By it, Cal surveyed the room Chloe had ushered him into. It was sparsely furnished, but there were papers and books on every available surface. On the floor lay a collection of threadbare rugs, and on one of these a vast and probably vastly ancient tortoise. At the far end of the room was a large window which looked onto the mantel. In front of it a man was seated in a large plain chair. Here he is, said Chloe. Cal wasn't sure who was being introduced to whom. Either the chair or its occupant creaked as the man stood up. He was old, though not as old as the tortoise. About Brendan's age, Cal guessed. The face, though clearly acquainted with laughter, had known pain, too. A mark, like a smoke stain, ran from his hairline to the bridge of his nose, where it veered off down his right cheek. It didn't disfigure his face, rather lent it an authority his features wouldn't otherwise have possessed. The lightning came and went, burning the man's silhouette into Cal's mind. But his host said nothing. He just looked at Cal and looked some more. There was pleasure on his face, though quite why Cal didn't know. Nor did he feel ready to ask, at least not until the other broke the silence between them. There didn't seem much likelihood of that, however. The man just stared. It was difficult to be certain of much in the flare of the lightning, but Cal thought there was something familiar about the fellow. 
Suspecting they'd stand there for hours unless he initiated a conversation, he voiced the question his mind had already asked. Do I know you from somewhere? The old man's eyes narrowed as if he wanted to sharpen his sight to pinpoint and pierce Cal's heart. He's not allowed to converse with you, Chloe explained. People who live this close to the gyre. Her words died. What? said Cal. There's not time to explain, she said. Just believe me. The man had not taken his gaze off Cal for a second, not even to blink. The perusal was quite benign, perhaps even loving. Cal was suddenly overcome by a fierce desire to stay, to forget the kingdom and sleep in the weave, here pigs, lightning, and all. But already Chloe had her hand on his arm. We must go, she said. So soon, he protested. We're taking chances bringing you here in the first place, she said. The old man was now moving toward them, his step steady, his gaze the same, but Chloe intervened. Now don't, she said. He frowned, his mouth tight, but he came no closer. We have to be away, she told him. You know we must. He nodded. Were there tears in his eyes? Cal thought so. I'll be back soon enough, she told him. I'll just take him to the border, all right? Again, a single nod. Cal raised his hand in a tentative wave. Well, he said, more mystified than ever, it's... It's been an honor. A faint smile creased the man's face. He knows, said Chloe. Believe me. She took Cal to the door. The lightning blazed through the room. The thunder made the air shake. At the threshold, Cal gave his host one last look. And to his astonishment, indeed to his delight, the man's smile became a grin that had a subtle mischief about it. Take care, Cal said. Grinning even as the tears ran down his cheeks. The man waved him away and turned back toward the window. 2. The rickshaw was waiting on the far side of the bridge. Chloe bundled Cal into his seat, throwing the tasseled cushions out to lighten the load. Be swift, she said to Floris. No sooner had she spoken than they were off. It was a hair-raising journey. A great urgency had seized everything and everybody as the fugue prepared to lose its substance to pattern again. Overhead, the night sky was a maze of birds. The fields were rife with animals. There was everywhere a great readying, as if for some momentous dive. Do you dream? Cal asked Chloe as they traveled. The question had come out of the blue, but was suddenly of great importance to him. Dream? said Chloe. When you're in the weave? Perhaps, she said. She seemed preoccupied. But I never remember my dreams. I sleep too deeply. She faltered, then looked away from Cal before saying, Like death. You'll wake again soon, he said, understanding the melancholy that had come upon her. It'll only be a few days. He tried to sound confident, but doubted that he was succeeding. He knew all too little of what the night had brought. Was Shadwell still alive, and the sisters? And if so, where? I'm going to help you, he said. That I do know. I'm part of this place now. Oh, yes, she said with great gravity. That you are. But Cal... She looked at him, her hand taking his, and he felt a bond between them, an intimacy even, which seemed out of all proportion to the meager time they'd known each other. Cal, future history is full of tricks. I don't follow. Things can be so easily erased, she said. And forever. Believe me. Forever. Entire lives gone as if they'd never been lived. Am I missing something? He said. Just don't assume everything's guaranteed. I don't, he told her. Good. Good. She seemed a little cheered by this. You're a fine man, Calhoun. But you'll forget. Forget what? All this. The fugue. He laughed. Never, he said. Oh, but you will. Indeed, maybe you have to. Have to, or your heart would break. He thought of Lemuel again in his parting words. Remember, he'd said. Was it really so difficult? If there were any further words to be said on the subject, they went unvoiced. For at this point, Floris brought the rickshaw to an abrupt halt. What's the problem? Chloe wanted to know. The rickshaw driver pointed dead ahead. No more than a hundred yards from where the rickshaw stood, the landscape and all it contained was losing itself to the weave. Solid matter becoming clouds of color 
from which the threads of the carpet would be drawn. So soon, said Chloe. Get out, Calhoun. We can take you no further. The line of the weave was approaching like a forest fire, eating up everything in its path. It was an awesome scene, though he knew perfectly well what procedures were underway here, and knew them to be benevolent. The sight was almost chilling. A world was dissolving before his very eyes. You're on your own from here, said Chloe. About turn, Floris, and fly. The rickshaw was turned. What happens to me, said Cal. You're a cuckoo, Chloe shouted back at him as Floris hauled the rickshaw away. You can simply walk out the other side. She shouted something else, which he failed to catch. He hoped to God it wasn't a prayer. Chapter 12 A Vanishing Breed 1. Despite Chloe's words, the spectacle ahead offered little comfort. The devouring line was approaching at considerable speed, and it left nothing unchanged. His gut told him to flee before it. But he knew that would be a vain maneuver. This same transfiguring tide would be eating in from all compass points. Soon there would be nowhere left to run. Instead of standing still and letting it come to fetch him, he elected to walk toward it and brave its touch. The air began to itch around him as he took his first hesitant steps. The ground squirmed and shook beneath his feet. A few more yards in the region he was walking through actually began to shift. Loose pebbles were snatched into the flux, leaves plucked from bush and tree. This is going to hurt, he thought. The frontier was no more than ten yards from him now, and he could see with astonishing clarity the processes at work, the raptures of the loom dividing the matter of the fugue into strands, then drawing these up into the air and knotting them, those knots in their turn filling the air like countless insects, until the final rapture called them into the carpet. He could afford to wonder at this sight for seconds only before he and it met, strands leaping up around him like rainbow fountains. There was no time for farewells. The fugue simply vanished from sight, leaving him immersed in the working of the loom. The rising threads gave him the sensation of falling, as though the knots were destined for heaven, and he a damned soul. But it wasn't heaven above him. It was pattern. A kaleidoscope that defeated eye and mind, its motifs configuring and reconfiguring as they found their place beside their fellows. Even now he was certain he'd be similarly metamorphosed. His flesh and bone become symbol, and he woven into the grand design. But Chloe's prayer, if that it had been, afforded him protection. The loom rejected his cuckoo stuff and passed him by. One minute he was in the midst of the weave. The next, the glories of the fugue were behind him, and he was left standing in a bare field. Two. He wasn't alone there. Several dozen seer kind had chosen to step out into the kingdom. Some stood alone, watching their home consumed by the weave. Others were in small groups, debating feverishly. Yet others were already heading off into the gloom, before the Adamaticos came looking for them. Among them, lit by the blaze of the weave, a face he recognized, that of Apolline Dubois. He went to her. She saw him coming, but offered no welcome. "'Have you seen Susanna?' he asked her. She shook her head. "'I've been cremating Frederick and setting my affairs to rights,' she said. She got no further. An elegant individual, his cheeks rouged, now appeared at her side. He looked every inch a pimp. We should go, Moth, he said, before the beasts are upon us. I know, Apolline said to him. Then to Cal. We're going to make our fortunes, teaching you cuckoos the meaning of desire. Her companion offered a less than wholesome grin. More than half his teeth were gold. There are hard times ahead she said, and patted Cal's cheek. So you come see me one of these days, she said. We'll treat you well. She took the pimp's arm. Bon chance, she said, and the pair hurried away. The line of the weave was by now a good distance from where Cal stood, and the numbers of seer kind who'd emerged was well into three figures. He went among them, still looking for Susanna. His presence was largely ignored. They had more pressing concerns, these people delivered into the late twentieth century with only magic to keep them from harm. He didn't envy them. Among the refugees he caught sight of three of the buyers, standing dazed and dusty, their faces blank. What would they make of tonight's experiences, he wondered? Would they pour the whole story out to their friends and endure the disbelief and contempt heaped on their heads? 
or would they let the tale fester untold? The latter, he suspected. Dawn was close. The weaker stars had already disappeared, and even the brightest were uncertain of themselves. It's over, he heard somebody murmur. He looked back toward the weave. The brilliance of its making had almost flickered out. But suddenly there came a shout in the night, and a beat later Cal saw three lights, members of the Amadou, rising from the embers of the weave at enormous speed. They drew together as they rose, until high above the streets and fields they collided. The blaze of their meeting illuminated the landscape as far as the eye could see. By it, Cal glimpsed Seerkind running in all directions, averting their eyes from the brilliance. Then the light died, and the pre-dawn gloom that followed seemed so impenetrable by contrast, Cal was effectively blind for a minute or more. As by slow degrees the world re-established itself about him, he realized that there had been nothing arbitrary about the fireworks or their effect. The seer kind had disappeared. Where, ninety seconds ago, there had been scraggling figures all around him, there was now emptiness. Under the cover of light, they'd made their escape. Chapter 13 A Proposal 1. Hobart had seen the blaze of the Amadou, too. Though he was still two and a half miles from the spot, the night had brought disaster upon disaster. Richardson, still jittery after events at headquarters, had twice driven the car into the backs of stationary vehicles, and their route, which had taken them all over the world, had been a series of cause de sac But at last here it was, a sign that their quarry was close. What was that? said Richardson. Looked like something exploding. God knows, said Hobart. I wouldn't put anything past these people, especially the woman. Should we call in some backup, sir? We don't know their numbers. Even if we could, Hobart said, switching off the white noise that had swallowed Downey hours ago. I want to keep this quiet until we know what's what. Kill the headlights. The driver did so, and they drove on in the pre-dawn murk. By it, Hobart thought he could see figures moving in the mist beyond the gray foliage that lined the road. There was no time to investigate, however. He would have to trust his instinct that the woman was somewhere up ahead. Suddenly, there was somebody in the road ahead of them. Cursing, Richardson threw the wheel over, but the figure seemed to leap up and over the car. The vehicle mounted the pavement and ran a few yards before Richardson brought it under control again. Shit! Did you see that? Hobart had and felt the same aching unease he'd felt back at headquarters. These people were holding weapons that worked on a man's sense of what was real, and he loved reality more than his balls. Did you see? said Richardson. The fucker just flew. No, Hobart said firmly. There was no flying. Understood? Yes, sir. Don't trust your eyes. Trust me. Yes, sir. And if anything else gets in your way, run it down. Two. The light that had blinded Cal blinded Shadwell, too. He fell from the back of his human horse and scrabbled around in the dirt until the world began to come back into focus. When it did, two sights greeted him. One, that of Norris, lying on the ground, sobbing like an infant. The other, Susanna, accompanied by two of the kind, emerging from the rubble of Shearman's house. They weren't empty-handed. They were carrying the carpet. God, the carpet! He looked about him for the incantatrix, but there was no one near to aid him except the horse, who was well past aiding anybody. Stay calm, he told himself. You've still got the jacket. He brushed off the worst of the dirt he'd acquired, centered the knot of his tie, then walked over to intercept the thieves. Thank you so much, he said as he approached them, for preserving my property. Susanna gave him a single glance, then told the carpet-bearers, Ignore him. That said, she led them toward the road. Shadwell went after them quickly and took firm hold of the woman's arm. He was determined to preserve his politeness as long as possible. It always confused the enemy. Do we have a problem here? he wondered. No problem, Susanna said. The carpet belongs to me, Miss Parrish. I insist that it remain here. Susanna looked around for Jericho. They'd become separated in the last minutes of her briefing at Capra's house. When Mesimerus had taken her aside to offer her some words of advice, he had still been in full flow when the weave had reached the doorstep of Capra's house. She had never heard his final remarks. Please, said Shadwell, smiling. We can surely come to some arrangement. If you wish, I'll buy the item off you. 
How much shall we say? He opened his jacket, no longer directing his spiel at Susanna, but at the two who were carrying the carpet. Strong arm they might be, but easy fodder. Already they were staring into the folds of the jacket. Maybe you see something you'd like, he said. It's a trick, said Susanna. But look, one of them said to her, and damn it if she didn't instinctively do exactly that. Had the night not brought so many exhausting diversions, she would have had the strength to avert her sight immediately, but she wasn't fast enough. Something glimmered in the mother-of-pearl lining, and she could not quite unhook her gaze. You do see something, Shadwell said to her. Something pretty for a pretty woman. She did. The raptures of the jacket had seized her in two seconds flat, and she couldn't resist its mischief. At the back of her head a voice called her name, but she ignored it. Again it called. Look away, it said, but she could see something taking shape in the lining, and it tantalized her. No, damn you, the same voice shouted, and this time a blurred figure came between her and Shadwell. Her reverie broke, and she was thrown from the jacket's soothing embrace, to see Cal in front of her, throwing a barrage of punches at the enemy. Shadwell was much the bigger of the two men, but the heat of Cal's fury had momentarily cowed him. Get the fuck out of here, Cal yelled. By now Shadwell had overcome his shock and launched himself upon Cal, who reeled before the retaliation. Knowing he'd lose the bout in seconds, he ducked beneath Shadwell's fists and took hold of the salesman in a bear hug. They wrestled for several seconds, precious time which Susanna seized to lead the carpet carriers through the rubble and away. Their escape came not a moment too soon. In the time she'd been distracted by the jacket, day had almost come upon them. They'd soon be easy targets for a Macalata or indeed anyone else who wanted to stop them. Hobart, for instance. She saw him now as they reached the edge of Shearman's estate, stepping out of a car parked in the street. Even in this dubious light and at some distance, she knew it was he. Her hatred smelled him, and she knew too with some prophetic sense the menstruum had undammed in her, that even if they escaped him now the pursuit would not stop here. She'd made an enemy for the millennium. She didn't watch him for long, why bother? She could perfectly recall every nick and pore upon his barren face, and if the memory ever grew a little dim, all she would have to do was look over her shoulder. Damn him, he'd be there. 3. Though Cal held on to Shadwell with the tenacity of a terrier, the salesman's superior weight rapidly gained the day. Cal was thrown down among the bricks, and Shadwell closed in. No quarter was given. Shadwell began to kick him, not once, but a dozen times. Fucking bastard! he yelled. The kicks kept coming, time to prevent Cal's getting up. I'm going to break every bone in your fucking body, Shadwell promised. I'm going to fucking kill you. He might have done it, too, but that somebody said, You! Shadwell's assault stopped momentarily, and Cal looked past the salesman's legs to the man in dark glasses who was approaching. It was the policeman from Chariot Street. Shadwell turned on the man. Who the hell are you? he said. Inspector Hobart, came the reply. Cal could imagine the wave of guilelessness that would now be breaking over Shadwell's face. He could hear it in the man's voice. Inspector, of course, of course. And you? Hobart returned. Who are you? Cal didn't hear the rest of the exchange. He was occupied with the business of making his bruised body crawl away through the rubble hoping the same good fortune that had let him escape alive had speeded Susanna on her way. Where is she? Where's who? The woman who was here, said Hobart. He took off his glasses, the better to see this suspect in the half-light. The man has dangerous eyes, thought Shadwell. He has the eyes of a rabid fox, and he wants Susanna too. How interesting. Her name is Susanna Parrish, said Hobart. Ah said Shadwell. You know her. Indeed I do. She's a thief. She's a good deal worse than that. What's worse than a thief? thought Shadwell, but said, Is that so? She's wanted for questioning on charges of terrorism. And you're here to arrest her? I am. Good man, said Shadwell. What better, he thought. An upstanding, fine-principled, law-loving despot. Who could ask for a better ally in such troubled times? I have some evidence, he said, that may be of value to you. 
but strictly for your eyes only. On Hobart's instruction, Richardson retired a little way. I'm in no mood for games, Hobart warned. Believe me, said Shadwell, upon my mother's eyes, this is no game. He opened his jacket. The inspector's fretful glance went immediately to the lining. He's hungry, thought Shadwell. He's so hungry. But what for? That would be interesting to see. What would friend Hobart desire most in all the wide world? Maybe you see something there that catches your eye? Hobart smiled, nodded. You do? Then take it, please. It's yours. The inspector reached toward the jacket. Go on. Shadwell encouraged him. He'd never seen such a look on any human face, such a wilderness of innocent malice. A light ignited within the jacket, and Hobart's eyes suddenly grew wilder still. Then he was drawing his hand out of the lining, and Shadwell almost let out a yelp of surprise as he shared the lunatic's vision. In the palm of the man's hand, a livid fire was burning, its flames yellow and white. They leapt a foot high, eager for something to consume. Their brilliance echoed in Hobart's eyes. Oh, yes, said Hobart. Give me fire. It's yours, my friend, and I'll burn them away. Shadwell smiled. You and I together, he proposed. Thus began a marriage made in hell. Part 6 Back Among the Blind Men if a man could pass through paradise in a dream and have a flower presented to him as a pledge that his soul had really been there, and if he found that flower in his hand when he awoke, aye, and what then? S. T. Coleridge, Anima Poetry, Chapter One, Times Gone By, One. The people of Chariot Street had witnessed some rare scenes in recent times, but they'd re-established the status quo with admirable zeal. It was just before eight in the morning when Cal got off the bus and began the short walk to the Mooney residence, and everywhere along the street the same domestic rituals that he'd witnessed here since his childhood were being played out. Radios announced the morning's news through open windows and doors. A parliamentarian had been found dead in his mistress's arms. Bombs had been dropped in the Middle East. Slaughter and scandal, scandal and slaughter. And was the tea too weak this morning, my dear? And did the children wash behind their ears? He let himself into the house, turning over yet again the problem of what to tell Brendan. Anything less than the truth might beg more questions than it answered. And yet to tell the whole story, was that even possible? Did the words exist to evoke more than an echo of the sights he'd seen, the feelings he'd felt? The house was quiet, which was worrying. Brendan had been a dawn riser since his days working on the docks. Even during the worst of recent times, he'd been up to greet his grief early. Cal called his father's name. There was no response. He went through to the kitchen. The garden looked like a battlefield. He called again, then went to search upstairs. His father's bedroom door was closed. He tried the handle, but the door was locked from the inside, something he'd never known happened before. He knocked lightly. Dad, he said, are you there? He waited several seconds, listening closely, then repeated his inquiry. This time, from within, came a quiet sobbing. Thank God, he breathed. Dad, it's Cal. The sobbing softened. Will you let me in, Dad? There was a short interval, then he heard his father's footsteps as he crossed to the bedroom door. The key was turned. The door was opened a reluctant six inches. The face on the other side was more shadow than man. Brendan looked neither to have washed nor shaved since the previous day. Oh, God! Dad. Brendan peered at his son with naked suspicion. Is it really you? The comment reminded Cal of how he must look, his face bloodied and bruised. I'm all right, Dad, he said, offering a smile. What about you? Are all the doors closed? Brendan wanted to know. The doors? Yes. And the windows? Yes. Brendan nodded. You're absolutely sure? I told you yes. What's wrong, Dad? The rats, said Brendan, his eyes scanning the landing behind Cal. I heard them all night. They came up the stairs, they did. Sat at the top of the stairs. I heard them. Size of cats they were. 
They sat there waiting for me to come out. Well, they're not here any longer. Got in through the fence, off the embankment. Dozens of them. Why don't we go downstairs? Cal suggested. I can make you some breakfast. No, I'm not coming down. Not today. Then I'll make something and bring it up, shall I? If you like, said Brendan. As Cal started down the stairs again, he heard his father lock and bolt the door once more. 2. In the middle of the morning, a knock on the door. It was Mrs. Valance, whose house was opposite the Moonies. I was just passing, she said, this fact belied by the slippers on her feet. I thought I'd see how your father was doing. He was very odd with the police, I heard. What did you do to your face? I'm all right. I had a very polite officer interview me the woman said. He asked me, she lowered her voice, if your father was unbalanced. Cal bit back a retort. They wanted to talk to you, too, of course, she said. Well, I'm here now, said Cal, if they need me. My son Raymond said he saw you on the railway. Running off, he said. Goodbye, Mrs. Valance. And he's got good eyes, has Raymond. I said goodbye, said Cal, and slammed the door in the woman's self-satisfied face. 3. Her visit was not the last of the day. Several people called to see that all was well. There was clearly much gossip in the street about the Mooney household. Perhaps some bright spark had realized that it had been the center of the previous day's drama. Every time there was a knock on the door, Cal expected to see Shadwell on the step but apparently the salesman had more urgent concerns than finishing the job he'd begun in the ruins of Shearman's house. Or perhaps he was simply waiting for more propitious stars. Then, just after noon, while Cal was out at the loft feeding the birds, the telephone rang. He raced inside and snatched it up. Even before she spoke, Cal knew it was Susanna. Where are you? She was breathless and agitated. We have to get out of the city, Cal. They're after us. Shadwell? Not just Shadwell. The police. Have you got the carpet? Yes. Well, then, tell me where you are. I'll come and... I can't. Not on the phone. It's not tapped, for God's sake. Any bets? I have to see you, he said, somewhere between a request and a demand. Yes, she replied, her voice softening. Yes, of course. How? There was a long silence. Then she said, Where you made your confession. What? You remember? He thought about it. What confession had he ever made to her? Oh, yes. I love you. How could he have forgotten that? Yes, she said. Yes. When? An hour. I'll be there. We don't have much time, Cal. He was going to tell her he knew that, but the line was already dead. The ache in his bruised bones improved miraculously after the conversation. His step was light as he went upstairs to check on Brendan. I have to go out for a while, Dad. Have you locked all the doors? His father asked. Yes, the house is locked and bolted. Nothing can get in. Is there anything else you need? Brendan took a moment to consider the question. I'd like some whiskey, he said finally. Do we have any? In the bookcase, said the old man. Behind the Dickens. I'll fetch it for you. He was sliding the bottle from its hiding place when the doorbell rang again. He was of half a mind not to answer it, but the visitor insisted. I'll be with you in a minute, he called upstairs, then he opened the door. The man in the dark glasses said, Calhoun Mooney? Yes. My name's Inspector Hobart. This is Officer Richardson. We're here to ask you some questions. Right now? said Cal. I'm just about to go out. Urgent business? said Hobart. Wiser to say no, Cal reasoned. Not exactly, he said. Then you won't mind us taking up some time, said Hobart, and the two of them were inside the house in seconds. Close the door, Hobart instructed his colleague. You look flustered, Mooney. Have you got something to hide? Why should... No. We're in possession of information to the contrary. From above, Brendan called for his whiskey. Who's that? It's my father, said Cal. He wanted a drink. Richardson plucked the bottle from Cal's hand and crossed to the bottom of the stairs. Don't go up, said Cal. You'll frighten him. Nervous family, Richardson remarked. He's not been well, 
said Cal. My men are like lambs, said Hobart. As long as you're within the law. Again, Brendan's voice drifted down. Cal, who is it? Just someone who wants a word with me, Dad, Cal said. There was another answer in his throat, though, one which he swallowed unsaid, a truer answer. It's the rats, Dad. They got in after all. Four. The minutes ticked by. The questions came around and around, as if on a carousel. It was apparent from Hobart's probing that he'd spoken at length with Shadwell, so outright denials from Cal were fruitless. He was obliged to tell what little part of the truth he could. Yes, he did know a woman called Susanna Parrish. No, he knew nothing of her personal history, nor had she spoken of her political affiliations. Yes, he had seen her in the last twenty-four hours. No, he did not know where she was now. As he answered the questions, he tried not to think of her waiting for him at the river, waiting and not finding him and going away. But the more he tried to put the thought from his head, the more it returned. Restless, Mooney? I'm a little hot, that's all. Got an appointment to keep, have you? No. Where is she, Mooney? I don't know. There's no sense in protecting her. She's the worst filth, Mooney. Believe me. I've seen what she can do. Things you wouldn't believe. Makes my stomach turn over to think of it. He spoke with complete conviction. Cal didn't doubt that he meant all he said. What are you, Mooney? What do you mean? Are you my friend or my enemy? There's no middle way, you see. No maybe. Friend or enemy. Which? I've done nothing against the law. I'll be the one to decide that, said Hobart. I know the law. I know it and love it. And I won't have it spat on, Mooney, not by you or anybody. He took a breath, then stated, You're a liar, Mooney. I don't know how deep you're in this, or why, but I do know you're a liar. A pause. Then, so we'll start over again, shall we? I've told you everything I know. We'll start from the beginning. How did you meet the terrorist Susanna Parrish? Five. After two and three quarters hours on the carousel, Hobart finally bored of the ride and pronounced that he was finished with Cal for now. No charges would be pressed, at least not immediately, but Cal should consider himself under suspicion. You made yourself two enemies today, Mooney, Hobart said. Me and the law. You'll live to regret that. Then the rats left. Cal sat in the back room for five minutes, trying to gather his thoughts, then went up to see how Brendan was faring. The old man was asleep. Leaving his father to his dreams, Cal went in search of his own. Six. She'd gone, of course, long ago. He wandered around in the vicinity, searching among the warehouses, hoping she'd left some message for him. But there was none to be found. Exhausted by all the day had brought, he headed home. As he stepped through the gate back onto the dock road, he caught sight of someone watching him from a parked car. One of Hobart's clan, perhaps. One of the law lovers. Maybe Susanna had been nearby after all but unable to make her presence known for fear of being spotted. The thought of her being so close, frustrating as it was, cushioned the blow of not seeing her, at least a little. When things were safe, she'd call him and arrange another rendezvous. In the evening, the wind got up and it gusted through the night and the following day, bringing the first chill of autumn with it. But it brought no news. Chapter 2 Despair And so it went on for a week and a half. No news no news. He returned to work, claiming his father's illness as reason for his absence, and took up where he'd left off amid the claim forms. At lunchtimes he came back to the house to heat up some food for Brendan, who, though he could be coaxed from his room, was painfully anxious to return to it, and to feed the birds. In the evenings he made some attempt to tidy the garden, he even patched the fence. But these tasks received only a fraction of his attention. However many diversions he put between himself and his impatience, Nine out of every ten thoughts were of Susanna and her precious burden. But the more days that went by without word from her, the more he began to think the unthinkable, that she wasn't going to call. Either she feared the consequences of trying to make contact, or worse, she no longer could. Toward the end of the second week, he decided to try and find the carpet by the only means available to him. He set the pigeons free. They rose up into the air in an aerial ovation and circled the house, the sight reminded him of that first day in Rue Street, and his spirits lifted. Go on, he willed them. Go on. 
Round and round they flew, as if orienting themselves. His heart beat a little faster each time it seemed one of them was detaching itself from the flock to head off. Running shoes on, he was ready to follow. But after all too short a time, they began to tire of their liberation. One by one they fluttered down again, even thirty-three, some landing in the garden, others on the gutters of the house. A few even flew straight back into the loft. Their perches were cramped, and doubtless the night trains disturbed their sleep, but for most of them it was the only habitat they'd ever known. Though there were surely winds up there to tempt them, winds that smelled of places lusher than their loft beside the railway line, they had no wish to chance their wings on such currents. He cursed them for their lack of enterprise, and fed them and watered them, and finally returned despondently to the house, where Brandon was talking of rats again. Chapter 3 Forgetfulness 1. The third week of September brought rain. Not the torrents of August which had poured from operatic skies, but drizzles and piddlings. The days grew grayer, and so it seemed did Brandon. Though Cal made daily attempts to persuade his father downstairs, he would no longer come. Cal also made two or three valiant efforts to talk about what had happened the month before, but the old man was simply not interested. His eyes became glazed as soon as he sensed the drift of the conversation, and if Cal persisted he grew irritable. The professionals judged that Brendan was suffering from senile dementia, an irreversible process which would finally make him impossible for Cal to nurse. It might be best for all concerned, they advised, if a place were found in a nursing home, where Brendan could be cared for twenty-four hours a day. Cal rejected the suggestion. He was certain that Brendan's cleaving to a room he knew, one he'd shared with Eileen for so many years, was all that was keeping him from total breakdown. He was not alone in his attempts to nurse his father. Two days after he'd failed to set the pigeons flying, Geraldine had appeared at the house. There was ten minutes of hesitant apologies and explanations. Then Brendan's condition entered the exchange, and Geraldine's good sense came triumphantly to the fore. "'Forget our differences,' she said. I want to help. Cal was not about to refuse the offer. Brendan responded to Geraldine's presence as a child to a long-lost tit. He was cosseted and indulged, and with Geraldine in the house in Eileen's place, Cal found himself falling back into the old domestic routines. The affection he felt for Geraldine was painless, which was surely the most certain sign of how slight it was. When she was there, he was happy to be with her, but he seldom, if ever, missed her. As to the fugue, he did his best to keep his memories of it sharp, but it was by no means easy. The kingdom had ways to induce forgetfulness so subtle and so numerous, he was scarcely aware of how they dulled him. It was only when, in the middle of a dreary day, something reminded him, a scent, a shout, that he had once been in another place, and breathed its air and met its creatures. It was only then that he realized how tentative his recall was. And the more he went in pursuit of what he was forgetting— the more it eluded him. The glories of the few were becoming mere words, the reality of which he could no longer conjure. When he thought of an orchard, it was less and less that extraordinary place he'd slept in, slept and dreamed that this life he was now living was the dream, and more a commonplace stand of apple trees. The miracles were drifting from him, and he seemed to be unable to hold on to them. Surely dying was like this, he thought, losing things dear and unable to prevent their passing. Yes, this was a kind of dying. 2. Brendan, for his part, continued to continue. As the weeks passed, Geraldine managed to talk him into joining them downstairs, but he was interested in little but tea and television, and his conversation was now scarcely more than grunts. Sometimes Cal would watch Brendan's face as he sat slumped in front of the television, his expression unchanging whether the screen offered pundits or comedians, and wondered what had happened to the man he'd known. Was the old Brendan still in hiding somewhere, behind those addled eyes? Or had he been an illusion all along, a son's dream of his father's permanence, which, like the letter from Eileen, had simply evaporated? Perhaps it was for the best, he thought, that Brendan was shielded from his pain, then drew himself up short at such a thought. Wasn't that what they said as the coffin was marched past? It was all for the best? Brendan wasn't dead yet. As time went by, Geraldine's presence began to prove as comforting to Cal as to the old man. Her smiles were the brightest thing those dismal months could boast. She came and went, more indispensable by the day, until in the first week of December she suggested it might be more convenient all around if she slept at the house. It was a perfectly natural progression. I don't want to marry you, she told him quite plainly. The sorry spectacle of Teresa's marriage, 
five months old and already rocky, had confirmed her worst suspicions of matrimony. I did want to marry you once, she said, but now I'm happy just to be with you. She proved easy company, down to earth, unsentimental, as much companion as lover. She it was who made certain the bills were paid on time, and saw that there was tea in the caddy. She it was, too, who suggested that Cal sell the pigeons. Your father doesn't show any interest in them any longer, she said on more than one occasion. He wouldn't even notice if they were gone. That was certainly true, but Cal refused to contemplate the sale. Come spring and the fine weather, his father might well show fresh interest in the birds. You know that's not true, she'd tell him when he put this point. Why do you want to keep them so much? They're just a burden. Then she'd let the subject drop for a few days, only to raise it again when a cue was presented. History was repeating itself. Often in the course of these exchanges, which gradually became more heated, Cal could hear echoes of his mother and father. The same roots were being trodden afresh. And like his father, Cal, though malleable on almost every other issue, was immovable on this. He would not sell the birds. The real reason for this bullishness was not, of course, hope of Brendan's rehabilitation, but the fact that the birds were his last concrete link with the events of the previous summer. In the weeks after Susanna's disappearance, he'd bought a dozen newspapers a day, scanning each page for some report of her, or the carpet or shadwell. But there was nothing, and eventually, unable to bear the daily disappointment, he'd stopped looking. Nor was there any further visit from Hobart or his men, which was in its way bad news. He, Cal, had become an irrelevancy. The story, if it was still being written, was running on without him. He became so frightened he'd forget the fugue that he took the risk of writing down all that he could remember of the night there, which, when he set himself to the task, was depressingly little. He wrote the names down, too. Lemuel Lowe, Apolline Dubois, Frederick Camel, set them all down at the back of his diary in the section reserved for telephone numbers, except that there were no numbers for these people nor addresses either, just uncommon names to which he was less and less able to attach faces. 3. On some nights he had dreams from which he would wake with tears on his face. Geraldine consoled him as best she could, given that he claimed not to recall these dreams when he woke. That was in a sense true. He brought nothing into consciousness that words could encapsulate, only an aching sadness. She would lie beside him then and stroke his hair, and tell him that though these were difficult times, things could be much worse. She was right, of course. And by and by the dreams dwindled until they finally ceased altogether. 4. In the last week of January, with Christmas bills still outstanding and too little money to pay them with, he sold the pigeons, with the exception of thirty-three and his mate. This pair he kept, though the reason why was harder and harder to remember, and by the end of the following month had been forgotten entirely. Chapter 4. The Nomads 1. The passage of winter was certainly weary for Cal, but for Susanna it held perils far worse than boredom and bad dreams. Those perils had begun the day after the night of the fugue, when she and the Peverelli brothers had so narrowly escaped capture by Shadwell. Her life and Jericho's, with whom she'd been reunited in the street beyond Shearman's estate, had scarcely been out of danger since. She had been warned of this at Capra's house, and a good deal else beside. But of all she'd learned— the subject that had left the deepest impression was the scourge. The counselors had grown pale, talking of how close to extinction the families had come. And though the enemies now snapping at her heels, Shadwell and Hobart, were of a different order entirely, she could not help but believe they and the scourge sprang from the same poisonous earth. They were all in their way enemies of life, and they were equally relentless. Staying one step ahead of the salesman and his new ally was exhausting, she and Jericho had been granted a few hours' grace on that first day, when a false trail laid by the brothers had successfully confused the hounds, but Hobart had picked up the scent again by noon. She'd had no choice but to leave the city that afternoon, and a second-hand car she'd bought to replace the police vehicle they'd stolen. Using her own car, she knew, would be like sending up smoke signals. One fact surprised her. There was no sign either on the day of reweaving or subsequently of a Macalotta. Was it possible that the incantatrix and her sisters had elected to stay in the carpet, or even become trapped there against their will? Perhaps that was too much to hope for. Yet the menstruum, 
which she was increasingly able to control and use, never carried a tremor of Immaculata's presence. Jericho kept a respectful distance in those early weeks, made uneasy perhaps by her preoccupation with the menstruum. He could be of no use in her learning process. The force she owned was a mystery to him. His maleness feared it. But by degrees she convinced him that neither it nor she, if they could be defined as separate entities, bore him the slightest ill will, and he grew a little easier with her powers. She was even able to talk with him about how she'd first gained access to the menstruum and how it had subsequently delved into Cal. She was grateful for the chance to talk about these events. They'd remained locked up in her for too long, fretted over. He had few answers for her, but the very telling seemed to heal her anxieties, and the less anxious she became, the more the menstruum showed its worth. It gave her a power that proved invaluable in those weeks, a premonitory skill that showed her ghost forms of the future. She'd see Hobart's face on the stairs outside the room where they were hiding and know that he'd be standing in that very spot before too long. Sometimes she'd see Shadwell, too, but mostly it was Hobart, his eyes desperate, his thin mouth shaping her name. That was the signal to move on, of course, whatever the time of day or night. Pack up their bags and the carpet and go. She had other talents, too, all rooted in the menstruum. She could see the lights Jericho had first shown her on Lord Street, and, after a surprisingly short space, they became quite unremarkable to her, merely another piece of information, like the expression on a face or the tone of a voice, that she used to read a stranger's temperament. And there was another visionary skill she now possessed, somewhere between the premonitions and the halos. That is, she could see the consequence of natural processes. It wasn't just the bud she saw, but the blossom it would become in spring, and if she stretched her sight a little further, the fruit that would come after it. This grasp of potential had several consequences. For one, she gave up eating eggs. For another, she found herself fighting off a beguiling fatalism, which, if she hadn't resisted it, might have left her adrift in a sea of inevitabilities, going whatever way the future chose to take her. It was Jericho who helped save her from this dangerous tide, with his boundless enthusiasm for being and doing. Though the blossom and the withering of the blossom were inevitable, human and seer kind had choices to make before death. Roads to travel, roads to ignore. One of those choices was whether to stay companions or become lovers. They chose to be lovers, though it happened so naturally Susanna could not pinpoint the moment of decision. Certainly they never talked explicitly about it, though perhaps it had been in the air since the conversation in the field outside Capra's house. It just seemed right that they take that comfort from each other. He was a sophisticated bed partner, responsive to subtle changes in mood, capable of raucous laughter one moment and great gravity the next. He was also, much to her delight, a brilliant thief. Despite the vicissitudes of life on the run, they ate and traveled like royalty, simply because he was so light-fingered. She wasn't certain how he managed to be so successful, whether it was some subtle rapture he employed to divert a watcher's eye, or whether he was simply born a thief. Whatever his method, he could steal anything, large or small, and scarcely a day went by without their tasting some expensive delicacy— or indulging his newfound passion for champagne. It made the chase easier in more practical ways, too, for they were able to change cars as often as they liked, leaving a trail of abandoned vehicles along the route. That route took them in no particular direction. They simply drove where their instincts suggested. Intentionality, Jericho had said, was the easiest way to get caught. I never intend to steal, he explained to Susanna one day as they drove, not until I've done it, so nobody ever knows what I'm up to because I don't either. She liked this philosophy. It appealed to her sense of humor. If she ever got back to London, to her clay and her kiln, she would see if the notion made aesthetic as well as criminal sense. Maybe letting go was the only true control. What kind of pots would she make if she didn't try to think about it? The trick, however, didn't dislodge their pursuers, merely kept them at a distance, and on more than one occasion that distance narrowed uncomfortably. Two. They had been two days in Newcastle in a small hotel on Rudyard Street. The rain had been falling steadily for a week now, and they'd been talking over the possibility of leaving the country, going somewhere sunnier. Serious problems attended such an option, however. For one, Jericho had no passport, and any attempt to get him one would put them both under scrutiny. For another, it was possible Hobart had alerted ports and airports to their existence. And third, even if they could travel, the carpet would be more difficult to transport. They'd almost certainly be obliged to let it out of their sight, 
and this Susanna was not willing to do. The argument went back and forth while they ate their pizza and drank their champagne, and the rain lashed against the window, and then the fluttering began in her lower belly that she'd come to recognize as an omen. She looked toward the door, and for a sickening moment she thought the menstruum had been too late with its warning, for she saw the door open, and there was Hobart staring straight at her. What is it? Jericho said. His words made her realize her error. The ghost she saw was more solid than she'd ever seen before, which probably meant the event it foreshadowed was imminent. Hobart, she said, and I don't think we've got much time. He made a pained face, but didn't question her authority on the matter. If she said Hobart was near, then near he was. She'd become the augurer, the witch, reading the air and always finding bad news. Moving was an elaborate business because of the carpet. At each stopping place they had to convince either the proprietor or the manager that the carpet came with them to their room. When they left, it had to be manhandled back into whichever vehicle they'd commandeered that day, all of which drew unwelcome attention. There was no alternative, however. Nobody had ever promised that heaven would be a light load to carry. 3. Less than thirty minutes later, Hobart pushed the door of the hotel suite open. The room was still warm with the woman's breath. But she and her nigger had gone. Again. How many times in the last months had he stood in their litter and breathed the same air she'd breathed, and seen the shape of her body left on the bed? But always too late. Always they were ahead of him, and away and all he was left with was another haunted room. There would be no restful nights for him, no, nor peaceful days, until she was caught and under his thumb. Her capture had become his obsession, and her punishment, too. He knew all too well that in this decadent age, when every perversion had its apologist, she would be eloquently defended once caught. That was why he came in search of her personally, he and his few, so that he might show her the true face of the law before the liberals came pleading. She would suffer for what she'd done to his heroes. She would cry out for mercy, and he would be strong and deaf to her pleas. He had an ally in this, of course, Shadwell. There was not one among his superiors in the force whom he trusted as he trusted that man. They were like twin souls. He took strength from that. And oddly, from the book, too, the book of codes that he'd taken from her. He'd had the volume studied minutely, the paper and the binding all analyzed for some hidden significance. None had been found, which left the words and the pictures. These two had been studied by experts. The stories were apparently quite straightforward fairy tales. The illustrations, like the text, also pretended innocence. But he wasn't fooled. The book meant something more than once upon a time. He didn't doubt that for an instant. When he finally had the woman to himself, he'd burn its meaning from her, and no faint heart would stop him. Four. They'd been more cautious after the near miss in Newcastle. Instead of visiting major cities where the police presence was substantial, they started to find smaller communities. That had its own disadvantages, of course. The arrival of two strangers and a carpet aroused curiosity and questions. But the change of tactics worked. Never staying in any place more than thirty-six hours and moving irrationally from town to town, village to village, the trail grew colder behind them. Days free of the hounds turned to weeks and weeks became months, and it was almost as if their pursuers had given up the chase. In that time Susanna's thoughts turned often to Cal. So much had happened since that day beside the Mersey, when he'd professed love to her. She'd often wondered how much of what he'd felt had been some unconscious knowledge of how the menstruum had touched him, entered him, and how much had been love as it was conventionally understood. Sometimes she longed to pick up the phone and speak to him. Indeed, on several occasions, she'd tried to do just that, was it paranoia that prevented her from speaking, or was there, as her instinct intimated, another presence on the line monitoring the call? On the fourth and fifth occasions, it wasn't even Cal who answered, but a woman who demanded to know who this was, and when Susanna remained silent, threatened to report her. She didn't call again. It simply wasn't worth the risk. Jericho had an opinion on the matter. Mooney's a cuckoo, he said when Cal's name came up in conversation. You should forget him. If you're a cuckoo, you're worth nothing, is that it? She said. What about me? You belong with us now, he said. You're seer kind. There's so much you don't know about me, she said. Years and years of just being an ordinary girl. You were never ordinary. Oh, yes, she said. Believe me, I was. Still am. Here. 
She tapped her forehead. Sometimes I wake up and I can't believe what's happened, happening to me. When I think of the way I was. It's no use to look back, said Jericho. No use thinking of what could have been. You don't do that anymore, do you? I've noticed. You don't even talk about the few. Jericho smiled. Why should I? he said. I'm happy as I am, with you. Maybe it'll be different tomorrow. Maybe it was different yesterday, I forget. But today, now, I'm happy. I even begin to like the kingdom. She remembered him lost in a crowd on Lord Street. How he'd changed. So what if you never saw the fugue again? He pondered this a moment. Who knows? Better not to think about it. It was an improbable romance. She, learning all the time from the power inside her, a new vision. He daily more seduced by the very world whose triviality she was seeing with clearer and clearer eyes. And with that comprehension, so unlike the simplification she'd been ruled by hitherto, she became even more certain that the carpet they carried was a last hope, while he, whose home the weave contained, seemed increasingly indifferent to its fate, living in the moment and for the moment, touched scarcely at all by hope or regret. He talked less and less of finding a safe place for the fugue to reside, more and more of something tantalizing he'd seen in the street or on the television. Often now, though he stayed with her and told her she could always rely upon him, she felt she was alone. Five. And somewhere behind her Hobart was also alone, even among his men or with Shadwell, alone, dreaming of her and the scent she left to mock him and of the brutalities he'd deliver upon her. In these dreams his hands would be flaming, as they'd been once before, and as she fought him the flames would lick up the walls of the room and crawl across the ceiling until the chamber was an oven, and he'd wake with his hands in front of his face, running not with fire but sweat, glad of the law to keep him from panic, and glad, too, that he was on the side of the angels. Chapter 5 Our Lady of the Bones 1. These were dark days for Shadwell. He had emerged from the fugue in high spirits, possessed of a new breadth of purpose, only to have the world he wished so much to rule snatched from beneath his nose. Not only that, but Immaculata, to whom he might have looked for assistance, had apparently elected to remain in the weave. She was, after all, one of the seer kind, even though they'd spurned her. Perhaps he shouldn't be so surprised that once back on soil she'd once pretended to. She'd been moved to remain there. He was not completely bereft of company. Norris, the Hamburger King, was still at his beck and call, still content with servitude. And, of course, there was Hobart. The inspector was probably insane, but that was all to the good. And he had one particular aspiration which Shadwell knew he might one day need to turn to his own ends. That was to lead, as Hobart put it, a righteous crusade. There was little use of a crusade, however, with nothing to mount it against. Five long months had passed, and with every day his desperation grew. Unlike others who'd stepped from the fugue that night, he remembered the experience in the finest detail. The jacket, charged with the raptures of the realm, kept the memories fresh. All too fresh. Scarcely an hour passed without his craving to be there. There was more to his hunger than simply the desire to possess the fugue. In these long weeks of waiting he'd come to a yet profounder ambition, if and when that soil was once more his to tread. He'd do what none of the seer kind had ever dared. He'd go into the gyre. This notion, once conceived, tormented his every waking moment. Penalties might have to be paid for such trespass. But would they not be worth the risk? Hidden behind that mask of cloud, the mantle, was a concentration of magic unequaled in the history of the seer kind, and therefore in the history of the world. Creation held court in the gyre. To walk there and see its secrets for himself. Would that not be a kind of godhood? 2. And today he had the setting to match the tenor of these thoughts. This small church dedicated to St. Philomena and St. Calixtus, hidden away in the concrete wasteland of the city of London. He had not come here for the good of his soul. He had been invited here by the priest who was presently conducting the lunchtime mass for a handful of office workers. A man he'd never met who had written saying he had important news. New Shadwell could profit by. The salesman had come without hesitation. Shadwell had been brought up a Catholic, and, though he'd long neglected his faith, there was no forgetting the rituals he'd learned as a child. He listened to the Sanctus, his lips running with the rhythm of the words, 
though it was twenty years since he'd attended them. Then the Eucharistic prayer, something short and sweet so as not to keep the accountants from their calculations, and on to the consecration. Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body which will be given up for you. Old words, old rituals, but they still made sound commercial sense. Talk of power and might would always attract an audience. Lords never went out of fashion. Lost in thought, he wasn't even aware that the Mass had ended until the priest appeared at his side. Mr. Shatwell? He looked up from his calfskin gloves. The church was empty but for the two of them. We've been waiting for you, said the priest, not waiting for confirmation that he had the right man. You're most welcome. Shadwell got to his feet. What's this about? Perhaps you'll come with me, came the response. Shadwell saw no reason not to comply. The priest led him across the nave and into a wood-paneled room which smelled like a brothel. Sweat and perfume mingled. At the far end of the room there was a curtain which he drew aside and another door. Before turning the key, he said, You must stay close by me, Mr. Shadwell, and not approach the shrine. The shrine? For the first time since coming here, Shadwell had an inkling of what was going on. I understand, he said. The priest opened the door. There was a steep flight of stone steps before them, lit only by the meager light shed from the room they were leaving. He lost count of the steps after thirty. They were descending in almost total darkness after the first ten, and he kept his hand stretched to the wall, which was dry and chilly, in order to keep his balance. But now below, a light. The priest glanced over his shoulder, his face a pale ball in the murk. Stay by me, he cautioned. It's dangerous. At the bottom the priest took hold of his arm, as though not trusting Shadwell to obey his instructions. They had arrived in the center of a labyrinth, it seemed. Galleries ran off in all directions, twisting and turning unpredictably. In some, candles burned. Others were in darkness. It was only as the guide led him down one of these corridors that Shadwell realized they were not alone here. The walls were lined with niches, each of which contained a coffin. He shuddered. The dead were on every side. It was their dust that he could taste on his tongue. There was only one person he knew who would willingly keep such company. Even as he formed this thought, the priest's hand dropped from his arm and the man withdrew down the passageway at some speed, murmuring a prayer as he went. The reason? A veiled figure dressed from head to foot in black, approaching him down the tunnel, like a mourner who'd lost her way among the caskets. She did not have to speak or raise her veil for Shadwell to know that it was Immaculata. She stood a little way from him, saying nothing. Her breath shook the folds of her veil. Then she said, Shadwell. Her voice was slurred, even labored. I thought you'd stayed in the weave, he said. I was almost detained there, she replied. Detained? Behind him, Shadwell heard the priest's feet on the stairs as he made his exit. Friends of yours? he asked. They worship me, she told him. Call me goddess, mother of the night. They emasculate themselves in order to better show their adulation. Shadwell grimaced. That's why you're not allowed in the vicinity of the shrine. They consider it desecration. If their goddess hadn't spoken, they would not have let you this far. Why do you put up with them? They gave me a hiding place when I needed one. Somewhere to heal. Heal what? At this the veil slowly lifted, untouched by a macalata. The sight beneath was enough to make Shadwell's gorge rise. Her once exquisite features were wounded beyond recognition, a mass of raw tissue and seeping scars. How? he managed to say. The custodian's husband, she replied, her mouth so twisted out of true it was difficult for her to form words properly. He did that? He came with lions, she said. And I was careless. Shadwell didn't want to hear any more. It offends you, she said. You're a man of sensibility. This last word was pronounced with the subtlest irony. You can mask it, can't you? He said, thinking of her skills with disguise. If she could imitate others, why not copy her perfect self? Would you have me a whore? She said to him. Painting myself for vanity? No, Shadwell. I'll wear my wounds. They're more myself than beauty ever was. She made a terrible smile. Don't you think? Despite her defiance, her voice trembled. She was pliable, he sensed, despairing even. 
fearing insanity might claim her again. I've missed your company, he said, attempting to look steadily at her face. We worked well together. You've got new allies now, she replied. You heard? My sisters had been with you now and then. The thought did not comfort him. Do you trust Hobart? He serves his purpose. Which is? To find the carpet. Which he hasn't done. No, not yet. He tried to stare straight at her, tried to give her a loving look. I miss you, he said. I need your help. Her palate made a soft hissing sound, but she didn't reply. Isn't that why you brought me here, he said, so that we could begin again? No, she replied. I'm too weary for that. Hungry as he was to walk in a fugue once again, the thought of picking up the chase where they'd left it, moving from city to city whenever the wind carried a rumor of the weave, did not enthrall him either. Besides, she said, you've changed. No, he protested. I still want the weave. But not to sell it, she said, to rule it. Where did you get that notion from? He protested, offering an ingenuous smile. He could not read the ruin before him well enough to know whether his pretense worked. We had a pact, goddess, he said. We were going to bring them into the dust. And you want that still? He hesitated, knowing that he risked everything with a lie. She knew him well. She could probably see into his skull if she chose to. He might lose more than her company if she sensed deceit in him. But then she was changed, wasn't she? She came before him as spoiled goods. Her beauty, the one ungovernable power she had always had over him, was gone. She was the supplicant here, though she was trying to pretend otherwise. He risked the lie. What I want is what I've always wanted he said. Your enemies are my enemies. Then we'll lay them low, she said, once and for all. Somewhere in the maze of her face a light ignited, and the human dust on the shelves at his side began to dance. Chapter 6 The Brittle Machine 1. On the morning of the 2nd of February, Cal found Brandon dead in bed. He had died, the doctor reported, an hour before dawn simply given up and slipped away in his sleep. His mental processes had begun to deteriorate rapidly about a week before Christmas. On some days he'd call Geraldine by his wife's name and take Cal for his brother. The prognosis had not been good, but nobody had expected this sudden exit. No opportunity for explanations or fond farewells. One day he was here. The next he could only be mourned. Much as Cal had loved Brendan, he found grief difficult. It was Geraldine who wept. Geraldine, who had all the proper sentiments to hand out when the neighbors came to offer their condolences. Cal could only play the part of the grieving child, not feel it. All he felt was ill at ease. That feeling grew stronger as the cremation approached. He was increasingly detached from himself, viewing his absence of emotion with a disbelieving eye. It seemed suddenly there were two cows, one the public mourner dealing with the business of death as propriety demanded, the other a coruscating critic of the first calling a bluff of every cliché and empty gesture. It was Mad Mooney's voice this second, the scourge of liars and hypocrites. You're not real at all, the poet would whisper. Look at you, sham that you are. This dislocation brought strange side effects, most significantly the dreams that now returned to him. He dreamed himself floating in air as clear as love's eyes, dreamed trees heavy with golden fruit, dreamed animals that spoke like people and people who roared. He dreamed of the pigeons, too, several times a night, and on more than one occasion he woke certain that thirty-three and his mate had spoken to him in their bird way, though he could make no sense of their advice. The idea was still with him by day, and, though he knew the notion was laughable, he found himself quizzing the birds as he fed them their daily bread, asking them, half in jest, to give up what they knew. They just winked their eyes and grew fat. The funeral came and went. Eileen's relatives came across from Tyneside, and Brendan's from Belfast. There was whiskey, and Guinness for Brendan's brothers, and ham sandwiches with the crusts cut off. And when the glasses and the plates were empty, they all went home. Two. We should have a holiday, Geraldine suggested, a week after the funeral. You haven't been sleeping well. He was sitting at the dining room window, watching the garden. We need to do some work on the house, he said. It's depressing me. 
We can always sell it, she replied. It was a simple solution, and one his torpid mind hadn't conceived of. That's a bloody good idea, he said. Find somewhere without a railway at the bottom of the garden. They started searching for another house immediately before the better weather inflated prices. Geraldine was in her element, leading him around the properties with a seamless outpouring of observations and ideas. They found a modest terraced house in Wavertree, which they both liked, and put an offer in for it which was accepted. But the Chariot Street house proved more difficult to move. Two purchasers came to the brink of signing contracts, then withdrew. Even Geraldine's high spirits lost buoyancy as the weeks drew on. They lost the Wavertree house at the beginning of March, and were obliged to begin the search over again. But their enthusiasm was much depleted, and they found nothing they liked. And still in dreams the bird spoke. And still he couldn't interpret their wisdom. Chapter 7 Tales of Spook City 1. Five weeks after Brendan's remains had been scattered on the lawn of remembrance, Cal opened the door to a man with a wry, ruddy face. Sparse hair brushed ear to ear to shelter his pate, and the stub of a hefty cigar between his fingers. "'Mr. Mooney?' he said, and without waiting for confirmation went on. "'You don't know me. My name's Gluck.' Transferring his cigar from right to left, he gripped Cal's and shook it vigorously. "'Anthony Gluck,' he said. The man's face was vaguely familiar. From where, Cal racked his brain to remember. "'I wonder,' Gluck said, "'if I may have a word with you.' "'I vote Labour.' said Cal. I'm not canvassing. I'm interested in the house. Oh, said Cal, beaming. Then come on in. And he led Gluck through into the dining room. The man was at the window in an instant, peering into the garden. Ah, he said. So this is it. It's chaos at the moment, said Cal, with faint apology. You left it untouched, said Gluck. Untouched? Since the events in Chariot Street. Do you really want to buy the house? said Cal. Buy, said Gluck. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I didn't even realize it was for sale. You said you were interested. So I am. But not to buy. No, I'm interested in the place because it was the center of the disturbances last August. Am I right? Cal had only a patchwork memory of the events of that day. Certainly he remembered the freak whirlwind that had done so much damage in Chariot Street. He remembered the interview with Hobart quite clearly, too, and how it had prevented his meeting with Susanna. But there was much else. The rake, the death of Lilia, indeed, everything that sprang from the matter of the fugue, that his mind had eclipsed. Luck's enthusiasm intrigued him, however. That was no natural event, he said. Not by a long chalk. It was a perfect example of what we in the business call anomalous phenomena. Business? You know what some people are calling Liverpool these days? No. Spook City. Spook City. And with good reason, believe me. What did you mean when you said business? In essence, it's very simple. I document events that defy explanation, events that fall outside the comprehension of the scientific community, which people therefore choose not to see. Anomalous phenomena. This has always been a windy city, Cal pointed out. Believe me, said Gluck, there was more to what happened here last summer than a high wind. There was a house on the other side of the river simply reduced to rubble overnight. There were mass hallucinations that took place in broad daylight. There were lights in the sky, brilliant lights, witnessed by hundreds of people. All that and more happened in the vicinity of this city, over a two- or three-day time period. Does that sound like coincidence to you? No. If you're sure it all... all happened? Oh, it all happened, Mr. Mooney. I've been collecting this kind of material for twenty years and more, collecting and collating it. And there are patterns in these phenomena. They don't just happen here, then? Good God, no. I get reports sent to me from all over Europe. After a while, you begin to see some kind of picture emerge. As Gluck spoke, Cal remembered where he'd seen the man before. On a television program, talking, if he remembered rightly, about governmental silence on visits from alien ambassadors. What happened in Chariot Street, he was saying, and all over this city is part of a pattern which is perfectly apparent to those of us who study these things. What does it mean? It means we're watched, Mr. Mooney. We're scrutinized the live-long day. Who by? Creatures from another world with a technology which beggars our own. I've only seen fragments of their artifacts left behind by careless voyagers, but they're enough to prove we're less to them than household pets. Really? 
I recognize that look, Mr. Mooney, said Gluck without irritation. You're humoring me, but I've seen the evidence with my own eyes, especially in this past year. Either they're getting more careless, or they simply don't mind if we're wise to them any longer. Which means what? That their plans for us are entering some final phase, that their installations on our planet are in place, and we'll be defeated before we begin. They mean to invade us. You may scoff. I'm not scoffing. Really, I'm not. I can't say it's easy to believe, but... He thought for the first time in many months of Mad Mooney. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Well, said Gluck, his fierce expression mellowing, that makes a refreshing change. I'm usually thought of as comic relief. But let me tell you, I'm scrupulous in my researches. I believe it. I've no need to massage the truth, he said proudly. It's quite convincing enough as it is. He talked on of his recent investigations and what they'd turned up. Britain, it seemed, was alive from end to end with events prodigious and bizarre. Had Cal heard he inquired of the rain of deep-sea fish that had fallen on Halifax? Or the village in Wiltshire that boasted its own Borealis? Or the three-year-old in Blackpool whose grasp of hieroglyphics had been picture-perfect since birth? All true stories, he claimed, all verifiable. And they were the least of it. The island seemed to be ankle-deep in miracles to which most of its inhabitants turned a blind eye. The truth's in front of our noses, said Gluck. If we could only see it. The visitors are here. In England. It was an attractive notion, an apocalypse of fishes and wise children, to turn England inside out, and nonsensical as the facts appeared, Gluck's conviction was powerfully persuasive. But there was something wrong with his thesis. Cal couldn't work out what, and he certainly wasn't in any position to argue the point. But his gut told him that somewhere along the road Gluck had taken a wrong turning. What was so unsettling was the process this fabulous litany had begun in his head a scrabbling for some fact he'd once possessed and now forgotten, just beyond his fingertips. Of course there's been an official cover-up, Gluck was saying, here in Spook City. Cover-up? Certainly. It wasn't just houses that disappeared. People went too. Lord here, at least that's what my information suggests. Moneyed people, people with important friends, who came here and never left, or at least not of their own accord. Extraordinary. Oh, I could tell you tales that would make the disappearance of a plutocrat seem small beer. Gluck rekindled his cigar, which had died each time he'd taken off on some fresh tack. He puffed on it until he was veiled in smoke. But we know so little, he said. That's why I keep searching, keep asking. I would have been on your doorstep a lot earlier, but that things have been so hectic. I don't think there's much I can tell you, said Cal. That whole period's sort of vague. Yes, said Gluck. It would be. I've had this happen repeatedly. Witnesses simply forgetting. I believe it's something our friends, he pointed the wet end of his cigar skyward, are able to induce this forgetfulness. Was there anybody else in the house that day? My father, I think. He couldn't even be perfectly certain of that. Might I have a word with him? He's dead. He died last month. Oh, my condolences. Was it sudden? Yes. You were selling the house, then, leaving Liverpool to its own devices? Cal shrugged. I don't think so, he said. Gluck peered at him out of the smoke. I just can't seem to make up my mind about much these days, Cal confessed. It's like I'm living in a dream. You never spoke a truer word, said a voice at the back of his head. I understand, said Gluck. Truly I do. He unbuttoned his jacket and opened it. Cal's heartbeat unaccountably quickened, but all the man was doing was fishing in his inside pocket for his visiting card. Here, he said. Please, take it. A. V. Gluck, the card announced, and below the Birmingham address a phrase in red ink. What is now proved was once only imagined. Who's the quote from? William Blake, said Gluck. The marriage of heaven and hell. Would you keep the card? If anything should occur to you, anything anomalous, I'd like to hear from you. I'll keep it in mind, Cal said. He looked at the card again. What does V stand for? he asked. Virgil, Gluck confided. Well, he said, everybody should have some little secret, don't you think? 2. Cal kept the card more as a keepsake of the encounter than in the expectation of using it. 
He'd enjoyed the man's company in its offbeat way, but it was probably a performance best enjoyed once only. Twice might stale its eccentric charm. When Geraldine got back, he began to tell her about the visit, then thought better of it and diverted the conversation to another subject entirely. He knew she'd laugh at his giving the fellow a minute of his attention, and outlandish as Gluck and his theories were, he didn't want to hear the man mocked, however gently. Maybe the man had taken the wrong turning, but at least he'd traveled some extraordinary roads. Though Cal could no longer remember why, he had the suspicion that they had that in common. Part 7. The Demagogue All rising to great place is by a winding stair. Sir Francis Bacon. Essays. Chapter 1. The Messenger. 1. Spring was late that year, the March days murky, the nights frostbitten. It sometimes seemed winter would never end, that the world would go on like this, gray upon gray, until entropy claimed its little life entirely. The weeks brought bad times for Susanna and Jericho. It wasn't Hobart that caused them. Indeed, she even got to thinking that a reminder of their jeopardy might usefully shake them from their complacency. But while she suffered from lethargy and ennui, Jericho's response to these weeks was in its way far more alarming. The pleasure he took in the inconsequentia of the kingdom, which had been a source of amusement to them both, now took on the quality of an obsession. He lost entirely his capacity for stillness, which had initially drawn her to him. Now he was full of spurious energy, spouting advertising catchphrases and jingles he soaked up. Babu, that he was, like a sponge, his talk an imitation of the flipness of television detectives and game show hosts. They argued often, sometimes bitterly. He'd more often than not walk out in the middle of such exchanges, as if anger were not worth his sweat, only to return with some booty, usually drink, which he'd consume in sullen solitude if he couldn't get Susanna to join him. She tried to satisfy his restlessness by keeping them on the move, but it only exacerbated the disease. Privately she began to despair as she pictured history repeating itself two generations on, with her cast in Mimi's role. And then, not a moment too soon, the weather began to improve, and her spirits started to rise. She even dared entertain the hope that the chase had actually stopped, their pursuers given up and gone home. In a month or so, perhaps, they could with some confidence go in search of a haven to begin the unweaving again. But then came the glad tidings. 2. They were in a small town outside Coventry, rejoicing in the name of Fatherless Barn, as good a reason as any to be there. The day being bright and the sun almost warm, they'd decided to risk leaving the carpet in storage at the boarding house they'd found, and take the air together. Jericho had just emerged from a confectioner's, his pockets full of white chocolate, his current passion, when somebody brushed past Susanna, saying, Left and left, then hurried on without looking back. Jericho had heard the words, too, and he instantly followed both stranger and instructions. She called after him, but he wasn't about to be waylaid. He turned left at the first intersection. Susanna went in pursuit, cursing his indiscretion, which had already drawn some attention. Left and left again brought her into the narrowest of streets, where the sun surely seldom came. There Jericho was embracing the stranger like a long-lost brother. It was Nimrod. 3. You were so difficult to find, he said when they returned to the seclusion of the boarding house, taking a dog's leg so that Jericho could steal a bottle of celebratory champagne. I almost caught up with you in Hull, then lost you. But somebody remembered you at your hotel. Said you'd got drunk, Jericho, is that right? And been helped to bed. Could be, said Jericho. Anyhow, here I am, and with great news. What? said Susanna. We're going back home. Very soon. How do you know? Capra says so. Capra? said Jericho. It was enough to make him neglect his glass. How can that be? The prophet says so. It's all planned. Capra speaks to him. Wait, wait, said Susanna. What prophet? He says we have to spread the word, said Nimrod, his enthusiasm boundless. Find the ones who left the weave, and tell them liberation's at hand. I've been all over doing just that. It was by chance I got wind of you. What luck, eh? Nobody knew where you were. And that was the way it was meant to stay, said Susanna. I was to make contact in my time, when I judged the trail had grown cold. It is cold, said Nimrod, stone cold. 
Surely you must have noticed that. Susanna kept her silence. Our enemies have given up the chase, he went on. The prophet knows that. He tells us what Capra says, and Capra says our suppression is at an end. Who is this prophet? said Susanna. Nimrod's excited flow ceased. He frowned as he stared at her. The prophet is the prophet, he said. No further explanation was necessary, it seemed. You don't even know his name, she said. He lived near the gyre, said Nimrod. That much I do know. A hermit he was until the weaving. That night, last summer, Capra called him. He left the weave to begin his teachings. The tyranny of the cuckoos is nearly at an end. I'll believe that when I see it, said Susanna. You will, said Nimrod, with the unshakable fervor of a true convert. This time the earth will rise with us. That's what people are saying. The cuckoos have made too much mischief. They are ages over. Sounds like wish fulfillment to me. You may doubt, said Nimrod. I do. But I've seen the prophet. I've heard his words. And they come from Capra. His eyes glittered with evangelical glee. I was in the gutter when the prophet found me, broken in pieces, prey to every cuckoo sickness. Then I heard the prophet's voice and went to him. Now look at me. Susanna had argued with zealots before. Her brother had been born again at twenty-three and given his life to Christ. She knew from experience there was no gainsaying the bigotry of faith. Indeed, there was part of her wanted to join the happy throng of believers Nimrod described. Throw off the burden of the carpet and let the fugue begin its life afresh. She was weary of being afraid to meet anybody's eye, of forever passing through. Any pleasure she might have taken in being an outsider, possessed of a wonderful secret, had long since soured. Now she wanted to have her fingers in clay again, or sit flirting with friends. But tempting as it was, she couldn't accept this cant and be silent. It stank. How do you know he doesn't mean us all harm? she said. Harm? What harm is there in being free? You have to give the weave back, Susanna. I'll take you to him. He snatched hold of her hand as he spoke, as if he was prepared to do it now. She pulled her fingers from his grip. What's the problem? he said. I'm not going to give the carpet up just because you heard the word, she said fiercely. You must, he said, as much disbelief as anger in his tone. When does this prophet speak again? said Jericho. The day after tomorrow, Nimrod replied, his eyes still on Susanna. The chase is over, he said to her. You must give the carpet back. And if I don't, he'll come and get it, she said. Is that the implication? You cuckoos. Nimrod sighed, always making things so damn difficult. He's come to give us Capra's wisdom. Why can't you see that? He halted a moment. When he spoke again, he'd modulated his strident tone. I respect your doubts, he said, but you must understand the situation's changed. I think we should see this prophet for ourselves, said Jericho. He cast a glance at Susanna. Yes? She nodded. Yes. Nimrod grinned. Yes, he'll make everything clear to you. She longed for that promise to be made true. The day after tomorrow, said Nimrod, there'll be an end to chases. Chapter 2 Seeing the Light 1. That night, with Nimrod gone and Jericho sleeping off his champagne, she did something she'd never done before. She evoked the menstruum simply for company. It had shown her many sights in recent weeks, and it had saved her from Hobart and his malice, but she was still suspicious of its power. She still couldn't quite work out whether she controlled it or vice versa. Tonight, however, she decided that that was a cuckoo's way of thinking, always making divisions, the viewer from the viewed, the peach from the taste it left on the tongue. Such compartments were useful only as tools. At some point they had to be left behind. For better or worse, she was the menstruum, and the menstruum was her. She and it, indivisible. Bathing in its silver light, her thoughts turned again to Mimi, who'd lived a life of waiting, her years growing dusty while she hoped for a miracle that was too late in coming. Thinking of that, she began to cry quietly. Not quietly enough, for she woke Jericho. She heard his footsteps outside, then his tapping on the bathroom door. Lady, he said. It was the name he only used when there was an apology in the air. I'm all right, she said. She had neglected to lock the door, and he pushed it open. 
He was dressed only in the long vest he always slept in. Seeing her misery, his face dropped. Why so sad? he asked. It's all wrong, were the only words she could find to express her confusion. Jericho's eyes had found the dregs of the menstruum, which moved across the floor between them, their brightness flickering out as they left her immediate vicinity. He kept a respectful distance. I'll go to the meeting place with Nimrod, he said. You stay with the weave, yes? Suppose they demand it. Then we'll have to decide, he said. But we shall see this prophet first. He could be a charlatan. He paused, not looking at her, but at the empty floor between them. A lot of us are, he said after a moment. Me, for instance. She stared at him as he loitered in the doorway. It wasn't the dying glamour of the menstruum that kept him at bay, she now realized. She spoke his name very quietly. Not you, she said. Oh, yes, he replied. There was another aching silence. Then he said, I'm sorry, lady. There's nothing to be sorry for. I failed you, he said. I wanted to be so much to you, and look how I failed. She stood up and went to him. His misery was so heavy he could not raise his head beneath its weight. She took hold of his hand and held it tight. I couldn't have survived these months without you, she said. You've been my dearest friend. Friend, he said, his voice small. I never wanted to be your friend. She felt his hand tremble in hers, and the sensation brought back their adventure on Lord Street, when she'd held him in the crowd and shared his visions, his terrors. Since then they'd shared a bed as well, and it had been pleasurable but little more. She'd been too obsessed with the beasts on their heels to think of much else, both too close and too distant from him to see how he suffered. She saw it now when it frightened her. I love you, lady, he murmured, his throat almost swallowing the words before they were said. Then he extricated his hand from hers and retreated from her. She went after him. The room was dark, but there was sufficient illumination to etch his anxious face, his jittering limbs. I didn't understand, she said, and reached out to touch his face. Not since the first night they'd met had she thought of him as unhuman. His hunger to soak up the trivialities of the kingdom had further obscured that fact. Now she remembered it, saw before her another species, another history. The thought made her heart pound. He sensed, or saw, the arousal in her, and his earlier hesitancy evaporated. He took a half-step toward her until his tongue could run along her lips. She opened her mouth to taste him, embracing him as she did so. The mystery embraced her in return. Their previous coupling had been comforting but unremarkable. Now, as though released by the statement of his love, he took a new lead, undressing her almost ritualistically kissing her over and over and between the kisses, whispering words in a language he must have known she couldn't understand, but which he spoke in a voice of infinite dexterity, so that uncomprehending she understood. It was his love he spoke, erotic rhymes and promises, words that were the shape of his desire. His phallus, a word, his semen, a word, her cunt which he poured his poems into a dozen words and more. She closed her eyes and felt his recital consuming her. She answered him in her way, sighs and nonsenses that found their place in the swell of his magic. When her eyes flickered open again she found the exchange had ignited the very air about them, their words, and the feelings they conveyed, writing a lexicon of light that flattered their nakedness. It was as if the room was suddenly filled with lanterns made of smoke and paper. They drifted up on the heat of their maker's bodies, their lights bringing every part of the room to exquisite life. She saw the tightly curled hairs he'd shed on the pillow, describing their own alphabet, saw the simple weave of the sheet extolled, saw everywhere a subtle intercourse of form with form, the walls congress with the space they contained, the curtain's passion for the window, the chair for the coat that lay upon it and the shoes beneath. But mostly she saw him, and he was a wonder, she cut the minute fluctuations of his iris when his gaze moved from the darkness of her hair to the pillow upon which it was spread, saw the pulse of his heart in the corrugation of his lips, and at his throat. The skin of his chest had an almost eerie smoothness to it, but was deeply muscled. His arms were sinewy, and would not countenance unbinding her a moment, but held her as tight as she held him. There was no show of machismo in this possessiveness, 
only an urgency which she more than equaled. Outside, darkness was upon the hemisphere, but they were bright, and though he had no breath for words now, their tenderness fueled the lights that cradled them, and they didn't dim, but echoed the lovers, marrying color to color, light to light, until the room blazed. They loved and slept and loved again, and the words kept vigil around them, mellowing their show to a soothing flicker as sleep came a second time. When she woke the next morning, and opened the curtains on another anxious day, she remembered the previous night as a vision of pure spirit. Two. I was beginning to forget, lady, he said that day. You kept what you were doing clear in your head, but I was letting it slip. The kingdom is so strong, it can take your mind away. You wouldn't have forgotten, she said. He touched her face, ran his fingertip down the rim of her ear. Not you. Later, he said, I wish you could come with me to see the prophet. I do, too, but it's not wise. I know. I'll be here, Jericho. That'll make me quick. Chapter 3 Charisma Nimrod was waiting for him at the rendezvous they'd arranged two days before. It seemed to Jericho his fervor had intensified in the intervening time. It's going to be the biggest meeting so far, he said. Our numbers are growing all the time. The day's at hand, Jericho. Our people are ready and waiting. I'll believe it when I see it. See it he did. As evening fell, Nimrod took him by an elaborate route to a vast ruin of a building, far from any sign of human habitation. The place had been a foundry in its prime, but its heroic scale had doomed it when times got leaner. Now its walls would supposedly see the kindling of another heat entirely. As they drew closer, it became apparent that there were lights burning in the interior, but there was no sound or sign of the immense gathering Nimrod had promised. A few solitary figures lurked among the rubble of service buildings. Otherwise, the place seemed to be deserted. Once through the door, however, Jericho faced the first shock of a night that would bring many. The vast building was filled to capacity with hundreds of the kind. He saw members of every route, Babu and Yimi, Lo and Aya. He saw old men and women. He saw babes in arms. Some he knew had been in the weave at the beginning and had apparently elected the previous summer to try their luck in the kingdom. Others he guessed were descendants of those who'd rejected the weave at the outset. They had a look about them that marked them out as strangers to their homeland. Many of them stood quite separately from their fellow devotees, as if nervous of rejection. It was disorienting to see physiognomies that carried the subtle signature of his fellow Sirkind primped and painted a la mode. Sirkind dressed in jeans and leather jackets in print dresses and high heels. To judge by their condition, many of them had survived well enough in the kingdom, perhaps even prospered, yet they were here. A whisper of liberation had found them in their hiding places among the cuckoos, and they'd come, bringing their children and their prayers, kind who could only know of the fugue from rumor and hearsay, drawn by the hope of seeing a place their hearts had never forgotten. Despite his initial cynicism, he could not help but be moved by this silent and expectant multitude. I told you. Nimrod whispered as he led Jericho through the throng. We'll get as close as we can, eh? At the end of the vast hall, a rostrum had been set up, littered with flowers. Lights hovered in the air, babu raptures, throwing a flickering luminescence on the stage beneath. He'll come soon, said Nimrod. Jericho didn't doubt it. Even now, there was some movement at the far end of the hall. Several figures, dressed in the same dark blue, were ordering the crowd a few yards back from the vicinity of the rostrum. The devotees obeyed the instruction without question. Who are they? asked Jericho, nodding toward the uniformed figures. The prophet's elite, Nimrod returned. They're with him night and day, to keep him from harm. Jericho had no time to ask any further questions. A door was opening in the bare brick wall at the back of the platform, a tremor of excitement passing through the hall. The congregation started to surge toward the platform. The swell of emotion was contagious. Try as he might to keep his critical faculties sharp, Jericho found his heart pounding with excitement. One of the elite had appeared through the open door, carrying a plain wooden chair. This he set at the front of the platform. The crowd was pressing at Jericho's back. He was hemmed in to right and left. Every face but his was turned toward the stage. Some had tears on their cheeks. The tension of waiting had been too much. Others were speaking silent prayers. And now... Two more elites stepped through the door, parting to reveal a figure in pale yellow. 
the sight of whom brought a tide of sound from the crowd. It was not the jubilant shout of welcome Jericho had been anticipating, but an intensification of the murmur that had begun a while earlier, a soft, yearning sound that stirred the gut. Above the platform, the floating flames became brighter. The murmur grew in depth and resonance. Jericho had to make a fierce effort not to join in. The lights had reached a white heat, but the prophet did not step forward and bathe in this blaze of glory. He hung back at the edge of the pool, teasing the crowd, which begged him with their moans to show himself. Still he resisted. Still they summoned him, their wordless prayers growing feverish. Only after three or four minutes of this holding back did he consent to answer their appeal and step into the light. He was a sizable man, a fellow Babu, Jericho guessed, but some infirmity slowed his footsteps. His features were benign, even slightly effeminate. His hair, fine as a baby's, was a white mane. Reaching the chair, he sat down, apparently with some pain, and surveyed the gathering. Little by little the murmuring grew softer. He did not speak, however, until it had ceased entirely. And when he did speak, it was not with the voice Jericho had expected from a prophet, strident, possessed. It was a small musical voice, its tone gentle, even hesitant. My friends, he said, we are assembled here in the name of Capra. Capra. The name was whispered from wall to wall. I've heard Capra's words. They say the time is very, very close. He spoke, Jericho thought, almost reluctantly, as though he were the vessel of this knowledge, but far from comfortable with it. If there are any doubters among you, the prophet said, prepare to shed your doubts. Nimrod cast Jericho a glance as if to say, He means you. We are greater by the day, the prophet said. Capra's word is everywhere finding its way to the forgotten and the forgetful. It stirs the sleeping into wakefulness. It makes the dying dance. He spoke very quietly, letting the rhetoric substitute for volume. His congregation attended like children. Very soon we'll be home, he said. We'll be back among our loved ones, walking where our mothers and fathers walked. We won't have to hide any longer. This, Capra tells us. We will rise, my friends. Rise and be bright. There were barely stifled sobs from around the hall. He heard them and hushed them with an indulgent smile. No need to weep, he said. I see an end to weeping. An end to waiting. Yes, said the crowd as one. Yes, yes. Jericho felt the swell of affirmation picking him up. He had no desire to resist. He was a part of these people, wasn't he? Their tragedy was his tragedy, and their longing his, too. Yes, he found himself saying. Yes, yes. At his side, Nimrod said, Now do you believe? Then joined the chant himself. The prophet raised his gloved hands to subdue the voices. It took longer for the crowd to be hushed this time. But when the prophet spoke again, his voice was stronger, as though nourished by this display of fellow feeling. My friends... Capra loves peace as we all love it. But let us not deceive ourselves. We have enemies. Enemies among humankind, and yes, among our own kind, too. There are many who have cheated us, conspired with the cuckoos to keep our lands in sleep. This Capra has seen with his own eyes. Treachery and lies, my friends, everywhere. He bowed his head a moment as if the effort of these words was close to defeating him. What shall we do? he said, his voice despairing. Lead us, somebody shouted. The prophet raised his head at this, his face troubled. I can only show you the way, he protested. But the cry had been taken up by others around the hall, and was growing. Lead us, they called to him. Lead us. Slowly the prophet got to his feet. Again he raised his hands to silence the congregation, but this time they would not be subdued so readily. Please! he said, obliged for the first time to raise his voice. Please, listen to me. We'll follow you, Nimrod was shouting. We'll follow. Was it Jericho's imagination, or had the lights above the platform begun to burn with fresh brilliance, the prophet's hair a halo above his benevolent features? To judge by his expression, the call to arms that rose from the floor distressed him. The vox populi wanted more than his vague promises. Listen to me, he appealed. 
If you want me to lead you. Yes, roared five hundred throats. If that's what you want, I have to warn you. It will not be easy. We would have to put away tenderness. We would have to be hard as stone. Blood will flow. His warning didn't chasten the crowd a jot. If anything, it spurred their enthusiasm to new heights. We must be cunning, said the prophet, as those who've conspired against us have been cunning. The crowd was raising the roof now, Jericho along with them. The fugue calls us home. Home! Home! And its voice will not be denied. We must march. The door at the back of the platform had been opened a little, presumably so that the prophet's entourage could hear the speech. Now a movement there caught Jericho's eye. There was somebody in the doorway whose shadowy face he seemed to know. We will go into the fugue together, the prophet was saying, his voice finally losing its frailty, its reluctance. Jericho looked past the speaker, trying to divide the watcher at the door from the darkness that concealed him. We will take the fugue back from our enemies in the name of Capra. The man Jericho was watching moved his step, and for an instant a fugitive beam of light caught him. Jericho's stomach convulsed as he silently put a name to the face he saw. It bore a smile, but he knew there was no humor in it, for its owner knew no humor. Or love either. Or mercy. Shout, my kind! Shout! It was Hobart. Make them hear us in their sleep. Hear us and fear our judgment. There could be no doubt of it. The time Jericho had spent in the inspector's company was burned into his memory forever. Hobart it was. The voice of the prophet was finding new strength with every syllable. Even his face seemed to have altered in some subtle fashion. Any sham of kindliness had been dropped. It was all righteous fury now. Spread the word, he was saying. The exiles are returning. Jericho watched the performance with fresh eyes, keeping up a pretense of enthusiasm, while questions fretted his thumping head. Chief among them. Who was this man stirring the kind with promises of deliverance? A hermit, as Nimrod had described him, an innocent being used by Hobart for his own ends. That was the best hope. The worst, that he and Hobart were in cahoots. A conspiracy of kind and humankind, created with what could only be one intention, possessing and perhaps destroying the fugue. The voices around him were deafening, but Jericho was no longer buoyed up by this tide. He was drowning in it. They were fodder, these people, Hobart's dupes. It made him sick to think of it. Be ready, the prophet was telling the assembly. Be ready. The hour is near. With that promise, the lights above the platform went out. When they came on again moments later, the voice of Capra had gone, leaving an empty chair and a congregation ready to follow him wherever he chose to lead them. There were cries from around the hall for him to speak to them again, but the door at the back of the stage was closed and not reopened. Gradually, realizing they wouldn't persuade their leader to appear again, the crowd began to disperse. Didn't I tell you? said Nimrod. He stank of sweat, as did they all. Didn't I say? Yes, you did. Nimrod seized hold of Jericho's arm. Come with me now, he said, eyes gleaming. We'll go to the prophet. We'll tell him where the carpet is. Now? Why not? Why give our enemies any more time to prepare themselves? Jericho had vaguely anticipated this exchange. He had his excuses prepared. Susanna must be persuaded of the wisdom of this, he said. I can best do that. She trusts me. Then I'll come with you. No, I'll do it alone. Nimrod looked wary, perhaps even suspicious. I watched over you once, Jericho reminded him, when you were a babe in arms. This was his ace card. Remember that? Nimrod couldn't keep a smile from his face. Such times, he said. You're going to have to trust me the way you trusted me then, Jericho said. He didn't much like the deception, but this was no time for ethical niceties. Let me go to Susanna, and together we'll bring the carpet here. Then we can all go to the Prophet, the three of us. Yes, said Nimrod. I suppose there's sense in that. They walked to the door together. The throng of devotees was already dispersing into the night. Jericho made his farewells and his promises to Nimrod and headed away. When he'd gained sufficient cover of distance and darkness, he made a long arc around the building and headed back toward it. Chapter 4 As Good Men Go It began to rain while he kept watch at the rear of the foundry. 
but after twenty minutes his waiting was rewarded. A door opened, and two of the Prophet's elite guard emerged. So eager were they for the shelter of their car, there were several parked behind the building, that they left the door behind them ajar. Jericho lingered in the shelter of the dripping undergrowth until they'd driven away, then crossed at speed to the door and stepped inside. He was in a dirty brick-lined corridor, off which several small passageways ran. A lamp burned at the end of the corridor where he stood. The rest of the place was in darkness. Once away from the outside door, and the sound of the rain, he could hear voices. He followed them, the passageway becoming darker as he left the vicinity of the bulb. Words came and went. The smell of them, somebody said. There was laughter. Using it as a cover, Jericho moved more swiftly towards the sound. Now another light, albeit dim, reached his straining eyes. They're making a fool of you, a second voice said. It was Hobart who replied. We're close, I tell you, he said. I'll have her. Never mind the woman, came the response. The voice was perhaps that of the prophet, though it had changed Tamra. I want the carpet. All the armies in the world are worth fuck all if we've got nothing to conquer. The vocabulary was less circumspect than his words from the platform had been. There was no reluctance to lead the army here, no false modesty. Jericho pressed close to the door from beyond which the voices came. Get this filth off me, will you? said the prophet. It smothers me. No sooner had he spoken than all conversation on the other side of the door abruptly ceased. Jericho held his breath fearful he was missing some whispered exchange. But he could hear nothing. Then the prophet again. We shouldn't have secrets, he said, apparently apropos of nothing. Seeing is believing, don't they say? At this the door was flung wide. Jericho had no chance to retreat, but stumbled forward into the room. He was instantly seized by Hobart, who wrenched his captive's arm behind his back until the bones threatened to snap, at the same time seizing Jericho's head so hard he could not move it. You were right, said the prophet. He was standing stark naked in the middle of the room, legs apart, arms spread wide, the sweat dripping from him. A bare bulb threw its uncharitable light upon his pale flesh, from which steam rose. I can sniff them out, said a voice Jericho recognized, and the incantatrix Immaculata stepped into his line of vision. Despite his situation, the terrible maiming of her face gave him some satisfaction. Harm had been done to this creature. That was cause for rejoicing. How long were you listening? The prophet asked Jericho. Did you hear anything interesting? Do tell. Jericho looked back toward the man. Three members of the elite were working about his body, wiping him down with towels. It wasn't just his sweat they were removing. Parts of his flesh, at the neck and shoulders, on the arms and hands, were coming away too. This was the smothering filth Jericho had heard him complain of. He was sloughing off the skin of the prophet. The air was rank with the stench of venomous raptures, the corrupt magic of the incantatrix. Answer the man, said Hobart, twisting Jericho's arm to within a fraction of breaking. I heard nothing, Jericho gasped. The steaming man snatched a towel from one of his attendants. Jesus, he said as he rubbed at his face. This stuff is a trial. Pieces of flesh fell from beneath the towel and hit the floor, hissing. He threw the dirtied towel down with it, and looked back up at Jericho. Remnants of the illusion clung to his features here and there, but the actor beneath was quite recognizable. Shadwell, the salesman, naked as the day he was born. He tore off the white wig he'd worn and tossed that down too, then snapped his fingers. A cigarette already lit was placed in his hand. He drew on it deeply, wiping a glob of ectoplasm from beneath his eye with the ball of his hand. Were you at the meeting? he asked. Of course he was, Immaculata said, but she was silenced with a sharp look from Shadwell. He pulled at his foreskin, quite unselfconsciously. Was I good? he said. No, no, of course I was. He peered at his pudenda over his shiny gut. Who the fuck are you? he said. Jericho kept his mouth shut. I asked you a question, said Shadwell. He put the cigarette between his lips and spread his arms so that his dressers could finish his toilet. They proceeded to towel the remaining ectoplasm from his face and body, then began to powder his bulk. I know him, said Hobart. Do you indeed? He's the woman's partner. He's with Susanna. Really? said Shadwell. 
Did you come to make a sale, is that it? See what we'd pay you for her? I haven't seen her, Jericho said. Oh, yes, you have, said Shadwell. And you're going to tell us where to find her. Jericho closed his eyes. Oh, gods, make this end, he thought. Don't let me suffer. I'm not strong. I'm not strong. It won't take long, Shadwell murmured. Tell him, said Hobart. Jericho cried out as his bones creaked. Stop that, Shadwell said. The grip relaxed a little. Keep your brutalities out of my sight, said the salesman. His voice rose. Understand me, he said. Do you? Do you understand? Yes, sir. Shadwell grunted, then turned to Immaculata, his sudden fury just as suddenly dissipated. I think your sisters might enjoy him, he said. Get them here, will you? The incantatrix uttered a summons which came from her misshapen lips like breath on an icy morning. Shadwell returned his attention to Jericho, speaking as he dressed. There's more than pain to be suffered, he said lightly. If you don't tell me where I may find the carpet. He hoisted up his trousers and buttoned up the fly, throwing an occasional glance in Jericho's direction. What are you waiting for? he said to the prisoner. Some bargain or other? He put on his tie while his attenders tied his shoelaces. You'll wait a long time, my friend. I don't barter these days. I don't offer treats. My days as a salesman are over. He took the jacket from his attendant and slipped it on. The lining shimmered. Its powers were familiar to Jericho from Susanna's stories, but it seemed Shadwell had no desire to win a confession from him by that means. Tell me where the carpet can be found, he said, or the sisters and their children will undo you nerve by nerve. Not a difficult choice, I would have thought. Jericho made no reply. There was a chill wind from the corridor. Ah, the ladies, said Shadwell, and death flew in at the door. Chapter 5 The Hours Pass 1. And still he didn't return. It was 3.30 in the morning. She had stood by the window as the hour grew late, watched drunkards brawl, and two unlikely whores ply their desperate trade, until a police vehicle cruised by and they were either arrested or hired. Now the street was deserted, and all she had to watch were the lights changing at the crossroads, green, red, amber, green, without a vehicle passing in either direction, and still he didn't return. She turned over a variety of explanations, that the meeting was still going on, and he couldn't slip away without arousing suspicion, that he'd found friends among the audience and was talking over old times with them, that this, that that, but none of her excuses quite convinced her. Something was wrong. She and the menstruum both knew it. They had made no contingency plans, which was stupid. How could they have been so stupid? She asked herself over and over. Now she was left pacing the narrow room, not knowing what to do for the best, not wanting to leave in case he returned the minute after and discovered her gone, yet fearful of staying in case he'd been captured and was even now being beaten into telling them where she could be found. Time was she would have believed the best, contented herself that he would come back in a while and waited patiently for him. But experience had changed her view of things. Life was not that kind. At 4.15 she started to pack. The very fact that she'd accepted that something was amiss, that she and the weave were in jeopardy, made the adrenaline flow. At 4.30 she began to take the carpet downstairs. It was a lengthy and cumbersome business, but in recent months she'd shed every ounce of fat and in the process discovered muscles she'd never known she had. And again the menstruum was with her, a body of will and light that made possible in minutes what should have taken hours. Even so, there was a hint of dawn in the sky by the time she threw their bags. She had packed for him, too, into the back of the car. He would not come back now, she told herself. Something had detained him, and if she wasn't quick, it would detain her, too. Fighting tears, she drove away, leaving another unpaid bill behind her. Two. It might have given Susanna some small satisfaction if she could have seen the look on Hobart's face when, less than twenty minutes after her departure, he arrived at the hotel the prisoner had named. He'd spilled a good deal while the beasts had their way with him, blood and words in equal measure. But the words were incoherent, a babble from which Hobart wrestled to extract any sense. There was talk of the fugue, of course, among the sobs and the bleedings, and of Susanna, too. Oh, my lady, he kept saying. Oh, my lady. 
Ben fresh sobbing. Hobart let him weep and bleed and weep some more until the man was near to death. Then he asked the simple question, Where is your lady? And the fool answered, his mind past knowing who asked the question, or indeed if he'd answered it. And here in the place the man had spoken of, Hobart now stood. But where was the woman of his dreams? Where was Susanna? Gone again, flitted away, leaving the door handle warm and the threshold still mourning her shadow. It had been very close this time, though. He'd almost taken her. How long before he had her mystery netted once and for all, her silver light between his fingers? Hours. Days at the most. Nearly mine, he said to himself. He clutched the book of fairy tales close to his chest, so that none of its words could slip away, then left his lady's chamber to go whip up the hunt. Chapter 6 Hello, stranger. 1. She hated leaving the city, knowing she was also leaving Jericho behind somewhere. But whatever she felt for him, and that was a difficulty in itself, she knew better than to linger. She had to go, and go quickly. But alone? How long would she, could she, survive like this? A car, a carpet, and a woman who sometimes was not even certain she was human. She had friends around the country, and relatives too, but none she knew well enough to really trust. Besides, they'd ask questions, inevitably, and there was no part of this story she'd dare begin to explain. She thought about going back to London, to the flat in Battersea, where her old life, Finnegan and his out-of-season valentines, the pots, the damp in the bathroom, would be waiting for her. But again there would be questions and more questions. She needed the company of someone who would simply accept her, silence and all. It had to be Cal. Thinking of him, her spirits lightened. His eager grin came to mind, his soft eyes, his softer words. There was probably more danger in seeking him out than in returning to London. But she was tired of calculating risks. She would do what her instincts told her to do, and her instinct said, Two. Cal? There was a long silence at the other end of the telephone line, when she thought contact had been broken. Cal, are you there? Then he said, Susanna? Yes. It's me. Susanna. She felt tears close, hearing him speak her name. I have to see you, Cal. Where are you? In the middle of the city, near some monument of Queen Victoria. The end of Castle Street, if you say so. Can I see you? It's very urgent. Yes, of course. I'm not far from there. I'll slip away now. Meet you on the steps in ten minutes. He was there in seven, dressed in a charcoal gray work suit, Collar turned up against the drizzle. One of a hundred similar young men, accountants, clerks, and junior managers, she'd seen pass by as she waited under Victoria's imperious gaze. He did not embrace her, nor even touch her. He simply came to a halt two yards from where she stood, looked at her with a mixture of pleasure and puzzlement, and said, Hello. Hello. The rain was coming on more heavily by the moment. Shall we talk in the car? she said. I don't like to leave the carpet on its own. At the mention of the carpet, the puzzled look on his face intensified, but he said nothing. In his head he had a vague image of himself rummaging through a dirty warehouse for a carpet, this carpet presumably, but his grasp on the whole story was slippery. The car was parked in Water Street, a stone's throw from the monument. The rain beat a tattoo on the roof of the vehicle as they sat side by side. Her precious cargo, which she'd been so loath to leave, was stored in the back of the car, doubled up and roughly covered with a sheet. Try as he might, he still couldn't get a fix on why the carpet was so important to her, or indeed why this woman, with whom he could only remember spending a few hours, was so important to him. Why had the sound of her voice on the telephone brought him running? Why had his stomach begun churning at the sight of her? It was absurd and frustrating to feel so much and know so little. Things would become clear, he reassured himself, once they began to talk. But he was wrong in that assumption. The more they talked, the more bewildered he became. I need your help, she said to him. I can't explain everything. We haven't got time now. But apparently there's some kind of prophet appeared, promising a return to the fugue. Jericho went to one of the meetings, and he didn't come back. Wait, said Cal, hands up to stem the rush of information. Hold on a moment. I'm not following this. Jericho? You remember Jericho, she said. It was an unusual name, not easily forgotten. 
but he could put no face to it. Should I know him? he said. Good God, Cal. To be honest, a lot of things are blurred. You remember me well enough? Yes, of course. Of course I do. And Nimrod? And Apolline? The night in a fugue? She could see, even before he murmured no, that he remembered nothing. Perhaps there was a natural process at work here, a means by which the mind dealt with experiences that contradicted a lifetime's prejudices about the nature of reality. People simply forgot. I have strange dreams, Cal said, his face full of confusion. What sort of dreams? He shook his head. He knew his vocabulary would prove woefully inadequate. It's hard to describe, he said. Like I'm a child, you know? Except that I'm not. Walking somewhere I've never been. Not lost, though. Oh, shit. He gave up, angered by his fumblings. I can't describe it. We were there once, she told him calmly. You and I. We were there. What you're dreaming about exists, Cal. He stared at her for long moments. The confusion didn't leave his face, but it was mellowed now by the smallest of smiles. Exists, he said. Oh, yes, truly. Tell me, he said softly. Please tell me. I don't know where to begin either. Try, he said. Please. There was such a yearning in his eyes, such a need to know. The carpet, she began. He glanced back at it. Is it yours? he asked. She couldn't help but laugh. No, she said. The place you dream of, it's here. It's in this carpet. She could see incredulity sparring with his faith in her. Here, he said. Sometimes she almost found it difficult to comprehend that fact herself, and she had an advantage over Cal, or even poor Jericho. She had the menstruum as a touchstone of the miraculous. She didn't blame him for his doubt. You have to trust me, she said, however impossible it sounds. I know this, he said, his voice tight. Somewhere in me I know this. Of course you do, and you'll remember. I'll help you remember. But for now I need help from you. Yes, whatever you want. There are people chasing me. Why? Who? I'll tell you about them when we get the chance. The point is, they want to destroy the land you dream about, Cal. The world hidden in that carpet. The fugue. You want to hide back at my place? She shook her head. I risked a call there to get your work number. They could be waiting there already. Geraldine wouldn't tell them anything. I can't risk that. We could go to Deke's place out in Kirkby. Nobody will find us there. You trust him? Sure. She switched on the engine. I'll drive, she said. You direct. Three. They turned into James Street, the fury of the rain, monsoonal now. They didn't get far. A few yards down the road, the traffic had come to a halt. Cal wound down his window and ducked his head out to see what the problem was. It was difficult to be certain of anything through the curtain of rain, but there seemed to have been a collision, and the traffic was backing up behind it. A few of the more impatient drivers in the queue were attempting to nose their way out into the city-bound lane, and failing, thus adding to the confusion. Horns began to blare. One or two drivers got out of the cars, their coats as makeshift umbrellas, to see what was up. Cal laughed quietly. What's funny? she asked him. An hour ago I was sitting in the claims department up to my elbows in paperwork. Now you've got a fugitive for company. The deal's fine by me, he grinned. Why the hell aren't we moving? I'll go look, he said, and before she could prevent him, he was out of the car and threading his way through the maze of vehicles, pulling his jacket up in a vain attempt to keep the rain off his head. She watched him go, her fingers drumming on the wheel. She didn't like this situation. She was too visible, and visible was vulnerable. As Cal reached the opposite side of the street, her attention was claimed by a flash of blue lights in the wing mirror. She glanced around to see several police motorcycles cruising along the queue toward the accident. Her heart jumped a beat. She looked toward Cal, hoping he was on his way back, but he was still studying the traffic. Come on out of the rain, damn you, she willed him. I need you here. There were more officers, these on foot, making their way up the street, and they were speaking to the occupants of each car. Diversionary advice, no doubt. Innocent enough. All she had to do was keep smiling. Up ahead, cars were beginning to move off. 
the riders were directing the traffic around the accident site, bringing a halt to the contrary flow to do so. She looked over toward Cal, who was staring off down the street. Should she get out of the car, call him back? As she weighed the options, an officer appeared at her side, rapping on the window. She wound it down. Wait for the signal, he told her, and take it slowly. He stared at her, rain dripping off his helmet and his nose. She offered a smile. Fine, she said. I'll be careful. Though he delivered his instructions, he didn't move from the window, but stared at her. I know your face, he said. Really? she said, trying for light flirtatiousness and missing by a mile. What's your name? Before she had time to lie, one of the officers up ahead called to her interrogator. He stood up, giving her an opportunity to glance back in Cal's direction. He was standing on the edge of the pavement, staring across at the car. She made a small shake of her head, hoping he'd read her signal through the rain-blurred window. The officer caught her warning. Something wrong? he said. No, she told him. Not at all. Another of the officers was approaching the car, shouting something over the din of rain and idling engines. The longer I stay here, she thought, the worse this is going to get. And she wrenched the wheel around. The officer at the window yelled for her to stop, but the die was cast. As the car bolted forward, she chanced the briefest of glances at Cal's direction. She saw to her distress that he was engaged in trying to wind his way between the cars. Though she shouted his name, he was oblivious to her. She shouted again. Too late, he looked up. The officer in the front was running toward the car. He'd reach it before Cal was halfway across the road. She had no choice but to make her escape while she still had a prayer. She accelerated the officer in front of her, throwing himself out of her path with inches to spare. There was no time to look back for Cal. She skirted the collision site at high speed, hoping he'd used the diversion to pick up his heels and run. She'd traveled no more than four hundred yards when she heard the sound of sirens rising behind her. 4. It took Cal half a dozen seconds to work out what had happened, and another two to curse his sloth. There was a moment of confusion when none of the officers seemed certain whether to wait for instructions or give chase, during which pause Susanna was away around the corner. The officer who'd been at the car window instantly made his way in Cal's direction, his pace picking up with every step. Cal pretended he hadn't seen the man, and began to walk speedily back up toward the monument. There was a shouted summons, and then the sound of pursuit. He ran, not looking behind him. His pursuer was heavily dressed against the rain. Cal was much lighter-footed. He made a left into Lower Castle Street, and another onto Brunswick Street, then a right onto Drury Lane. The sirens had begun by now. The bikes were in pursuit of Susanna. On Water Street he chanced a backward glance. His pursuer was not in sight. He didn't slow his pace, however, until he'd put half a mile between himself and the police. Then he hailed himself a taxi and headed back to the house, his head full of questions and of Susanna's face. She'd come and gone too quickly. Already he was mourning her absence. In order to better hold on to her memory, he fumbled for the name she'd spoken. But, damn it, they were gone already. Chapter 7 Lost Causes 1. The blinding rain proved to be Susanna's ally. So, perhaps, did her ignorance of the city. She took every turn she could, only avoiding cul-de-sac, and the lack of any rationale in her escape route seemed to flummox her pursuers. Her path brought her out into Upper Parliament Street, at which point she put on some speed. The sirens faded behind her. But it would not be for long, she knew. There were breaks in the rain-bellied clouds as she drove from the city. Shafts of sun found their way between, leaving a sheen of gold on roof and tarmac, but for moments only. Then the clouds sealed their wound, and the benediction ceased. She drove and drove as the afternoon grew late, and once more she was alone. 2. Cal stood at the kitchen door. Geraldine, who was peeling an onion, looked up and said, Did you forget your umbrella? And he thought, she doesn't know who I am or what I am, and how could she? Because, God in heaven, I don't know either. I forget myself. Oh, Jesus, why do I forget myself? Are you all right? She was asking him, putting down the onion and the knife now and crossing the kitchen toward him. Look at you. You're soaked. I'm in trouble, he said flatly. She stopped in her tracks. What, Cal? 
I think the police may come here looking for me. Why? Don't ask. It's too complicated. Her face tightened a little. There was a woman on the phone this afternoon, she said, asking for your work number. Did she get through to you? Yes. And is she something to do with this? Yes. Tell me, Cal. I don't know where to begin. Are you having a fling with this woman? No, he said. Then thought, at least not that I remember. Tell me then. Later. Not now. Later. He left the kitchen to the smell of onions. Where are you going? She called after him. I'm soaked to the skin. Cal! I have to get changed. How bad is this trouble you're in? He stopped halfway up the stairs, pulling off his tie. I can't remember, he replied, but a voice at the back of his head, a voice he hadn't heard in a long while, said, Bad, son, bad. And he knew it spoke the bitter truth. She followed him as far as the bottom of the stairs. He went into the bathroom and peeled off his wet clothes while she continued to ply him with questions for which he had no replies. And with every unanswered question, he could hear her voice get closer to tears. He knew he'd call himself a louse for this tomorrow. What was tomorrow? Another dream? But he had to be away from the house again quickly in case the police came looking for him. He had nothing to tell them, of course. At least he could remember nothing. But they had ways, these people, of making a man speak. He rummaged through the wardrobe looking for a shirt, jeans, and a coat, not giving a conscious thought to the choice. As he slipped on the threadbare jacket, he glanced out the window. The street lights had just come on. The rain was a silver torrent in their glare. A chilly night for a jaunt, but it couldn't be helped. He dug in his work suit for his wallet, which he transferred to his pocket, and that was it. Geraldine was still at the bottom of the stairs, looking up at him. She had successfully fought off tears. And what am I supposed to tell them, she demanded, if they come looking for you? Say I came and went. Tell them the truth. Maybe I won't be here, she said. Then, warming to the idea. Yes, I don't think I'll be here. He had neither the time nor the words to offer any genuine solace. Please trust me, was all he could find to say. I don't know what's happening any more than you do. Maybe you should see a doctor, Cal, she said as he came downstairs. Maybe, her voice softened, you're ill. He stopped his descent. Brendan told me things, she went on. Don't bring Dad into this. No, listen to me, she insisted. He used to talk to me, Cal. Told me things in confidence. Things he thought he'd seen. I don't want to hear. He said he'd seen some woman killed in the back garden, and some monster on the railway track. She smiled gently at the lunacy of this. Cal stared down at her, suddenly sick to his stomach. Again the thought, I know this. Maybe you're having hallucinations, too. He was telling stories to keep you amused, said Cal. He used to like to make stuff up. It was the Irish in him. Is that what you're doing, Cal? She said, pleading for some reassurance. Tell me it's a joke. I wish to God I could. Oh, Cal. He went to the bottom of the stairs and softly stroked her face. If anyone comes asking, I'll tell them the truth, she said. I don't know anything. Thank you. As he crossed to the front door, she said, Cal? Yes? You're not in love with this woman, are you? Only I'd prefer you to tell if you are. He opened the door. The rain slapped the doorstep. I can't remember, he said, and made a dash to the car. Three. After half an hour on the motorway, the effects of a night without sleep, and all that the subsequent day had brought, began to catch up with Susanna. The road in front of her blurred. She knew it was only a matter of time before she fell asleep at the wheel. She turned off the motorway at the first service stop, parked a car, and went in search of a caffeine fix. The cafeteria and amenities were thronged with customers, for which she was thankful. Among so many people, she was insignificant. Anxious about leaving the weave a moment longer than she had to, she purchased coffee from the vending machine rather than wait in a serpentine queue, then bought chocolate and biscuits from the shop and went back to the car. Switching on the radio, she settled down to her stopgap meal. As she unwrapped the chocolate, her thoughts went again to Jericho, the thief magician producing stolen goods from every pocket. Where was he now? She toasted him with her coffee and told him to be safe. 
at eight. The news came on. She waited for some mention of herself, but there was none. After the bulletin there was music. She let it play. Coffee drunk, chocolate and biscuits devoured. She slid down in the seat and her eyes closed to a jazz lullaby. She was wakened mere seconds later by a knocking on the window. There was a period of confusion while she worked out where she was. Then she was wide awake and staring with sinking heart at the uniform on the other side of the rain-streaked glass. Please open the door, the policeman said. He seemed to be alone. Should she just turn on the engine and drive away? Before she could reach any decision, the door was wrenched open from the outside. Get out, the man said. She complied. Even as she stepped from the car, she heard the sound of soles on gravel on all sides of her. Against the glare of the neon, a man stood silhouetted. Yes, was all he said. And suddenly there were men coming at her from all sides. She was about to dig for the menstruum, but the silhouette was approaching her with something in its hand. Somebody tore the sleeve from her arm. She felt the needle slide into her exposed skin. The subtle body rose, but not quickly enough. Her will grew sluggish, her sight narrowed to a well shaft. At the end of it, Hobart's mouth. She tumbled toward the man, her fingers gouging the slime on the walls, while the beast at the bottom roared its hosannas. Chapter 8 New Eyes for Old The Mersey was high tonight and fast, its waters a filthy brown, its spume gray. Cal leaned on the promenade railing and stared across the churning river to the deserted shipyards on the far bank. Once this waterway had been busy with ships, arriving weighed down with their cargo and riding high as they headed for far away. Now it was empty. The docks silted up, the wharfs and warehouses idle. Spook City, fit only for ghosts. He felt like one himself, an insubstantial wanderer, and cold, too, the way the dead must be cold. He put his hands in his jacket pocket to warm them and his fingers found there half a dozen soft objects which he took out and examined by the light of a nearby lamp. They looked like withered plums, except that the skin was much tougher, like old shoe leather. Clearly they were fruit, but no variety he could name. Where and how had he come by them? He sniffed at one. It smelt slightly fermented like a heady wine, and appetizing, tempting even. Its scent reminded him that he'd not eaten since lunchtime. He put the fruit to his lips, his teeth breaking through the corrugated skin with ease. The scent had not deceived. The meat inside did indeed have an alcoholic flavor, the juice burning his throat like cognac. He chewed and had the fruit to his lips for a second bite before he'd swallowed the first, finishing it off, seeds and all, with a fierce appetite. Immediately he began to devour another of them. He was suddenly ravenous. He lingered beneath the wind-buffeted lamp, the pool of light he stood in dancing and fed his face as though he'd not eaten in a week. He was biting into the penultimate fruit when it dawned on him that the rocking of the lamp above couldn't entirely account for the motion of the light around him. He looked down at the fruit in his hand, but he couldn't quite focus on it. God alive! Had he poisoned himself? The remaining fruit dropped from his hand, and he was about to put his fingers down his throat to make himself vomit up the rest, when the most extraordinary sensation overtook him. He rose up or at least some part of him did. His feet were still on the concrete. He could feel it solid beneath his soles, but he was still floating up, the lamp shining beneath him now, the promenade stretching out to right and left of him, the river surging against the banks, wild and dark. The rational fool in him said, You're intoxicated. The fruits have made you drunk. But he felt neither sick nor out of control. His sight, sights, were clear. He could still see from the eyes in his head, but also from a vantage point high above him. Nor was that all he could see. Part of him was with the litter, too, gusting along the promenade. Another part was out in the Mersey, gazing back toward the bank. This proliferation of viewpoints didn't confuse him. The sights mingled and married in his head, a pattern of risings and fallings, of looking out and back and far and near. He was not one, but many. He, cow. He his father's son, he his mother's son. He a child buried in a man, and a man dreaming of being a bird. A bird. And all at once it all came back to him. All the wonders he'd forgotten surged back with exquisite particularity. A thousand moments and glimpses and words. A bird, a chase, a house, a yard, a carpet, a flight. And he the bird, yes, yes. Then enemies and friends. Shadwell, Immaculata, the monsters, and Susanna. 
his beautiful Susanna, her place suddenly clear in the story his mind was telling itself. He remembered it all, the carpet unweaving, the house coming apart, then into the fugue, and the glories that the night there had brought. It took all his newfound senses to hold the memories, but he was not overwhelmed. It seemed he dreamed them all at once, held them in a moment that was sweet beyond words, a reunion of self and secret self which was an heroic remembering. And after the recognition, tears, as for the first time he touched the buried grief he felt at losing the man who taught him the poem he'd recited in Lowe's Orchard, his father, who'd lived and died and never once known what Cal knew now. Momentarily, sorrow and salt drew him back into himself, and he was single-sided once more, standing under the uncertain light, bereft. Then his soul soared again, higher now and higher, and this time it reached escape velocity. Suddenly he was up, up above England. Below him moonlight fell on bright continents of cloud, whose vast shadows moved over hillside and suburb like silent ushers of sleep. He went, too, carried on the same winds, over tracts of land which Pylon strode in humming lines, and city streets the hour had emptied of all but felons and wild dogs. And this flight, gazing down like a lazy hawk, stars at his back, the isle beneath him, this flight was companion to that other he'd taken, over the carpet, over the fugue. No sooner had his mind turned to the weave world than he seemed to sniff it, seemed to know where it lay beneath him. His eye was not sharp enough to pick out its place, but he knew he could find it, if he could only keep this new sense intact when he finally returned to the body beneath him. The carpet was north-northeast of the city. That he was certain of. Many miles away and still moving. Was it in Susanna's hands? Was she fleeing to some remote place where she prayed their enemies wouldn't come? No, the news was worse than that, he sensed. The weave world and the woman who carried it were in terrible jeopardy, somewhere below him. At that thought his body grew possessive of him once more. He felt it around him, its heat, its weight, and he exalted in its solidity. Flying thoughts were all very well, but what were they worth without muscle and bone to act upon them? A moment later he was standing beneath the light once more, and the river was still churning, and the clouds he'd just seen from above moved in mute flotillas before a wind that smelled of the sea. The salt he tasted was not sea salt. It was the tears he'd shed for the death of his father, and for his forgetting, and for his mother too, perhaps, for it seemed all loss was one loss, all forgetting one forgetting. But he'd brought new wisdom from the high places. He knew now that things forgotten might be recalled, things lost found again. That was all that mattered in the world, to search and find. He looked north-northeast. Though the many sights he'd had were once more narrowed to one, he knew he could still find the carpet. He saw it with his heart, and seeing it, started in pursuit. Chapter 9 A Secret Place Susanna stirred from her drugged sleep only slowly. At first the effort to keep her lids open for more than a few seconds was too much for her, and her consciousness struggled in darkness. But by degrees her body was cleansing itself of whatever Hobart had put into her veins. She just had to let it do that job in its own good time. She was in the back of Hobart's car. That much was clear. Her enemy was in the front seat beside the driver. At one point he looked around and saw that she was waking, but said nothing. He just stared at her for a little time, then returned his attentions to the road. There was something uncomfortably lazy about the look in his eyes, as if he was certain now of what the future would bring and had no need to hurry toward it. In her drowsy state... It was difficult to calculate time, but surely hours passed as they drove. Once she opened her eyes to find them passing through a sleeping city. She did not know which, then the remnants of the drug won her over again, and when next she woke they were traveling a winding country road, lightless hills rising to either side. Only now did she realize that Hobart's car was leading a convoy. There were headlamps shining through the back window from the vehicles behind. She summoned up strength enough to turn around. There was a black Mariah following and several vehicles behind that. Again, drowsiness overtook her for a timeless while. It was cold air that woke her again. The driver had opened the window and the air had brought goose pimples to her arms. She sat up and breathed deeply, letting the chill slap her to wakefulness. The region they were driving through was mountainous. The Scottish Highlands, she presumed. Where else would there still be snowy peaks in the middle of spring? They took a route now that led them off the road onto a rocky track which slowed their pace considerably. 
The track rose, winding. The engine of the van behind labored, but the road got rougher and steeper still before it delivered them to the top of the hill. There, said Hobart to the driver. We found it. There. Susanna peered from the window. There was neither moon nor stars to illuminate the scene, but she could see the black bulk of the mountains all around, and far below, lights burning. The convoy followed the hilltop for half a mile, then began a steady descent into the valley. The light she'd seen were car headlamps, the vehicles parked in a large circle, so that the lights created an arena. The arrival of Hobart's convoy was clearly expected. As they came within fifty yards of the circle, she saw figures coming to greet them. The car came to a halt. Where are we? she slurred. Journey's end, was all Hobart would say. Bend to the driver. Bring her. The legs beneath her were rubber-jointed. She had to hold on to the car for a while before she could persuade them to behave. With the driver keeping firm hold of her, she was then taken toward the arena. Only now did she realize the scale of the gathering. There were dozens of cars in the ring, and many more in the darkness beyond. The drivers and passengers, who amounted to hundreds, were not human but seer kind. Among them were anatomies and colorations that must have made them outcasts in the kingdom. She scanned the faces looking for any that she knew, and one in particular. But Jericho was not among them. Hobart now stepped into the ring of light, and as he did so, from the shadows on the opposite side of the arena, stepped a figure Susanna assumed was that of the prophet. His appearance was greeted with a soft swell of murmuring from the seer kind. Some pushed their way forward to get a better look at their savior. Others fell to their knees. He was impressive, Susanna conceded to herself. His deep-set eyes were fixed on Hobart, and a small smile of approval found his lips, as the inspector bowed his head before his master. So that was the way of it. Hobart was in the prophet's employ, which fact scarcely covered the latter with glory. Words were exchanged between them, the breath of the speakers visible on the cold air. Then the prophet put his gloved hand on Hobart's shoulder, and turned to announce to the assembly the return of the weave world. Suddenly the air was full of shouts. Hobart turned toward the Black Mariah and beckoned. From its recesses came two of the inspector's cohorts, carrying the carpet. They entered the ring of light, and at Hobart's instruction laid the carpet at the prophet's feet. The crowd was hushed utterly in the presence of their sleeping homeland, and the prophet, when he spoke, did not need to raise his voice. Here, he said almost casually, did I not promise? And so saying, he put his heel to the carpet. It unrolled in front of him. The silence held. All eyes were on the design. Two hundred minds and more sharing the same thought. Open sesame. The call of all eager visitors set before closed doors and desiring access. Open. Show yourself. Whether it was that collective act of will that began the unweaving, or whether the prophet had previously plotted the mechanism, Susanna could not know. Sufficient that it began, not at the center of the carpet, as at Shearman's house, but from the borders. The last unweaving had been more accident than design, a wild eruption of threads and pigment, a fugue breaking into sudden and chaotic life. This time there was clearly a system at work in the process, the knots decoding their motifs in a prearranged sequence. The dance of threads was no less complex than before, but there was a consummate grace about the spectacle, the strands describing the most elegant maneuvers as they filled the air, trailing life as they went. Forms were clothing themselves in flesh and feather. Rock was flowing, trees taking flight toward their rooting place. Susanna had seen this glory before, of course, and was to some extent prepared for it. But to the seer kind, and even more to Hobart and his bully boys, the sight awoke fear and awe in equal measure. Her guard utterly forgot his duty, and stood like a child before his first fireworks display, unsure of whether to run or stay. She took her chance while it was offered, and slipped from his custody, away from the light that would reveal her, glancing back long enough to see the prophet, his hair rising like white fire from his scalp standing in the midst of the unweaving while the fugue burst into life all around him. It was difficult to draw her gaze away, but she ran as best her legs would allow toward the darkness of the slopes. She moved twenty, thirty, forty yards from the circle. Nobody came after her. A particularly bright blossoming at her back momentarily lit the terrain before her like a falling star. It was rough, uncultivated ground, interrupted only by the occasional outcrop of rock a valley chosen for its remoteness, most likely, where the few could be stirred from sleep uninterrupted by humankind. 
How long this miracle would remain hidden with summer on its way was a moot point, but perhaps they had plans for a rapture to divert the inquisitive. Again, the land ahead of her was lit, and momentarily she glimpsed a figure up ahead. It was there and gone so quickly she could not trust her eyes. Another yard, however, and she felt a chill on her cheek that was no natural wind. She guessed its source the instant it touched her, but she had no time to retreat or prepare herself before the darkness unfolded and its mistress stepped into her path. Chapter 10 Fatalities 1. The face was mutilated beyond recognition, but the voice, colder than the chill the body gave off, was indisputably that of Immaculata. Nor was she alone. Her sisters were with her darker than the dark. "'Why are you running?' said the incantatrix. "'There's nowhere to escape to.' Susanna halted. There was no ready way past the three. "'Turn around,' said Immaculata, another splendor from the weave uncharitably lighting the wound of her face. "'See where Shadwell stands. That'll be the fugue in moments.' "'Shadwell?' said Susanna. "'Their beloved prophet,' came the reply. Beneath that show of holiness I lent him, there beats a salesman's heart. So Shadwell was the prophet. What a perfect irony that the seller of encyclopedias should end up peddling hope. It was his idea, said the incantatrix, to give them a messiah. Now they've got a righteous crusade, as Hobart calls it. They're going to claim their promised land and destroy it in the process. They won't fall for this. They already have, sister. Holy wars are easier to start than rumors among your kind or mine. They believe every sacred word he tells them, as though their lives depended upon it, which, in a sense, they do. They've been conspired against and cheated, and they're ready to tear the fugue apart to get their hands on those responsible. Isn't that perfect? The fugue will die at the very hands of those who've come to save it. And that's what Shadwell wants. He's a man. He wants adoration. She gazed over Susanna's shoulder toward the unweaving, and the salesman still in its midst. And that's what he's got. So he's happy. He's pitiful, said Susanna. You know that as well as I do. Yet you give him power. Your power. Our power. For my own end, sister. You gave him the jacket. It was of my making, yes, though there have been times I've regretted the gift. The ragged muscle of Immaculata's face was incapable of its former deceptions. As she spoke, she couldn't mask the sorrow in her. You should have taken it back, said Susanna. A gift of rapture can't be lent, said Immaculata, only given and given in perpetuity. Did your grandmother teach you nothing? It's time you learn, sister. I'll give you those lessons. And what do you get in return? A distraction from Romo's gift to me. She touched her face. And from the stench of men. She paused, her maimed face darkening. They'll destroy you for your strength. Men like Hobart. I wanted to kill him once, Susanna said, remembering the hatred she'd felt. He knows that. That's why he dreams of you. Death the maiden. A laugh broke from her. They're all mad, sister. Not all, said Susanna. What must I do to persuade you? the incantatrix said. Make you understand how you'll be betrayed? Have already been betrayed? Without seeming to take a step, she moved away from Susanna. Flickering strands of light were moving past them now, as the fugue spread from its hiding place. But Susanna scarcely noticed. Her eyes were fixed on the sight revealed when Immaculata stood aside. The Magdalene was there, sumptuously clothed in folds of lacy ectoplasm, a wraith bride, and from beneath the creature's skirts a pitiful figure was emerging, and turning its face up toward Susanna. Jericho. The man's eyes were clouded. Though they settled on Susanna, there was no recognition in them. See, said Immaculata, betrayed. What have you done to him? Susanna demanded. There was nothing left of the Jericho she'd known. He looked like something already dead. His clothes were in tatters, his skin mottled and seeping from dozens of vicious wounds. He doesn't know you, said the incantatrix. He has a new wife now. The Magdalene stretched her hand out and touched Jericho's head, stroking it as if he were a lapdog. He went to my sister's arms willingly, Immaculata said. Let him be, 
Susanna yelled at the Magdalene. Enfeebled by the drugs, her self-control was perilously thin. But this is love, Immaculata goaded. There'll be children in time, many children. His lust knows no bounds. The thought of Jericho coupling with the Magdalene made Susanna shudder. Again she called his name. This time his mouth opened, and it seemed his tongue was seeking to form a word. But no. All his palate could produce was a dribble of saliva. You see how quickly they turn to fresh pleasures, said Immaculata. As soon as your back is turned, he's plowing another furrow. Rage leapt up in Susanna, bettering her disgust. Nor did it come alone, though the remnants of the drug still made any focus difficult. She felt the menstruum ambitious in her belly. Immaculata knew it. Don't be perverse, she said, her voice seeming to whisper at Susanna's ear, though they stood yards apart. We are more alike than not. As she spoke, Jericho raised his hand from the ground toward Susanna. And now she realized why there was no recognition in his eyes. He could not see her. The Magdalene had blinded her consort to keep him close. But he knew she was there. He heard her. He reached for her. Sister, Immaculata said to the Magdalene, bring your husband to heel. The Magdalene was quick to obey. The hand she had on Jericho's head grew longer the fingers pouring down over his face, entering his mouth and nostrils. Jericho attempted to resist, but the Magdalene pulled on him, and he tumbled backward among her pestilential petticoats. Without warning, Susanna felt the menstruum spill from her and fly toward Jericho's tormentor. It happened in the time it took to see it. She caught a glimpse of the Magdalene's features, stretched into a shriek, then the stream of silver light struck her. The wraith's cry broke into pieces, fragments of sound spiraling off, a sobbing complaint, a howl of anger, as the assault lifted her into the air. As usual, Susanna's thoughts were a beat behind the menstruum. Before she was fully aware of what she was doing, the light was tearing at the wraith, gaping holes opening in its matter. The Magdalene retaliated, the stream of the menstruum carrying the attack back into Susanna's face. She felt blood splash down her neck, but the barbs only spurred her fury. She was tearing her enemy as though the wraith were a sheet of tissue paper. Immaculata had not been a passive spectator in this, but had flung her own attack against Susanna. The ground at Susanna's feet shuddered, then rose around her as if to bury her alive. But the subtle body pitched the earth wall back, then went at the Magdalene with redoubled fury. Though the menstruum seemed to have a life of its own, that was an illusion. She owned this power she knew now more than ever. It was her anger that fueled it, that deafened it to mercy or apology. It was she who would not be satisfied until the Magdalene was undone. And all at once it was over. The Magdalene's cries stopped dead. Enough, Susanna instructed. The menstruum let the few fragments of rotted ectoplasm drop to the spattered ground, and withdrew its light into its mistress. From attack to counterattack to coup de grace had taken maybe a dozen seconds. Susanna looked toward Immaculata, whose wretched features were all disbelief. She was trembling from head to foot, as if she might fall to the ground in a fit. Susanna took her chance. She'd no way of knowing if she could survive a sustained attack from the incantatrix. And now was certainly no time to put the problem to the test. As the third sister threw herself among the Magdalene's litter and began to wail, Susanna took heel. The tide of the fugue was lapping all around them now, and the brilliant air camouflaged her flight. Only after she'd covered ten yards or more, did she come to her senses and remember Jericho? There had been no sign of him in the vicinity of the dead Magdalene. Praying that he had found his own way off the battlefield, she ran on, the hag's harrowing din loud in her ears. Two. She ran and ran, believing over and over that she felt the chill of the virgin on her neck. But it seemed she imagined the pursuit, for she ran unhindered for a mile or more up the slope of the valley and over the crest of a hill, until the light of the weaves forthcoming was dim behind her. It would only be a short time before the fugue reached her, and when it did she would need to have some strategy. But first she had to catch her breath. The gloom nursed her a while. She stood trying not to think too hard of what she'd just done. But a certain ungovernable elation filled her. She had killed the Magdalene, destroyed one of the three. It was no minor feat. Had the power in her always been so dangerous? Ripening behind her ignorance, growing wise, growing lethal? For some reason she remembered Mimi's book, which presumably Hobart still had in his possession. Now, more than ever, 
She hoped it could teach her something of what she was, and how to profit by it. She would have to get the volume back, even if it meant confronting Hobart once more. As she formulated this thought, she heard her name uttered, or an approximation of it. She looked in the direction of the voice, and there, standing a few yards from her, was Jericho. He had indeed escaped the Magdalene's grasp, though his face was scored by the sister's ethereal fingers. His racked frame was on the verge of collapse, and even as he called Susanna's name a second time and threw his withered arms out toward her, his legs gave way beneath him and he fell face down on the ground. She was kneeling by his side in moments and turning him over. He was feather light. The sisters had drained him of all but the spark of purpose that had sent him stumbling after her. Blood they could take, and seed and muscle. Love he'd kept. She drew him up toward her. His head lolled against her breasts. His breathing was fast and shallow, his cold body full of tremors. She stroked his head, the diminishing light around it playing about her fingers. He was not content simply to be cradled, however, but pushed himself away from her body a few inches in order to reach up and touch her face. The veins in his throat throbbed as he tried to speak. She hushed him, saying there would be time to talk later. But he made a tiny shake of his head, and she could feel as she held him how close the end was. She did him no kindness to pretend otherwise. It was time to die, and he had sought out her arms as a place to perform that duty. Oh, my sweet, she said, her chest aching. Sweet man. Again he strove for words, but his tongue cheated him. Only soft sounds came, which she could make no sense of. She leaned closer to him. He no longer resisted her comforting, but took hold of her shoulder and drew himself closer still to speak to her. This time she made sense of the words, though they were scarcely more than sighs. I'm not afraid, he said, expelling the last word on a breath that had no brother, but came against her cheek like a kiss. Then his hand lost its strength and slipped from her shoulder. His eyes closed, and he was gone from her. A bitter thought came visiting that his last words were as much a plea as a statement. Jericho had been the only one she'd ever told about how at the warehouse the menstruum had stirred Cal from unconsciousness. Was that, I'm not afraid, his way of saying, leave me to death? I wouldn't thank you for resurrection. Whatever he'd meant, she'd never find out now. She laid him gently on the earth. Once he'd spoken words of love that had defied their condition and become light. Were there others he knew that defied death? Or was he already on his way to that region Mimi had left for? All contact with the world, Susanna still occupied, broken? It seemed so. Though she watched the body till her eyes ached, it made no murmur. He had left it to the earth, and her with it. Chapter 11 Cal Traveling North 1. Cal's journey north dragged on through the night, but he didn't weary. Perhaps it was the fruit that kept his senses so preternaturally clear. Either that or a newfound sense of purpose that pressed him forward. He kept his analytic faculties on hold, making decisions as to his route instinctively. Was it the same sense the pigeons had possessed that he now navigated by? A dream sense, beyond the reach of intellect or reason? A homing? That was how it felt. That he'd become a bird, orienting himself not by the stars. They were blotted by clouds. Nor by the magnetic pole but by the simple urge to go home, back to the orchard, where he'd stood in a ring of loving faces and spoken Mad Mooney's verse. As he drove, he ransacked his head for other such fragments, so that he'd have something fresh to perform next time. Little rhymes came back from childhood, odd lines that he'd learned more for their music than their meaning. Naked heaven comes and goes, spits out seas and dyes the rose, puts on coats of wind and rain and simply takes them off again. He was no more certain of what some were about now than he'd been as a child. But they came to his lips as if fresh-minted, secure in their rhythms and rhymes. Some had a bitter sting. The pestilence of families is not congenital disease, but feet that follow where the foot that has preceded them was put. Others were fragments from poems he'd either forgotten or never been taught in their entirety. One in particular kept coming back to him. How I love the piebald horses! best of all the piebald horses. That was the closing lines of something, he presumed, but of what he couldn't remember. There were plenty of other fragments. He recited the lines over and over as he drove, polishing his delivery, finding a new emphasis here, a fresh rhythm there. 
There was no prompting from the back of his head. The poet was quite silent. Or was it that he and Mad Mooney were finally speaking with a single voice? 2. He crossed the border into Scotland about 2.30 in the morning and continued to drive north, the landscape becoming hillier and less populated as he drove. He was getting hungry and his muscles were beginning to ache after so many hours of uninterrupted driving. But nothing short of Armageddon would have coaxed him to slow down or stop. With every mile he came nearer to Wonderland, in which a life too long delayed was waiting to be lived. Chapter 12 Resolution 1. Susanna sat beside Jericho's body for a long while, thinking while trying all the time not to think. Down the hill the unweaving was still going on, the tide of the fugue approaching her. But she couldn't face the beauty of it, not at the moment. When the thread started to come within fifty yards of her, she retreated, leaving Jericho's body where it lay. Dawn was paling the clouds overhead. She decided to climb to higher ground so as to have an overview when day came. The higher she went, the windier it became a bitter wind from the north. But it was worth the shivering, for the promontory she stood upon offered her a fine panorama. And as the day strengthened, she realized just how cannily Shadwell had selected this valley. It was bounded on all sides by steep hills, whose slopes were bereft of any building, however humble. Indeed, the only sign of human presence was the primitive track the convoy had followed to get here, which had most likely been used more in the last twenty-four hours, than it had in its entire span hitherto. It was on that road, as dawn brought color to the hills, that she saw the car. It crept along the ridge of the hill a little way, then came to a halt. Its driver, minuscule from Susanna's vantage point, got out and surveyed the valley. It seemed the fugue below was not visible to such a casual witness, for the driver got back into the car almost immediately, as if realizing that he'd taken a wrong turning. He didn't drive away, however, as she'd expected. Instead, he took the vehicle off the track, parking it out of sight among the gorse bushes. Then he got out again and began to walk in her direction, following a zigzag route along the boulder-strewn hillside. And now she began to think she recognized him, began to hope that her eyes did not deceive her, and that it was indeed Cal who was making his way toward her. Had he seen her? It seemed not, for he was now starting to descend. She ran a little way to close the gap between them, and then climbed onto a rock and waved her arms. Her signal went unnoticed for several seconds, until by chance he glanced her away. He stopped, cupping his hand over his eyes. Then he changed direction and began to bound back up the slope toward her. And yes, it was Cal. Even then she feared some self-deception, until the sound of his raw breath reached her ears, and the squeak of his heels on the dewy grass. He covered the last few yards between them, stumbling more than running and suddenly he was a moment away, and she was crossing to meet his open arms, hugging him to her. And this time it was she who said, I love you, and answered his smiles with kisses and kisses. 2. They exchanged the bones of their stories as quickly as they could, leaving the meat for less urgent times. Shadwell doesn't want to sell the fugue any longer, said Susanna. He wants to possess it. And play the prophet forever, said Cal. I doubt that. He'll drop the pretense once he's in control. Then we have to prevent him seizing control, said Cal. Unmask him. Or simply kill him, she said. He nodded. Let's not linger, then, he said. They stood up and looked down at the world that now occupied the length and breadth of the valley beneath them. The unweaving was still not completed. Filaments of light crept through the grass, spreading flora and fauna as they went. Beyond the interface of kingdom and weave world, the promised land gleamed. It was as if the fugue had brought from sleep its own season, and that season was an everlasting spring. There was a light in the shimmering trees and in the fields and rivers that didn't come from the sky overhead, which was sullen, but broke from every bud and droplet. Even the most ancient stone was remade today, like the poems Cal had rehearsed as he'd driven. Old words, new magic. It's waiting for us, he said. Together they went down the hill. Part 8. The Return You were about to tell me something, child, but you left off before you began. William Congreve, The Old Bachelor Chapter 1. Strategy Shadwell's army of deliverance consisted of three main battalions. The first and by far the largest was the mass of the Prophet's followers 
the converts whose fervor he had whipped to fanatical proportions, and whose devotion to him and to his promise of a new age knew no bounds. He had warned them that there would be bloodshed, and bloodshed they would have, much of it their own. But they were prepared for such sacrifice. Indeed, the wilder faction among them, chiefly, ye me, the most hot-headed of the families, were fairly itching to break some bones. It was an enthusiasm Shadwell had already used, albeit discreetly, when occasional members of his congregation had called his preaching into question, and he was ready to use it again if there was any sign of softening in the ranks. He would, of course, do what he could to subdue the fugue by rhetoric, but he didn't much fancy his chances. His followers had been easily duped. Their lives in the kingdom had so immersed them in half-truths that they were ready to believe any fiction if it was properly advertised. But the seer kind who had remained in the fugue would not be so easily misled. That was when the truncheons and the pistols would be called into play. The second part of his army was made up of Hobart's confederates, choice members of the squad Hobart had diligently prepared for a day of revolution that had never come. Shadwell had introduced them to the pleasures of his jacket and they had all found something in the folds worth selling their souls for. Now they were his elite, ready to defend his person to the death should circumstance demand. The third and final battalion was less visible than the other two, but no less powerful for that. Its soldiers were the Byblos, the sons and daughters of the Magdalene, an unnumbered and unordered rabble, whose resemblance to their fathers was usually remote, and whose natures ranged from the subtly lunatic to the berserk. Shadwell had made sure the sisters had kept their charges well hidden, as they were evidence of a corruption the prophet could scarcely be associated with. But they were waiting, scrabbling at the veils Immaculata had flung around them, ready for release should the campaign demand such terrors. He had planned his invasion with the precision of a Napoleon. The first phase which he undertook within an hour of dawn was to go to Capra's house there to confront the council of the families before it had time to debate the situation. The approach was made as a triumphal march, but the prophet's car its smoked glass windows concealing the passengers from the eyes of the inquisitive, leading a convoy of a dozen vehicles. In the back of the car Shadwell sat with a Macolata at his side. As they drove he offered his condolences on the death of the Magdalene. I'm most distressed, he said quietly. We've lost a valued ally. Immaculata said nothing. Shadwell took a crumpled pack of cigarettes from his jacket pocket and lit up the cigarette and the covetous way he had of smoking it, as if any moment it would be snatched from his lips, was utterly out of sync with the mask he wore. I think we're both aware of how this changes things, he said, his tone colorless. What does it change? she said. How he liked the unease that was plain on her face. You're vulnerable, he reminded her, now more than ever. That concerns me. Nothing's going to happen to me she insisted. Oh, but it might, he said softly. We don't know how much resistance we're going to meet. It might be wise if you withdrew from the fugue entirely. No, I want to see them burn. Understandable, Shadwell said. But you're going to be a target, and if we lose you, we lose access to the Magdalene's children as well. Immaculata looked across at Shadwell. Is that what this is about? You want the Byblos? Well, I think there's some tactical. Have them, she interrupted. Take them, they're yours. My gift to you. I don't want to be reminded of them. I despised her appetites. Shadwell offered a thin smile. My thanks, he said. You're welcome to them. Just let me watch the fires, that's all I ask. Oh, certainly. Absolutely. And I want the woman found. Susanna. I want her found and given to me. She's yours said Shadwell, as though nothing were simpler. One thing, though. The children. Is there some particular word I use to bring them to me? There is. He drew on his cigarette. I'd best have it, he said, as they're mine. Just call them by the name she gave them. That'll unleash them. And what are their names? He said, reaching into his pocket for a pen. He scribbled them on the back of the cigarette pack as she recited them so as not to forget them. Then, the business concluded, they continued their drive in silence. Chapter 2 The Burial Party Susanna and Cal's first duty was to locate Jericho's body, which took fully half an hour. The landscape of the fugue had long since invaded the place where she'd left him, and it was more by luck than system that they found him. Luck and the sound of children, 
for Jericho had not remained unaccompanied. Two women and a half a dozen of their offspring from two years to seven or so were standing and playing around the corpse. Who is he? One of the women wanted to know when they approached. His name is Jericho, said Susanna. Was, one of the children corrected her. Was. Cal posed the inevitable and delicate question. What happens to bodies here? I mean, where do we take him? The woman grinned, displaying an impressive absence of teeth. Leave him here, she said. He's not going to mind, is he? Bury him. She looked down lovingly on her smallest boy, who was naked and filthy, his hair full of leaves. What do you think? she asked him. He took his thumb from his mouth and shouted, Bury him! A chant that was immediately taken up by the other children. Bury him! Bury him! they yelled. And instantly one of them fell to her knees and began to dig at the earth like a mongrel in search of a bone. Surely there must be some formalities, Cal said. Are you a cuckoo, then? one of the mothers inquired. Yes. And him? She pointed to Jericho. No, said Susanna. He was a babu, and a great friend. The children had all taken to digging now, laughing and throwing handfuls of earth at each other as they labored. Seems to me he was about ready to die, said the woman to Susanna, judging by the look of him. She murmured. He was. Then you should put him in the ground and be done with it, came the response. They're just bones. Cal winced at this, but Susanna seemed moved by the woman's words. I know, she said. I do know. The children will help you dig a hole. They like to dig. Is this right? said Cal. Yes, said Susanna with sudden certainty. Yes, it is. And she and Cal went down on their knees alongside the children and dug. It was not easy work. The earth was heavy and damp. They were both quickly muddied but the sheer sweat of it and the fact of getting to grips with the dirt they were going to put Jericho's body beneath made for healthy and strangely rewarding labor. It took a long time during which the women watched, supervising the children and sharing a pipe of pungent tobacco as they did so. As they worked, Cal mused on how often the fugue and its peoples had confounded his expectations. Here they were on their knees, digging a grave with a gaggle of children. It was not what his dreams of being here had prepared him for but in its way it was more real than he'd ever dared hope. Dirt under the fingernails, and a snotty-nosed child at his side blithely eating a worm. Not a dream at all, but an awakening. When the hole was deep enough for Jericho to be decently concealed, they set about moving him. At this point, Cal could no longer countenance the children's involvement. He told them to stand away as they went to assist in lifting the corpse. Let them help, one of the women chided him. They're enjoying themselves. Cal looked up at the row of children who were mud people by now. They were clearly itching to be pallbearers, all except for the worm-eater, who was still sitting on the lip of the grave, his feet dangling into the hole. This isn't any business for kids, Cal said. He was faintly repulsed by the mother's indifference to their offspring's morbidity. Is it not? said one of the women, refilling the pipe for the umpteenth time. You know something more about it than they do, then? He looked at her hard. Go on she challenged him. Tell them what you know. Nothing, he conceded reluctantly. Then what's to fear? she inquired gently. If there's nothing to fear, why not let them play? Maybe she's right, Cal, said Susanna, laying her hand on his. And I think he'd like it, she said. He was never one for solemnity. Cal wasn't convinced, but this was no time to argue. He shrugged, and the children lent their small hands to the task of lifting Jericho's body and laying it in the grave. As it was, they showed a sweet tenderness in the act, untainted by formality or custom. One of the girls brushed some dirt from the dead man's face, her touch feather light, while her sibling straightened his limbs in the bed of earth. Then they withdrew without a word, leaving Susanna to lay a kiss on Jericho's lips. It was only then, at the very last, that she let go a small sob. Cal picked up a handful of soil and threw it down into the grave. At this the children took their cue and began to cover the body up. It was quietly done. Even the mothers came to the graveside and pitched a handful of earth in as a gesture of farewell to this fellow they'd only known as a subject of debate. Cal thought of Brendan's funeral, of the coffin shunted off through faded curtains, while a pallid young priest led a threadbare hymn. This was a better end, no doubt of it, and the children's smiles had been in their way more appropriate than prayers and platitudes.
When it was all done, Susanna found her voice, thanking both the gravediggers and their mothers. After all that digging, said the eldest of the girls, I just hope he grows. He will, said her mother, with no trace of indulgence. They always do. On that unlikely remark, Cal and Susanna went on their way, with directions to Capra's house. Where, had they but known it, the flies were soon to be feasting. Chapter 3 The Horse Unharnessed 1. Norris, the hamburger billionaire, had long ago forgotten what it was like to be treated as a man. Shadwell had other uses for him. First, of course, during the weave's first waking as his horse. Then, when man and mount returned to the kingdom and Shadwell took on the mantle of profit, as footstool, food taster, and fool, the butt of the salesman's every humiliating whim. To this Norris put up no resistance. As long as he was enthralled to the raptures of Shadwell's jacket, he was utterly dead to himself. But tonight Shadwell had tired of his creature. He had new vassals on every side, and mistreating the sometime plutocrat had become a tired joke. Before the unweaving he'd left Norris to the untender mercies of his elite, to be their lackey. That unkindness was nothing, however, to his other, the withdrawal of the illusion that had won Norris's compliance. Norris was not a stupid man. When the shock of waking to find himself bruised from head to foot had worn off, he soon put the pieces of his recent history together. He couldn't know how much time had passed since he'd fallen for Shadwell's trick. He'd been declared dead in his hometown in Texas, and his wife had already married his brother. Nor could he recall more than vaguely the discomforts and abuse that had been heaped upon him in his period of servitude. But he was quite certain of two things. One, that it was Shadwell who had reduced him to his present abjection, and two, that Shadwell would pay for the privilege. His first task was to escape his new masters, which, during the spectacle of the unweaving, was easily done. They didn't even notice that he'd slipped away. The second objective was to find the salesman, and this, he reasoned, was best done with the aid of whatever police force this peculiar country boasted. To the end, he approached the first group of seer kind he came across and demanded to be taken to somebody in authority. They were apparently unimpressed by his demands, but suspicious nevertheless. They called him a cuckoo, which he took some exception to and then accused him of trespassing. One of the women even suggested he might be a spy and should be taken post-haste to somebody in authority, at which point Norris reminded her that he'd been requesting that all along. So they took him. 2. Which is how, a short while later, Shadwell's discarded horse was brought to Capra's house, which was at the time the center of considerable commotion. The prophet had arrived at the house half an hour before, at the end of his triumphal march, but the counselors had refused him access to the sacred ground until they'd first debated the ethics of it. The prophet declared himself willing to accede to their metaphysical caution. After all, was he not Capra's mouthpiece? He understood absolutely the delicacy of this, and so stayed behind the black windows of his car until the counselors had sorted the matter out. Crowds had gathered, eager to see the prophet in the flesh, and fascinated by the cars. There was an air of innocent excitement, Envoys ferried messages back and forth between the occupants of the house and the leader of the convoy that waited on its threshold, until it was at last announced that the prophet would indeed be given access to Capra's house, on the understanding that he went barefoot and alone. This the prophet apparently agreed to, because mere minutes after this announcement the car door was opened and the great man indeed stepped forth, his feet naked, and approached the doorstep. The throng pressed forward to see him better, this savior who'd brought them to safety. Norris, who was toward the back of the crowd, caught only a glimpse of the figure. He saw nothing of the man's face, but he saw the jacket well enough, and he recognized it on the instant. It was the same garment with which the salesman had tricked him. How could he ever forget the iridescent fabric? It was Shadwell's jacket. It followed, therefore, that the wearer was Shadwell. The sight of the jacket brought back an echo of the humiliations he'd endured at Shadwell's hands. He remembered the kicks and curses. He remembered the contempt. Filled with just fury, he shrugged off the hold of the man at his side and squirmed his way through the pack of spectators toward the door of Capra's house. At the front of the crowd, he glimpsed the jacket and the man who wore it stepping inside. He made to follow, but a guard at the doorway blocked his path. He was pitched backward, the throng laughing and applauding his antics, idiots that they were. "'I know him!' he yelled as Shadwell disappeared from view. "'I know him!' He got to his feet and ran at the door a second time, veering away at the last moment. The guard took the bait and gave chase, pursuing him into the crowd. 
Loris's life as a lackey had taught him something of strategy. He avoided the guard's grasp and made a dive for the unprotected doorway, flinging himself over the threshold before his pursuer could bring him down. Shadwell! he yelled. In the chamber of Capra's house, the prophet froze in mid-platitude. The words he'd been speaking were all conciliation, all understanding. But even the blindest of the assembly could not have failed to read the flicker of anger in the peace bringer's eyes, as that name was called. Shadwell! He turned toward the door. Behind him he heard the counselors exchange whispered remarks. Then there was a commotion in the passageway outside. The door was flung open, and Norris was standing there yelling his name. The horse faltered as it set eyes on the prophet. Shadwell could see doubt registering. This wasn't the face Norris had expected to see. He might yet escape with his masquerade unchallenged. Shadwell, he said to Norris, I'm afraid I don't know anybody by that name. He turned to the counselors. Do you know the gentleman? he inquired. They regarded him with open suspicion, especially an old man at the heart of the gaggle who hadn't taken his baleful eyes off the prophet since Shadwell had entered this hovel. Now the canker of doubt had spread, damn it. The jacket, said Norris. Who is this man? the prophet demanded. Will somebody please have him taken out? He tried to make a joke of it. I think he's a little mad. Nobody moved. Nobody except the horse. Norris stepped toward the prophet, yelling as he came. I know what you did to me, he said. Don't think I don't. Well, I'm going to sue your ass off, Shadwell or whoever the hell you are. There was a further disturbance at the front door, and Shadwell glanced up to see two of Hobart's finest knocking the guard aside and coming to his aid. He opened his mouth to instruct them he could handle the situation. But before the words were off his lips, Norris, his face all fury, flung himself at his enemy. The prophet's elite had strict orders in such circumstances. Nobody but nobody was to lay hands on their beloved leader. Without a second's hesitation, the two men had their pistols from their holsters and they shot Norris dead in his tracks. He fell forward at Shadwell's feet, blood coming from his wounds in bright spurts. Jesus, God, said Shadwell through gritted teeth. The echoes of the executioner's shots took longer to die than Norris had. It was as if the walls disbelieved the sound and were playing it back and forth, back and forth, until they'd verified the transgression. Outside, the crowd had fallen absolutely silent, silent, too, the assembly behind him. He could feel their accusing eyes. That was stupid, he murmured to the killers. Then, his arms outspread, he turned to the counselors. I do apologize for this unfortunate. You're not welcome here, one of the numbers said. You've brought death into Capra's house. It was a misunderstanding, he replied softly. No. I insist you hear me out. Again. No. Shadwell offered a tiny smile. You call yourselves wise, he said. Believe me, if that's true, then you'll listen to what I've got to say. I didn't come here alone. I've got people, your people, seer kind, with me. They love me, because I want to see the fugue prosper as they do. Now, I'm prepared to let you share my vision and the triumph that'll come with it if you want to. But believe me, I'm going to liberate the fugue with or without your support. Do I make myself clear? Get out of here said the old man, who'd been watching him. Be careful, Miss Immerus, one of the others whispered. You don't seem to understand, Shadwell said. I'm bringing you freedom. You're not seer kind, Miss Immerus replied. You're a cuckoo. What if I am? You cheated your way in here. You don't hear Capra's voice. Oh, I hear voices, said Shadwell. I hear them loud and clear. They tell me that the fugue's defenseless that its leaders have spent too much time in hiding, that they're weak and frightened. He surveyed the faces in front of him and saw, it had to be admitted, little of the weakness or the fear he spoke of, only a stoicism that would take longer to erode than he had time to waste. He glanced around at the men who'd shot Norris. It seems we have no choice, he said. The men perfectly understood the signal. They withdrew. Shadwell turned back to the counselors. We want you to leave, Mesimerus restated. Is that your final word? It is, said the other. Shadwell nodded. Seconds ticked by, during which neither side moved a muscle. Then the front door opened again and the gunmen returned.
They had brought four more of the elite with them, which made up a firing squad of six. I request you one final time, said Shadwell, as the squad formed a line to either side of him. Don't resist me. The counselors looked more incredulous than afraid. They had lived their lives in this world of wonders, but here before them was an arrogance that finally brought disbelief to their faces. Even when the gunmen raised their weapons, they made no move, spoke no protest. Only Miss Simmeris asked, Who is Shadwell? A salesman I once knew, said the man in the fine jacket. But he's dead and gone. No, said Miss Simmeris. You're Shadwell. Call me what you like, said the prophet. Only bow your heads to me. Bow your heads and all's forgiven. Still there was no movement. Shadwell turned to the gunman at his left and claimed the pistol from his hand. He pointed it at Mesimerus's heart. The two were standing no more than four yards apart. A blind man could not have failed to kill at that range. I say again, bow your heads. At last a few of the assembly seemed to comprehend the seriousness of their situation, and did as he requested. Most just stared, however, pride, stupidity, or plain disbelief keeping them from acquiescence. Shadwell knew the crisis point was upon him. He either pulled the trigger now, and in so doing bought himself a world, or else he left the sales room and never looked back. In that instant, he remembered standing on a hilltop the fugue laid before him. The memory tipped the balance. He shot the man. The bullet entered Mesimerus's chest, but there was no flow of blood. Nor did he fall. Shadwell fired again, and a third time for good measure. Each shot hit home, but the man still failed to fall. The salesman felt a tremor of panic run through the six gunmen that stood around him. The same question was on their lips as on his. Why wouldn't the old man die? He fired his pistol a fourth time. As the bullet struck him, the victim took a step toward his would-be executioner, raising his arm as he did so, as if he intended to snatch the smoking weapon from Shadwell's hand. The motion was enough to push one of the six beyond the limits of his self-control. With a high-pitched cry, he started to fire into the crowd. His hysteria instantly ignited the rest. Suddenly they were all firing, emptying their guns in their hunger to close the accusing eyes in front of them. In moments the chamber was filled with smoke and din. Through it all, Shadwell saw the man he'd first fired upon complete the motion he'd begun with his salute. Then Mesimerus fell forward, dead. His collapse didn't silence the guns. They blazed on. There were a few counselors who'd fallen to their knees, heads bowed as Shadwell had demanded, and there were others who were taking refuge in the corners of the room. But most were simply gunned down where they stood. Then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. Shadwell threw down his gun and, though he had no taste for abattoirs, forced himself to survey the carnage before him. It was, he knew, the responsibility of one aspiring to godhood never to look away. Willful ignorance was the last refuge of humanity, and that was a condition he would soon have transcended. And when he studied the scene, it wasn't so unbearable. He could look at the tumble of corpses and see them for the empty sacks they were. But as he turned to the door, something did make him flinch. Not a sight, but a memory, of Mesimerus's last act, that stepping forward, that raised hand. He hadn't realized what it had signified until now. The man had been seeking payment. Try as he might to find some other explanation Shadwell could not. He, the sometime salesman, had finally become a purchaser, and Mesimerus's dying gesture had been to remind him of that. He would have to start the campaign moving, subdue the opposition, and get access to the gyre as speedily as possible. Once he'd drawn back the veil of cloud, he'd be a god, and gods were beyond the claims of creditors, alive or dead. Chapter 4 The Rope Dancers 1. Cal and Susanna walked as swiftly as curiosity would allow. There was much, despite the urgency of their mission, that slowed their steps, such fecundity in the world around them, and a razor-sharp wit in its shaping that they found themselves remarking on the remarkable so frequently. They had to give it up and simply look. Amid the spectacle of flora and fauna surrounding them, they saw no species entirely without precedent in the kingdom of the cuckoo. But nothing here, from pebble to bird, nor anything the eye could admire between, was untouched by some transforming magic. Creatures crossed their path that belonged distantly to the family of fox, hare, cat, and snake, but only distantly, and among the changes wrought in them was a total lack of timidity. 
None fled before the newcomers, only glanced Cal and Susanna's way in casual acknowledgment of their existence, then went about their business. It might have been Eden, or an opium dream of same, until the sound of a radio being ineptly tuned broke the illusion. Fragments of music and voices interspersed with piercing whines and white noise, all punctuated by whoops of pleasure, drifted from beyond a small stand of silver birches. The whoops were rapidly replaced, however, by shouting and threats, which escalated as Cal and Susanna made their way through the trees. On the other side was a field of tall sear grass, in it three youths. One was balanced on a rope slung loosely between posts, watching the other two as they fought. The source of the acrimony was evident, the radio. The shorter of the pair, whose hair was so blonde it was almost white, was defending his possession from his bulkier opponent with little success. The aggressor snatched it from the youth's grip and threw it across the field. It struck one of several weather-worn statues that stood half lost in the grass, and the song it had been playing abruptly ceased. Its owner threw himself at the destroyer, yelling his fury. You bastard! You broke it! You damn well broke it! It was cuckoo shit, De Bono, the other youth replied, easily fending off the blows. You shouldn't mess with shit. Didn't your ma'am tell you that? It was mine! De Bono shouted back, giving up on his attack and going in search of his possession. I don't want your scummy hands on it. God, you're pathetic, you know that? Shut up, dickhead! De Bono spat back. He couldn't locate the radio in the shin-high grass, which merely fueled his fury. Galen's right, the rope percher piped up. De Bono had fished a pair of wire-rimmed spectacles from the breast pocket of his shirt and had crouched down to scrabble around for his prize. It's corruption said the youth on the rope, who had now taken to performing a series of elaborate steps along its length. Hops, skips, and jumps. Starbrook would have your balls if he knew. Starbrook won't know, de Bono growled. Oh, yes, he will, said Galen, casting a look up at the rope dancer. Because you're going to tell him, aren't you, Toller? Maybe, came the reply, and with it a smug smile. De Bono had found the radio. He picked it up and shook it. There was no music forthcoming. You shithead, he said, turning to Galen. Look what you did. He might have renewed his assault at this juncture if Toller, from his perch on the rope, hadn't set eyes on their audience. Who the hell are you? he said. All three stared at Susanna and Cal. This is Starbrook's field, said Galen, his tone threatening. You shouldn't be here. He doesn't like women here. Mind you, he's a damn fool, said De Bono, putting his fingers through his hair and grinning at Susanna. And you can tell him that, too, if he ever comes back. I will, said Toller grimly. Depend on it. Who is this Starbrook? said Cal. Who's Starbrook? Galen said. Everybody knows. His voice trailed away. Comprehension dawned. You're cuckoos, he said. That's right. Cuckoos? said Toller, so aghast he almost lost his balance. In a field? De Bono's grin merely became more luminous at this revelation. Cuckoos, he said. Then you can mend the machine. He crossed toward Cal and Susanna, proffering the radio. I'll give it a try, said Cal. Don't you dare, said Galen, either to Cal or De Bono or both. It's just a radio, for God's sake, Cal protested. It's cuckoo shit, said Galen. Corruption, Toller announced once more. Where did you get it? Cal asked De Bono. None of your business, said Galen. He took a step toward the trespassers. Now, I told you once, you're not welcome here. I think he's made his point, Cal, Susanna said. Leave it be. Sorry, Cal said to De Bono. You'll have to mend it yourself. I don't know how, the youth replied, crestfallen. We've got work to do, Susanna said, one eye on Galen. We have to go. She pulled on Cal's arm. Come on, she said. That's it, said Galen. Damn cuckoos. I want to break his nose, Cal said. We're not here to spill blood. We're here to stop its being spilled. I know, I know. With an apologetic shrug to De Bono, Cal turned his back on the field, and they started away through the birches. As they reached the other side, they heard footsteps behind them. Both turned. De Bono was following them, still nursing his radio. I'll come with you, he said, without invitation. You can mend the machine as we go. What about Starbrook? Cal said. 
Starbrook's not coming back, DeBono replied. They'll wait till the grass grows up their backsides, and he still won't come back. I've got better things to do. He grinned. I heard what the machine said, he told them. It's going to be a fine day. Two. DeBono proved an instructive fellow traveler. There wasn't a subject he wasn't prepared to speculate upon, and his enthusiasm for talk did something to coax Susanna from the melancholy that had come in the wake of Jericho's death. Cal let them talk. He had his hands full trying to walk and repair the radio at the same time. He did, however, manage a repeat of his earlier question as to where DeBono had got the item in the first place. One of the prophet's men, DeBono explained, gave it to me this morning. He had boxes of them. Did he indeed? said Cal. It's a bribe, said Susanna. You think I don't know that? said DeBono. I know you get nothing for nothing, but I don't believe everything a cuckoo gives me is corruption. That's Starbrook's talk. We've lived with cuckoos before and survived. He broke off and turned his attention to Cal. Any luck? Not yet. I'm not very good with wires. Maybe I'll find somebody in Nunsuch, he said, who can do it for me. It's only spitting distance now. We're going to Capra's house, said Susanna, and I'll go with you, only via the town. Susanna began to argue. A man's got to eat, said De Bono. My stomach thinks my throat's cut. No detours, said Susanna. It's not a detour, De Bono replied, beaming. It's on our way. He cast her a sideways glance. Don't be so suspicious, he said. You're worse than Galen. I'm not going to lead you astray. Trust me. We haven't got time for sightseeing. We've got urgent business. With the prophet? Yes. There's a piece of cuckoo shit, Cal commented. Who, the prophet? said De Bono. A cuckoo? I'm afraid so, said Susanna. See, Galen wasn't entirely wrong, Cal said. The radio's a little piece of corruption. I'm safe, said De Bono. It can't touch me. Oh, no, said Susanna. Not here, De Bono replied, tapping his chest. I'm sealed. Is that how it has to be? said Susanna, sighing. You sealed up in your assumptions and us in ours? Why not? said De Bono. We don't need you. You want the radio? she pointed out. He snorted. Not that much. If I lose it, I won't weep. It's worthless. All cuckoo stuff is. Is that what Starbrook says? Susanna remarked. Oh, very clever, he replied, somewhat sourly. I dreamed of this place. Cal said, breaking into the debate. I think a lot of cuckoos do. You may dream of us, De Bono replied ungraciously. We don't of you. That's not true, Susanna said. My grandmother loved one of your people, and he loved her back. If you can love us, you can dream of us, too. The way we dream of you, given the chance. She's thinking of Jericho, Cal realized. She's talking in the abstract, but that's who she's thinking of. Is that so? said De Bono. Yes, that's so, Susanna replied with sudden fierceness. It's all the same story. What story? Cal said. We live it and they live it, she said, looking at De Bono. It's about being born and being afraid of dying, and how love saves us. This she said with great certainty, as though it had taken her a good time to reach this conclusion, and she was unshakable on it. It silenced the opposition a while. All three walked on without further word for two minutes or more until De Bono said, I agree. She looked up at him. You do? She said, plainly surprised. He nodded. One story? He said. Yes, that makes sense to me. Finally, it's the same for you as it is for us. Raptures are no raptures. Like you say. Being born, dying, and love between. He made a small murmur of appreciation, then added, You'd know more about the last part, of course, he said, unable to suppress a giggle. Being the older woman, she laughed, and as if in celebration the radio leapt into life once more, much to its owner's delight and Cal's astonishment. Good man, de Bono whooped. Good man. He claimed it from Cal's hands and began to tune it, so that it was with musical accompaniment that they entered the extraordinary township of Nonsuch. Chapter 5. Nonsuch. One. As they stepped into the street, De Bono warned them that the township had been put together in considerable haste, 
and that they shouldn't expect a paradigm of civil planning. But the warning went little way to preparing them for the experience ahead. There seemed to be no sign whatsoever of order in the place. The houses had been laid cheek by jowl in hapless confusion, the tunnels between. The term streets flattered them, so narrow and so thick with citizens, that wherever the eye went it found faces and facades, ranging from the primitive to the baroque. Yet it wasn't dark here. There was a shimmering in the stone and in the paving at their feet that lit the passages and turned the humblest wall into an accidental masterpiece of bright mortar and brighter brick. Any glamour the town could lay claim to was more than matched by its inhabitants. Their clothes had in them that same amalgam of the severe and the dazzling that the visitors had come to recognize as quintessentially seerkindish. But here, in the fugue's closest approximation to an urban environment, the style had been taken to new extremes. Everywhere there were remarkable garments and accoutrements on view. A formal waistcoat that rang with countless tiny bells. A woman whose clothes, though buttoned up to the throat, so matched the color of her skin she was dressed as if naked. On a window sill, a young girl sat cross-legged, ribbons of every color lifting around her face on no discernible breeze. Further down the same alley, a man whose fedora seemed to have been woven from his hair was talking with his daughters, while in an adjacent doorway, a man in a rope suit sang to his dog, and style, of course, spread anti-style, like that of the negress and the white woman who whistled past naked but for pantaloons held up with string. Though all took pleasure in how they appeared, it was not an end in itself. They had business to do this new morning. There was no time for posturing. The only sights that seemed to be drawing any significant attention were the few items of late twentieth-century bric-a-brac that a few of the citizens were playing with. More gifts from the prophet's elite, no doubt. Toys that would tarnish in days, the way all Shadwell's promises would. There was no time to try and persuade the owners of these glittering nonsenses to discard them. They would find out soon enough how frail any gift from that source truly was. I'll take you to the liars, said De Bono, leading the way through the crowd. We'll eat there, then get on our way. From every direction sights and sounds claimed the attention of the cuckoos. Snatches of conversation came at them from doorstep and window, and songs, some from radios, and laughter. A baby bawled in its mother's arms, something barked above them, and Cal looked up to see a peacock parading on a high balcony. Where's he gone, for God's sake? said Susanna, as de Bono disappeared into the crowd for the third or fourth time. He's too damn quick. We have to trust him. We need a guide, said Cal. He caught sight of de Bono's blonde head. There. They turned a corner. As they did so, a cry went up from somewhere in the packed alleyway ahead. So piercing and so grief-stricken, it seemed murder must have been committed. The sound didn't silence the crowd, but hushed it enough for Cal and Susanna to catch the words that followed as the echo of the howl died. They burned Capra's house. That can't be, somebody said, a denial taken up on every side as the word spread. But the news carrier was not about to be shouted down. They burned it, he insisted, and killed the council. Cal had pressed forward through the throng to within sight of the man, who indeed looked as if he'd witnessed some catastrophe. He was dirtied with smoke and mud, through which tears coursed as he repeated his story or what few bones of it there were. The denials were quieting now. There could be no doubting that he spoke the truth. It was Susanna who asked the simple question. Who did it? The man looked her way. The prophet, he breathed. It was the prophet. At this the crowd erupted, curses and imprecations filling the air. Susanna turned back to Cal. We weren't quick enough, she said, tears in her eyes. Jesus, Cal, we should have been there. We wouldn't have made it, said a voice at their side. De Bono had reappeared. Don't blame yourselves, he said. Then added, or me. What now, said Cal. We find the bastard and we kill him, Susanna said. She took hold of De Bono's shoulder. Will you show us the way out? Of course, he about turned and led them away from the knot of citizens surrounding the weeping man. It was apparent as they went that the news had reached every ear and alleyway. The songs and the laughter had entirely vanished. A few people were staring up at the slice of sky between the roofs, as if waiting for lightning. The looks on their faces reminded Cal of how the people of Chariot Street had looked the day of the whirlwind, full of unspoken questions. To judge by the snatches of conversation they caught as they went, there was some argument as to what had precisely happened. 
Some were saying that all those in Capra's house had been murdered, others that there were survivors. But whatever the discrepancies, the broader points were undisputed. The prophet had declared war on any who challenged his primacy, and to that end his followers were already sweeping the fugue in search of unbelievers. We have to get out into open country, said Susanna. Before they reach here, it's a small world, de Bono observed. It won't take them long to purge it, if they're efficient. They will be, said Cal. There was no sign of panic among the residents, no attempt to pack their bags and escape. This persecution or events like it had happened before, or so their furrowed faces seemed to say, and most likely it would all happen again. Should they be so surprised? It took the trio a handful of minutes to wind their way out of the township and into the open air. I'm sorry we have to part so quickly. Susanna said to de Bono when they stood at the perimeter. Why should we have to part? Because we came here to stop the prophet, Susanna said, and we're going to do that. Then I'll take you where he'll be. Where? said Cal. The firmament, de Bono replied with confidence. The old palace. That's what they were saying in the street. Didn't you hear them? And it stands to reason. He'd be bound to take the firmament if he wants to be king, too. They'd not got far from Nunsuch when de Bono halted and pointed across the valley to a pall of smoke. Something burning, he said. Let's hope it's Shadwell, said Cal. I think I ought to know something about this bastard, said de Bono, if we're going to slaughter him in his boots. They told him what they knew, which was, when they came to summarize it, a piffling amount. It's odd, said Cal. It seems like I've known him all my life, but you know it's less than a year since I first set eyes on him. Shadows can be cast in any direction, said de Bono. That's my belief. Starbrook used to say there were even places close to the gyre where the past and the future overlap. I think maybe I visited one of them, said Cal, last time I was here. What was it like? Cal shook his head. Ask me tomorrow, he said. Their route had taken them into marshy territory. They picked their way across the mud from stone to stone, any hope of conversation cancelled by the clamor of frogs which rose from the reeds. Halfway across, the sound of car engines met their ears. Putting caution aside, they crossed to firmer ground by the most direct route, sinking up to their ankles in the water-sodden ground while the frogs, thumbnail small and poppy red, leapt before them in their many hundreds. On the other side, Cal shinned up a tree to get a better view. The vantage point offered him sight of a convoy of cars heading toward the township, it had no need of roads. It was forging its way by dint of wheel and horsepower. Flights of birds rose before it. Animals, those that were fast enough, scattered. Susanna called up to him. What can you see? It's Hobart's mob, I guess. Hobart? She was up the tree and beside him in seconds, edging out along the branch to be clear of the foliage. It's him, he heard her say, almost to herself. My God, it's him. She turned back to Cal, and there was a wildness in her eyes he didn't much like. "'You're going to have to go on without me,' she said. They climbed down again and picked up the argument at ground level. "'I've got business with Hobart. You go on. I'll find you when I'm done.' "'Can't he wait?' Cal said. "'No,' she told him firmly. "'No, he can't. He's got the book Mimi gave me, and I want it back.' She saw the perplexed look on his face and could hear before he delivered them every argument he'd make against their parting. Shadwell was their true objective, he'd say. This was no time to be diverted from facing him. Besides, a book was just a book, wasn't it? It'd still be there tomorrow. All of which was true, of course. But somewhere in her belly she sensed that Hobart's cleaving to the book had some perverse logic about it. Perhaps the pages contained some knowledge she could put to good use in the conflict ahead. Encoded in those once upon a times. That was certainly Hobart's conviction, and what the enemy believed of you was probably true, or else why were you enemies in the first place? I have to go back, she said, and that's all there is to it, that I'll come with you. I can deal with him myself, Cal, she said. You two have to go on to the firmament. I'll find my way to you once I've got the book. She spoke with unshakable conviction. He sensed it would be fruitless to argue with her. Then take care he said, wrapping his arms around her. Be safe. And you, Cal, for me. With that, she was away. De Bono, who'd been out of this conversation while he toyed with his radio, now said, Aren't we going with her? No, said Cal. She wants to go alone. 
He pulled a quizzical face. Love affair, is it? He asked. Something like that. Three. Susanna retraced their steps to the township with an urgency, an enthusiasm even, she didn't entirely comprehend. Was it just that she wanted the confrontation over and done with? Or could it be that she was actually eager to see Hobart again, that he had become a kind of mirror in which she might know herself better? As she stepped back into the street, which the citizens retreating behind their doors had now left more or less deserted, she hoped he knew she was near, hoped his heart beat a little faster at her proximity, and his palms sweated. If not, she'd teach him how. Chapter 6 The Flesh is Weak 1. Though Shadwell had set his sights on occupying the firmament, the only building in the fugue worthy of one teetering on godhood, once ensconced there he found it an unsettling residence. Each of the monarchs and matriarchs who'd occupied the place over the centuries had brought their own vision to its halls and antechambers, their one purpose to expand upon the previous occupants' mysteries. The result was part labyrinth, part mystical ghost train ride. He was not the first cuckoo to explore the firmament's miraculous corridors. Several members of humankind had found their way into the palace down the years and wandered there unchallenged by its makers, who had no desire to sour its tranquility with hard words. Lost in its depths, these lucky few had seen sights that they would take to their graves. A chamber in which the tiles on the walls had twice as many sides as a dice, and flipped forever over and over, each facet having its place in fresco that never came to rest long enough for the eye to entirely comprehend it. Another room in which rain constantly fell, a warm spring night rain, and the floor gave off the smell of cooling pavements, and another which seemed at first quite plain but was built with such sense-beguiling geometries a man might think his head swelled to fill it one moment, and the next be shrunk to the size of a beetle. And after an hour or a day of trespassing among these wonders, some invisible guide would lead them to the door, and they'd emerge as if from a dream. Later they'd try to speak of what they'd seen. But a failure of memory and tongue usually conspired to reduce their attempts to babble. In desperation many went back in search of that delirium. But the firmament was a movable feast and it had always flitted away. Shadwell was the first cuckoo, therefore, who walked those rapturous corridors and called them his own. It gave him no pleasure, however. That was perhaps its most elegant revenge on its unwelcome occupant. 2. In the late afternoon, before the light dwindled too much, the prophet made his way up to the top of the firmament's watchtower to survey his territories. Despite the demands of recent weeks, the masquerading, the rallies, the constant politicking, he didn't feel weary. All he'd promised his followers and himself had come true. It was as if his performance as a prophet had lent him prophetic powers. He'd found the weave as he'd said he would, and claimed it from its guardians. He'd led his crusaders into the very heart of the fugue, silencing with almost supernatural speed any and all who defiled him. From his present elevated status there was no route to rise but toward godhood, and the means to the advancement was visible from where he now stood. The gyre. Its mantle roiled and thundered, veiling its secrets from all eyes, even his. No matter. Tomorrow, when Hobart's battalion had finished its suppression of the natives, they would escort the prophet to the doorway of the gyre, the place the kind called the Narrow Bright, and he would step inside. Then? Ah, then. A chill on his nape stirred him from speculation. Immaculata was standing at the viewing-room door. The light did not indulge her. It showed her wounds in all their suppurating glory, showed her frailty, too, and her rancor. It repulsed him to look at her. What do you want? he demanded. I came to join you, she said. I don't like this place. It stinks of the old science. He shrugged and turned his back on her. I know what you're thinking, Shadwell, she said, and believe me, it wouldn't be wise. He hadn't heard his name uttered in a long while, and he didn't like the way it sounded. It was a throwback to a biography he'd almost ceased to believe was his. What wouldn't be wise, he said, trying to breach the gyre. He made no reply. That is what you intend, isn't it? She could read him still, all too easily. Maybe, he said. That'd be a cataclysmic mistake. Oh, indeed, he said, not taking his eyes off the mantle. And why is that? Even the families don't understand what they created when they set the loom to work, she said. It's unknowable. Nothing's unknowable, he growled. Not to me. Not any more. 
You're still a man, Shadwell, she reminded him. You're vulnerable. Shut up, he said. Shadwell. Shut up, he repeated and turned on her. I don't want to hear your defeatism any longer. I'm here, aren't I? I won the fugue. We won it. All right, we. What do you want for that little service? You know what I want, she said. What I've always wanted. Slow genocide, he smiled. His reply was a long time coming, and when it came was spoken slowly. No, he said. No, I don't think so. Why did we follow them all those years? she asked. It was so you could have profit and I could be avenged. Things have changed, he said. You must see that. I want more than that, he said. I want to know what creation tastes like. I want what's in the gyre. It'll tear you apart. I doubt that, he said. I've never been stronger. At the shrine, she replied. You said we'd destroy them together. I lied, Shadwell said lightly. I told you what you wanted to hear because I needed you. Now you disgust me. I'll have new women when I'm a god. A god now, is it? She seemed genuinely amused by the thought. You're a salesman, Shadwell. You're a shabby little salesman. I'm the one they worship. Oh, yes, Shadwell replied. I've seen your cult. A boneyard and a handful of eunuchs. I won't be cheated, Shadwell, she said, moving toward him. Not by you, of all men. He'd known for many months that this time would come when she finally understood how he'd manipulated her. He'd prepared himself for the consequences, quietly and systematically divesting her of her allies and increasing his own store of defenses. But she still had the menstruum. Of that she could never be dispossessed. He saw it burgeoning in her eyes even now and couldn't help but want to flinch before it. He governed the instinct, however, and instead walked across to her, and putting his hand to her face stroked the lesions and the scabs there. Surely, he murmured, you wouldn't kill me. I won't be cheated, she said again. But dead is dead, he said, his tone soothing. I'm just a cuckoo. You know how weak we are. No resurrections for us. His touch had become more rhythmic. She hated it, he knew. She, the perfect virgin. She, all ice and regret. In earlier times, she might have burned the skin from his fingertips for visiting this indignity upon her. But Mama Puss was dead. The hag, her useless lunatic self. The once mighty incantatrix was weak and weary, and they both knew it. All these years, sweetheart, he said. All these years you gave me just enough leash, just enough temptation. We agreed, she said. Together. No, said Shadwell, as though correcting a child. You used me to go among the cuckoos, because if the truth be known, they frighten you. She made to contradict, but he put his hand across her throat. Don't interrupt, he told her. She obeyed him. You've always held me in contempt, he went on. I know that, but I was useful and did as I was told as long as I wanted to touch you. Is that what you want now? she said. Once, he said, almost mourning the loss, once I would have killed to feel the pulse in your throat. Like this. His hand tightened a little. Or to have stroked your flesh. He worked the palm of his other hand against her breast. Don't do that, she said. The Magdalene's dead, he reminded her. So who's going to produce children now? It can't be the old bitch. She's sterile. No, lover. No. I think it has to be you. You'll finally have to offer up that precious cunt of yours. At this she threw him off her, and might have struck him dead, but that revulsion at his mauling distracted her from the act. She soon recovered her self-control. The killing power was mustering behind her eyes. He couldn't with safety delay his revenge any longer. She'd taken him for a fool, but he had ways to make her regret her arrogance. As she raised her head to spit the menstruum at him, he called out the names he'd written mere hours before on his pack of cigarettes. Souza, Vessel, Fairchild, Divine, Bloss, Hannah. The Byblows came at his call, scrabbling up the stairs. They were no longer the wretched, lovelorn things that the Magdalene had suckled. Shadwell had treated them tenderly in the short time he'd owned them, fed them, made them mighty. The light died in Immaculata's face as she heard them behind her. 
She turned as they spilled through the door. You bequeath them to me, he said. She let out a cry at the sight of them, grown gross and meaty. They stank of the slaughterhouse. I give them blood instead of milk, said Shadwell. It makes them love me. He made a clucking sound with his tongue, and the creatures sidled over to him, trailing organs they had yet to find a purpose for. I warn you, he said. Try to harm me, and they'll take it badly. As he spoke, he realized that in these last moments Immaculata had summoned the hag from the cooler regions of the firmament. She was at the incantatrix's shoulder now, a restive shadow. Leave him, he heard her sigh in Immaculata's ear. He didn't for an instant think she'd take that advice, but she did, first spitting on the floor at Shadwell's feet, then turning to go. He could scarcely believe the battle had been so easily won. She'd been more demoralized by grief and mutilation than he'd dared hope. The showdown was over before it had even begun. One of the by-blows at his side uttered a soulful wail of frustration. He took his eyes off the sister and told it to hush itself. His doing so proved all but fatal, for in the instant his gaze dropped the wraith sister came flying at him, her jaws wide, her teeth suddenly vast, ready to tear out his cheating heart. At the door Immaculata was turning back, the menstruum breaking from her. He yelled for the beasts to come to his aid, but even as he did so the hag was upon him. His breath burst from him as he was thrown back against the wall, claws raking at his chest. The byblows weren't about to see their blood bringer laid low. They were upon the hag before her nails could rip through Shadwell's jacket, and she was dragged from him, shrieking. She'd been midwife to these creatures. She'd delivered them into a world of lunacy and darkness. Perhaps for that very reason they showed her no mercy. They tore at her without pause or apology. Stop them! Immaculata yelled. The salesman was examining the lacerations the hag had made in his jacket. Another moment and her fingers would have clutched his heart. Call them off, Shadwell. Please. She's dead already, he said. Let them play. Immaculata moved to aid her sister, but as she did so, the largest of the by-blows, with the tiny white eyes of a deep sea fish and a mouth like a wound, came between her and rescue. She spat an arrow of the menstruum into its pulsing chest, but it took the hurt in its stride and came at her unchecked. Shadwell had seen these monstrosities murder among themselves for the sport of it. He knew they could sustain horrendous injury without slowing. This one, for instance, called Vessel, could take a hundred such wounds and still make merry. Nor was it stupid. It had learned the lessons he'd taught it well enough. Even now it leapt upon the incantatrix, wrapping its arms around her neck and its legs about her hips. Such intimacy would, he knew, drive Immaculata to distraction. Indeed, as it put its face to hers, kissing her as best its malformations would allow, she started to scream, all control and calculation finally lost. The menstruum flew from her in all directions, wasting its potency on the ceiling and the walls. Those few barbs that found her attacker did nothing but arouse it further. Though it had no sexual anatomy to speak of, Shadwell had trained it in the basic moves. It worked itself against her like a dog in heat, howling into her face. Opening its mouth was a mistake on its part, for a fragment of the menstruum found its way down into its throat and blew it wide. Its neck erupted, and its head, no longer supported, fell backward on greasy strings of matter. Even so it clung to her, its body moving in ragged spasms against hers. But its grip had loosened sufficiently for her to tear its body from her, the struggle leaving her bloodied from head to foot. Shadwell called the remaining by-blows from their vengeful play. They withdrew to his side. All that was left of the hag was a litter that resembled the leavings on a fish gutter's tiles. Seeing the remains, Immaculata, her face slack to the point of imbecility, let out a low moan of loss. Get her out of here, said Shadwell. I don't want to see her filthy face. Take her into the hills. Dump her. Two of the by-blows approached the incantatrix and took hold of her. There was not so much as a flicker in her eyes, nor a finger raised in protest. She seemed no longer even to see them. Either the slaughter of her one remaining sister or her own violation by the beast, or perhaps both, had undone something inside her. She was suddenly bereft of any power to enchant or terrify. A sack which they hauled away through the door and carried off down the stairs. Not once did she even raise her eyes in Shadwell's direction. He listened to the slouching gait of the by-blows fade down the stairs, still half expecting her to come back for him to mount one final attack. But no, it was over. He crossed to the muck of the hag. 
It smelled of something rotten. Have it, he said to the remaining beasts who fell upon the scraps and fought over them. Revolted by their appetite, he turned his gaze back toward the gyre. Very soon now night would be upon the fugue, a fast curtain on the events of a busy day. With tomorrow a new act would begin. Somewhere beyond the cloud he was watching lay a knowledge that would transform him. After that, no night would fall except at his word, nor day dawn. Chapter 7 An Open Book 1. The law had come to none such. It had come to root out dissension. It had found none. It had come with truncheons, riot shields, and bullets, prepared for armed rebellion. It had found no whisper of that either. All it had found was a warren of shadowy streets, most of them deserted, and a few pedestrians who bowed their heads at the first sign of a uniform. Hobart had immediately ordered a house-to-house -house search. It had been greeted with a few sour looks, but little more than that. He was disappointed. It would have been gratifying to have found something to sharpen his authority upon. All too easy, he knew, to be lulled into a false sense of security, especially when an anticipated confrontation had failed to materialize. Vigilance was the key word now. Unending vigilance. That was why he'd occupied a house with a good view of the township from its upper stories, where he could take up residence for the night. Tomorrow would bring the big push on the gyre, which could surely not go unopposed. And yet, who could be certain with these people? They were so docile, like animals rolling over at the first sign of a greater power. The house he'd commandeered had little to recommend it beyond its view. A maze of rooms, a collection of faded murals, which he didn't care to study too closely. Spare and creaking furniture. The discomfort of the place didn't bother him. He liked Spartan living. But the atmosphere did. The sense he had that the ousted tenants were still here, just out of sight. If he'd been a man who believed in ghosts, he'd have said the house was haunted. He wasn't, so he kept his fears to himself, for they multiplied. Evening had fallen, and the streets below were dark. He could see little from his high window now, but he could hear laughter drifting up from below. He'd given his men the evening to enjoy themselves, warning them never to forget that the township was enemy territory. The laughter grew more riotous, then faded down the street. Let them indulge themselves, he thought. Tomorrow the crusade would take them on to ground the people here thought of as sacred. If they were going to show any resistance, it would be then. He'd seen the same happen in the world outside. A man who wouldn't lift a finger if his house were burned down, throwing a fit if someone touched a trinket he called holy. Tomorrow promised to be a busy day, and a bloody one, too. Richardson had declined the opportunity to take the night off, preferring to stay in the house and make a report of the day's events for his personal records. He kept a ledger of his every move set down in a tiny, meticulous hand. He worked on it now as Hobart listened to the laughter disappearing below. Finally, he put down his pen. Sir? What is it? These people, sir. It seems to me... Richardson halted, unsure of how best to voice a question that had been vexing him since they'd arrived. It seems to me they don't look quite human. Hobart studied the man. His hair was immaculately cut, his cheeks immaculately shaved his uniform immaculately pressed. You may be right, he said. A flicker of distress crossed Richardson's face. I don't understand, sir. While well, you're here, you should believe nothing you see. Nothing, sir? Nothing at all, Hobart said. He put his fingers to the glass. It was cold. His body heat lent the tip's misty halos. The whole place is a mass of illusions, tricks and traps. None of it's to be trusted. It's not real, Richardson said. Hobart stared across the roofs of this little nowhere and turned the question over. Real was what made the world go round, what was solid and true, and its flip side unreal. That was what some lunatic in a cell shouted at four in the morning. Unreal was dreams of power without the flesh to give them weight. But his view of these matters had subtly changed since his first encounter with Susanna. He had wanted her capture as he'd wanted no other and his pursuit of her had led from one strangeness to another, until he was so fatigued he scarcely knew right from left. Real? What was real? Perhaps this thought would have been unthinkable before Susanna. Real was merely what he said was real. He was the general, and the soldier needed an answer for his sanity's sake, a plain answer that would let him sleep soundly. He gave it. 
Only the law's real here, he said. We have to hang on to that. All of us. Do you understand? Richardson nodded. Yes, sir. There was a long pause during which somebody outside began whooping like a drunken Cherokee. Richardson closed his ledger and went to the second window. I wonder, he said. Yes? Perhaps I should go out. Just for a while. To see these illusions face to face. Maybe. Now that I know it's all a lie, he said, I'm safe, aren't I? As safe as you're ever going to be, said Hobart. Then if you don't mind, go on. See for yourself. Richardson was away in seconds and down the stairs. A few moments later, Hobart caught sight of his shadowy form moving away down the street. The inspector stretched. He was tired to the marrow. There was a mattress in the next room, but he was determined not to avail himself of it. Laying his head on a pillow would offer the rumors of occupancy here an easy victim. Instead, he sat down in one of the plain chairs and took the book of fairy tales from his pocket. It had not left his presence since its confiscation. He'd lost count of the times he'd scanned its pages. Now he did the same again. But the lines of prose grew steadily hazier in front of him, and though he tried to check himself, his lids became heavier and heavier. Long before Richardson had found himself an illusion to call his own, the law that had come to none such had fallen asleep. 2. Susanna didn't find it so difficult to avoid Hobart's men when she stepped back into the township. Though they swarmed through the alleyways, the shadows had become unnaturally dense there, and she was always able to stay a few steps ahead of the enemy. Getting access to Hobart was another matter, however. Though she wanted to be finished with her work here as quickly as possible, there was no use in risking arrest. She'd escaped custody twice. Three times might be pressing her luck. Though impatience gnawed at her, she decided to wait until the light faded. The days were still short this early in the year. It would only be a few hours. She found herself an empty house, availing herself of some plain food that the owners had left there, and wandered around the echoing rooms until the light outside began to dwindle. Her thoughts turned back and back again to Jericho, and the circumstances of his death. She tried to remember the way he looked, and had some success with his eyes and hands, but couldn't create anything like a complete portrait. Her failure depressed her. He was so soon gone. She had just about decided that it was dark enough to risk venturing out when she heard voices. She went to the bottom of the stairs and peered through to the front of the house. There were two silhouetted figures on the threshold. Not here, she heard a girl's voice whisper. Why not? said her male companion, his words slurred. One of Hobart's company, no doubt. Why not? It's as good as any. There's somebody here already said the girl, staring into the mystery of the house. The man laughed. Dirty fuckers, he called. Then he took the woman roughly by the arm. Let's find somewhere else, he said. They moved away into the street. Susanna wondered if Hobart had sanctioned such fraternization. She couldn't believe he had. It was time she put an end to stalking him in her imagination. Time to find him and get her business with him done. She slipped through the house, scanned the street, then stepped out into the night. The air was balmy and with so few lights burning in the houses, and those that did burn mere candle flames, the sky was bright above, the stars like dewdrops on velvet. She walked a little way with her face turned skyward, entranced by the sight, but not so entranced she didn't sense Hobart's proximity. He was somewhere near, but where? She could still waste precious hours going from house to house trying to find him. When in doubt, ask a policeman. It had been one of her mother's favorite saws and never more apt. A few yards from where she stood, one of Hobart's horde was pissing against a wall, singing a ragged rendition of Land of Hope and Glory to accompany the flood. Trusting that his inebriation would keep him from recognizing her, she asked Hobart's whereabouts. You don't need him, the man said. Come on in. We've got a party going. Maybe later. I've got to see the inspector. If you must, the man said. He's in the big house with the white walls. He pointed back the way she'd come, splashing his feet as he did so. Somewhere off to the right, he said. The instructions, despite the provider's condition, were good. Off to the right was a street of silent dwellings, and at the corner of the next intersection a sizable house, its walls pale in the starlight. There was nobody standing sentry at the door. The guards had presumably succumbed to whatever pleasures none such could offer. 
she pushed the door open and stepped inside unchallenged. There were riot shields propped against the wall of the room she'd entered, but she needed no confirmation that this was indeed the house. Her gut already knew that Hobart was in one of the upper rooms. She started up the stairs, not certain what she would do when she confronted him. His pursuit of her had made her life a nightmare, and she wanted to make him regret it. But she couldn't kill him. Dispatching the Magdalene had been terrible enough. Killing a human being was more than her conscience would allow. Best just to claim her book and go. At the top of the stairs was a corridor, at the end of which a door stood ajar. She went to it and pushed it open. He was there, her enemy, alone, slumped in a chair, his eyes closed. In his lap lay the book of fairy tales. The very sight of it made her nerves flutter. She didn't hesitate in the doorway, but crossed the bare boards to where he slumbered. In his sleep, Hobart was floating in a misty place. Moths flew around his head and beat their dusty wings against his eyes, but he couldn't raise his arms to brush them away. Somewhere near he sensed danger, but from which direction would it come? The mist moved to his left, then to his right. Who? he murmured. The word he spoke froze Susanna in her tracks. She was a yard from the chair, no more. He muttered something else, words she couldn't comprehend. But he didn't wake. Behind his eyelids Hobart glimpsed an unfixable form in the mist. He struggled to be free of the lethargy that weighed him down, fought to waken and defend himself. Susanna took another step toward the sleeper. He moaned again. She reached for the book, her fingers trembling. As they closed around it, his eyes sprang wide open. Before she could snatch the book away from him, his grip on it tightened. He stood up. No! he shouted. The shock of his waking almost made her lose her hold. But she wasn't going to give her prize up now. The book was her property. There was a moment of struggle between them as they fought for possession of the volume. Then, without warning, a veil of darkness rose from their hands, or more correctly, from the book they held between them. She looked up into Hobart's eyes. He was sharing her shock at the power that was suddenly released from between their woven fingers. The darkness rose between them like smoke, and blossomed against the ceiling, immediately tumbling down again and closing them both in a night within a night. She heard Hobart loose a yell of fear. The next moment words seemed to rise from the book, white forms against the smoke, and as they rose they became what they meant. Either that or she and Hobart were falling and becoming symbols as the book opened to receive them. Whichever, or both, it was all one in the end. Rising or falling, as language or life, they were delivered into storyland. Chapter 8 The Essential Dragon It was dark in the state they'd entered, dark and full of rumor. Susanna could see nothing in front of her, not even her fingertips, but she could hear soft whispers carried to her on a warm, pine-scented wind. Both touched her face, whispers and wind. Both excited her. They knew she was here, the people that inhabited the stories in Mimi's book. For it was there, in the book, that she and Hobart now existed. Somehow, in the act of struggling, they'd been transformed, or at least their thoughts had. They'd entered the common life of words. Standing in the darkness, and listening to the whispers all around her, she didn't find the notion so difficult to comprehend. After all, hadn't the author of this book turned his thoughts into words, in the act of writing it? Knowing his readers would decode them as they read, making thoughts of them again? More, making an imagined life. So here was she now, living that life, lost in Geschichten der Geheimen Orte, or found there. There were hints of light moving to either side of her, she now realized. Or was it she that was moving, running perhaps, or flying? Anything was possible here. This was fairyland. She concentrated to get a better grasp of what these flashes of light and darkness meant, and realized all at once that she was traveling at high speed through avenues of trees, vast primeval trees, and the light between them was growing brighter. Somewhere up ahead Hobart was waiting for her, or for the thing she'd become as she flew through the pages. For she was not Susanna here, or rather not simply Susanna. She could not simply be herself here any more than he could be simply Hobart. They were grown mythical in this absolute forest. They had drawn to themselves the dreams that this state celebrated, the desires and faiths that filled the nursery stories, and so shaped all subsequent desires and faiths. There were countless characters to choose from wandering in the wild woods, 
Sooner or later every story had a scene played here. This was the place orphaned children were left to find either their deaths or their destinies, where virgins went in fear of wolves and lovers in fear of their hearts. Here birds talked and frogs aspired to the throne, and every grove had its pool and well and every tree a door to the netherworld. What among these was she? The maiden, of course. Since childhood she'd been the maiden. She felt the wild woods grow more luminous at this thought, as though she'd ignited the air with it. I'm the maiden, she murmured. And he's the dragon. Oh, yes, that was it, of course, that was it. The speed of her flight increased. The pages flipped over and over, and now ahead she saw a metallic brightness between the trees. And there the great worm was, its gleaming coils wrapped around the roots of a noaic tree, its vast, flat-snouted head laid on a bed of blood-red poppies as it bided its terrible time. Yet perfect as it was in every scaly detail, she saw Hobart there, too. He was woven with the pattern of light and shade, and so, most oddly, was the word dragon. All three occupied the same space in her head, a living text of man, word, and monster. The great worm Hobart opened its one good eye, a broken arrow protruded from its twin, the work of some hero or other, no doubt, who'd gone this tasseled and shining way in the belief that he'd dispatched the beast. It was not so easily destroyed. It lived still, its coils no less tremendous for the scars they bore, its glamour untarnished. And the living eye? It held enough malice for a tribe of dragons. It saw her and raised its head a little. Molten stone seethed between its lips and murdered the poppies. Her flight toward it faltered. She felt its glance pierce her. Her body began to tremble in response. She tumbled toward the dark earth like a swatted moth. The ground beneath her was strewn with words, or were they bones? Whichever, she fell among them, shards of nonsense thrown up in all directions by her flailing arms. She got to her feet and looked about her. The colonnades were empty in every direction. There was no hero to call upon, nor mother to take comfort with. She was alone with the worm. It raised its head a few feet higher, this minor motion causing a slow avalanche of coils. It was a beautiful word, there was no denying that. Its iridescent scales glittering, the elegance of its malice enchanting. She felt, looking at it, that same combination of yearning and anxiety that she remembered so well from childhood. Its presence aroused her, there was no other word for it. As if in response to the confession, the dragon roared. The sound it made was hot and low seeming to begin in its bowels and winding down its length to break from between the countless needles of its teeth, a promise of greater heat to come. All light had gone from between the trees. No bird sang or spoke. No animal, if any lived so close to the dragon, dared move a whisker in the undergrowth. Even the bone words and the poppies had disappeared, leaving these two elements, maiden and monster, to play out their legend. It finishes here, Hobart said with the dragon's label tongue. Each syllable he shaped was a little fire that cremated the specks of dust around her head. She was not afraid of all of this, rather exhilarated. She had only ever been an observer of these rites. At last she was a performer. Have you nothing more to tell me? the dragon demanded, spitting the words from between its serried teeth. No blessings? No explanations? Nothing, she said defiantly. What was the purpose of talk? when they were so perfectly transparent to each other. They knew who they were, didn't they? Knew what they meant to one another. In the final confrontation of any great tale, dialogue was redundant. With nothing left to say, only action remained. A murder or a marriage. Very well, said the dragon, and it moved toward her, drawing its length over the wasteland between them with vestigial forelegs. He means to kill me, she thought. I have to act quickly. What did the maiden do to protect herself in such circumstances as this? Did she flee or try to sing the beast to sleep? The dragon was towering over her now, but it didn't attack. Instead, it threw back its head, exposing the pale, tender flesh of its throat. Please be quick, it growled. She was bewildered by this. Be quick, she said. Kill me and be done, it instructed her. Though her mind didn't fully comprehend this volta face. The body she occupied did. She felt it changing in response to the invitation, felt a new ripeness in it. She'd thought to live in this world as an innocent, but that she couldn't be. 
She was a grown woman, a woman who'd changed in the last several months, sloughed off years of dead assumptions, found magic inside herself, suffered loss. The role of maiden, all milk and soft size, didn't fit. Hobart knew that better than she. He hadn't come into these pages as a child, but as the man he was, and he'd found a role here that suited his most secret and forbidden dreams. This was no place for pretense. She was not the virgin, he was not the devouring worm. He, in his private imaginings, was power besieged and seduced, and finally, painfully, martyred. That was why the dragon before her raised its milky throat. Kill me and be done, he said, lowering his head a little to look at her. In his surviving eyes she saw for the first time how wounded he was by his obsession with her, how he'd come to be enthralled to her, sniffing after her like a lost dog, hating her more with every day that passed for the power she had over him. In the other reality, the room from which they'd stepped, which was in turn hidden in a larger kingdom, worlds within worlds, he would be brutal with her. Given the chance, he'd kill her for fear of the truth he could only admit in the sacred grove of his dreams. But here there was no story to tell, except the true one. That was why he raised his palpitating throat and fluttered his heavily lidded eye. He was the virgin, frightened and alone, ready to die rather than sacrifice his tattered virtue. And what did that make her? The beast, of course. She was the beast. No sooner thought than felt. She sensed her body growing larger and larger still. Her bloodstream ran colder than a shark's. A furnace flared up in her belly. In front of her, Hobart was shrinking. The dragon skin fell away from him in silky folds, and he was revealed naked and white, a human male covered in wounds, a chaste knight at the end of a weary road, bereft of strength or certitude. She had claimed the skin he'd lost. She felt it solidify around her, its armor glittering. The size of her body was a joy to her. She exulted in a way it felt to be so dangerous and so impossible. This was how she truly dreamed of herself. This was the real Susanna. She was a dragon. With the lesson learned, what was she to do? Finish the story as the man before her wished? Burn him? Swallow him? Looking down at his insipidity from her rearing height, smelling the dirt off him, the sweat off him. She could easily find it in her heart to do her dragon's duty and devour. It would be easy. She moved toward him, her shadow engulfing him. He was weeping and smiling up at her with gratitude. She opened her vast jaws. Her breath singed his hair. She would cook him and swallow him in one swift motion. But she was not quick enough. As she was about to devour him, she was distracted by voices nearby. Was there somebody else in the grove? The sound certainly belonged in these pages. They were far from human, though there were words attempting to surface through the barking and grunting. Pig, dog, man a combination of all three, and all panicking. The night Hobart opened his eyes, and there was something new in them, something besides tears and fatigue. He, too, had heard the voices, and hearing them he was reminded of the place that lay beyond these wild woods. The dragon's moment of triumph was already sliding away. She roared her frustration, but there was nothing to be done. She felt herself shedding her scales, dwindling from the mythical to the particular while Hobart's scarred body fluttered like a flame in a breeze and went out. Her instant of questioning would surely cost her dearly. In failing to finish the story, to satisfy her victim's desire for death, she'd given him fresh motive for hatred. What change might it have wrought in Hobart to have dreamed himself devoured? To have made a second womb in the worm's belly until he was born back into the world? Too late, damn it, far too late. The pages could contain them no longer. Leaving their confrontation unfinished, they broke from the words in a burst of punctuation. They didn't leave the din of the animals behind them. It grew louder as the darkness of the wild woods lifted. Her only thought was for the book. She felt it in her hands once more and took fiercer hold of it. But Hobart had the same idea. As the room appeared around them in all its solidity, she found his fingers clawing at hers, tearing at her skin in his eagerness to claim the prize back. You should have killed me she heard him murmur. She glanced up at his face. He looked even sicklier than the night he'd been, sweat running down his sallow cheeks, gaze desperate. Then he seemed to realize himself, and the eyes grew arctic. Somebody was beating on the other side of the door, from which the pain cacophony of animals still came. Wait! 
Hobart yelled to his visitors, whoever they were. As he shouted, he took one hand from the book and drew a gun from the inside of his jacket, digging the muzzle into Susanna's abdomen. Let the book go or I'll kill you. She had no choice but to comply. The menstruum would not be swift enough to incapacitate him before he pulled the trigger. As her hand slipped from the volume, however, the door was thrown open, and all thought of books was eclipsed by what stood on the threshold. Once this quartet had been among the pride of Hobart's squad, the smartest, the hardest, but their night of drinking and seduction had unbuttoned more than their trousers. It had undone their minds as well. It was as if the splendor Susanna had first seen on Lord Street, the halos that sainted human and seer kind alike, had somehow been drawn inside them, for the skin of their limbs and faces was swollen and raw, bubbles of darkness scurrying around their anatomies like rats under sheets. In their panic at this disease, they'd clawed their clothes to tatters, their torsos shone with sweat and blood, and from their throats came the cacophony that had called the dragon and the knight out of the book a bestiality that was echoed in a dozen horrid details. The way this one's face had swollen to lend him a snout, the way another's hands were fat as paws. This, she presumed, was how the seer kind had opposed the occupation of their homeland. They'd feign passivity to seduce the invading army into their raptures, and this nightmare menagerie was the result. Apt as it was, she was appalled. One of the pack now staggered into the room, his lips and forehead swollen to the brink of bursting. He was clearly trying to address Hobart, but all his spellbound palate could produce was the complaint of a cat having its neck wrung. Hobart had no intention of deciphering the mules, but instead leveled his gun at the wreckage shambling toward him. Come no closer, he warned. The man, spittle running from his open mouth, made a second incoherent appeal. Get out, was Hobart's response. He took a step toward the quartet. The leader retreated, as did those in the doorway. Not for the gun's sake, Susanna thought, but because Hobart was their master. These new anatomies only confirmed what their training had long ago taught them, that they were unthinking animals enthralled to the law. Out! said Hobart again. They were backing off along the corridor now, their din subdued by their fear of Hobart. In a matter of moments his attention would no longer be diverted, Susanna knew. He'd turn on her again, and the slim advantage gained by this interruption would have been squandered. She had to let her instinct bleed. She might have no other opportunity. Seizing the moment, she ran at Hobart and snatched the book from his hand. He shouted out and glanced her way, his gun still keeping the howling quartet at bay. With his eye off them, the creatures set up their racket afresh. There's no way out, Hobart said to her, except by this door. Maybe you'd like to go that way? The creatures clearly sensed that something was in the air and redoubled their din. It was like feeding time at the zoo. She'd not get two steps down the passage before they were upon her. Hobart had her trapped. At that realization she felt the menstruum rise in her, coming with breath-snatching suddenness. Hobart knew instantly she was gathering strength. He crossed quickly to the door and slammed it on the howling breed outside, then turned on her again. We saw some things, didn't we? he said. But it's a story you won't live to tell. He aimed the gun at her face. It wasn't possible to analyze what happened next. Perhaps he fired and the shot miraculously went wide, shattering the window behind her. Whatever, she felt the night air invading the room, and the next moment the menstruum was bathing her from head to foot, turning her on her heel, and she was running toward the window with no time to consider the sense of this escape route, until she was up on the sill and hurling herself out. The window was three stories up. But it was too late for such practicalities, she was committed to the leap or fall or flight. The menstruum scooped her up, throwing its strength against the wall of the house opposite and letting her slide from window to roof on its cool back. It wasn't true flight, but it felt like the real thing. The street reeled beneath her as she tumbled on solid air to meet the eaves of the other house, only to be scooped up a second time and carried over the roof, Hobart shouts diminishing behind her. She could not be held aloft for long, of course, but it was an exhilarating ride while it lasted. She slid helter-skelter down another roof, catching sight in that moment of a streak of dawn light between the hills, then over gables and chimney stacks and down, swooping into a square where the birds were already tuning up for a day. As she flew down, they scattered, startled by the twist evolution had taken to produce such a bird as this. 
Her landing must have reassured them that there was much design work still to do. She skidded across the paving stones, the menstruum cushioning the worst of the impact, and came to a halt inches from a mosaic wall. Shaking and faintly nauseous, she stood up. The entire flight had probably lasted no more than twenty seconds, but already she heard voices raising the alarm in an adjacent street. Clutching Mimi's gift, she slipped from the square and out of the township by a route that took her once in a circle and twice almost threw her into the arms of her pursuers. Every step of the way she discovered a new bruise, but she was at least alive and wiser for the night's adventures. Life and wisdom. What more could anybody ask? Chapter 9 The Fire The day and night that Susanna spent in Nonsuch and in the wild woods stalking Hobart took Cal and De Bono to no less remarkable places. They too had their griefs and revelations. They too came closer to death than either wanted to come again. Upon parting from her, they'd resumed their journey to the firmament in silence, until out of nowhere De Bono had said, Do you love her? Oddly enough, that very thought had been on Cal's mind, but he hadn't replied to the question. It had frankly embarrassed him. You damn fool, De Bono said. Why are you cuckoo so afraid of your feelings? She's worth loving. Even I can see that. So why don't you say it? Cal grunted. De Bono was right, but it rankled to be lectured on the matter by someone younger. You're afraid of her, is that it? De Bono said. The remark added insult to injury. Christ, no, Cal said. Why the fuck should I be afraid of her? She's got powers, said De Bono, taking off his spectacles and surveying the terrain ahead. Most women have, of course. That's why Starbrook wouldn't have them in the field. It threw him off balance. And what have we got? Cal asked, kicking a stone ahead of him. We've got our pricks. Starbrook again? De Bono, came the reply, and the boy laughed. I tell you what, he said. I know this place where we could go. No detours, said Cal. What's an hour or two, said De Bono. Have you ever heard of Venus Mountain? I said no detours, De Bono. If you want to go, then go. Jesus, you're boring, De Bono sighed. I just might leave you to it. I'm not much enjoying your damn fool questions, either, Cal said. So if you want to go pick flowers, do it. Just point me to the firmament. De Bono fell silent. They walked on. When they did start talking again, De Bono began to parade his knowledge of the fugue, more for the pleasure of belittling his fellow traveler than out of any genuine desire to inform. Twice, in the middle of a diatribe, Cal dragged them into hiding as one of Hobart's patrols came within sighting distance of them. On the second occasion, they were pinned down for two hours, while the squad got progressively drunker within yards of their hiding place. When they finally moved on, they progressed much more slowly. Their cramp-ridden limbs felt leaden. They were hungry, thirsty, and irritated by each other's company. Worst of all, dusk was creeping on. Just how far is it from here? Cal wanted to know. Once, looking down on the fugue from Mimi's wall, the confusion of its landscape had promised unending adventure. Now, immersed in that confusion, he would have given his eye teeth for a good map. It's quite a distance yet, De Bono replied. Do you know where the hell we are? De Bono's lip curled. Of course. Name it. Huh? Name it. I'll be damned if I will. You just have to trust me, Cuckoo. The wind had gotten up in the last half hour, and now it brought with it the sound of cries, which halted the escalating war of words between them. I smell a bonfire burning, De Bono said. It was true. Besides its burden of pain, the wind brought the scent of burning wood. De Bono was already bounding off in search of its source. Nothing would have given Cal more satisfaction at that moment than leaving the rope dancer to his own devices, but, much as he doubted De Bono's value as a guide, he was better than nothing. Cal followed him through the gathering darkness up a small ridge. From there, across a space of fields littered with arches, they had a fine view of the fire. What looked to be a small copse was burning lustily, the flames fanned by the wind. On the outskirts of this sizable blaze a number of cars were parked, their owners, more of Shadwell's army of deliverance, running riot. Bastards, said De Bono, as several of them hounded down a victim and laid into him with cudgels and boots. Cuckoo bastards! It's not just my people, Cal began. But before he could finish the defense of his tribe, the words died on his tongue, 
as he recognized the place that was being destroyed in front of his eyes. This was no wood. The trees weren't arbitrarily scattered, but planted in ordered avenues. Once, beneath the awning of those trees, he'd spoken Mad Mooney's verses. Now the orchard of Lemuel Lowe was ablaze from end to end. He started down the slope toward the conflagration. Where are you going? Debono asked him. Calhoun? What do you think you're doing? Debono came after him and took hold of his arm. Calhoun, listen to me. Let me alone, Cal said, attempting to throw Debono off. In the violence of that attempt, the soil of the incline gave way beneath his heel, and he lost balance, taking Debono with him. They slid down the hill, dirt and stone showering them, and came to a halt in a waist-deep ditch of stagnant water at the bottom. Cal began to haul himself out the other side, but Debono had hold of his shirt. You can't do anything, Mooney, he said. Get the fuck off me. Look, I'm sorry about the cuckoo remark, right? We breed vandals, too. Forget it, said Cal, his eyes still on the fire. He detached Debono's hand. I know this place, he said. I can't just let it burn. He pulled himself up out of the ditch and started toward the blaze. He'd kill the bastards who'd done this, whoever they were. Kill them and call it justice. It's too late, Debono called after him. You can't help. There was truth in what the youth said. Tomorrow there'd be nothing left of the orchard but ashes. Still, he couldn't bring himself to turn his back on the spot where he'd first tasted the fugue's raptures. Vaguely aware that Debono was padding after him, and completely indifferent to the fact he had it on. As the scene before him became clearer, he realized that the prophet's troops, the word flattered them, it was a rabble were not going unresisted. In several places around the fire, figures were locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But the orchard's defenders were easy meat for the fire-raisers, for whom these barbarities were little more than sport. They'd come into the fugue armed with weapons that could decimate the seer kind in hours. Even as Cal watched, he saw one of the kind felled with a pistol shot. Somebody went to the wounded man's aid, but was in her turn brought down. The soldiers went from body to body to see that the job was done. The first of the victims was not dead. He raised his hand toward his executioner, who pointed his gun at the man's head and fired. A spasm of nausea convulsed Cal's system, as the smell of cooking flesh mingled with the smoke. He couldn't control his revulsion. His knees buckled, and he fell to the ground, retching on his empty stomach. At that moment his misery seemed complete, the wet clothes icy on his spine, the taste of his stomach in his throat the paradise orchard burning nearby. The horrors the fugue was showing him were as profound as its visions had been elevated. He could fall no further. Come away, Cal. DeBono's hand was on his shoulder. He put a handful of freshly torn grass in front of Cal. Wipe your face, he said softly. There's nothing to be done here. Cal pressed the grass beneath his nose, inhaling its cool sweetness. The nausea was passing. He chanced one more look up at the burning orchard. His eyes were watering, and at first glance he couldn't trust what they now told him. He wiped them with the back of his hand, sniffing. Then he looked again, and there, moving through the smoke in front of the fire, he saw Lem. He spoke the man's name. Who? said Debono. Cal was already getting up, though his legs were jittery. There, Cal said, pointing toward Low. The orchard keeper was crouching beside one of the bodies, his hand extended to the face of the corpse. Was he closing the dead man's eyes, offering a blessing as he did so? Cal had to make his presence known, had to speak to the man, even if it was just to say that he too had witnessed the horrors here, and that they wouldn't go unrevenged. He turned to De Bono. The blaze reflected in the rope dancer's spectacles hid his eyes, but it was clear from the way his face was set that what he'd seen had not left him untouched. Stay here, Cal said. I have to speak to Lem. You're insane, Mooney, DeBono said. Probably. He began back toward the fire, calling Lem's name. The rabble seemed to have tired of their hunt. Several had returned to their cars. Another was pissing into the fire, yet others were simply watching the blaze, stupefied by drink and destruction. Lem had done with his blessings, and was walking away from the remains of his orchard. Cal called his name again, but the sound of the fire drowned it out. He began to pick up his pace and as he did so, Lem caught sight of him from the corner of his eye. 
He seemed not to recognize Cal, however. Instead, alarmed by the approaching figure, he turned and started to run. Again Cal yelled his name, and this time drew the man's attention. He stopped running and glanced back, squinting through the smoke and smut. Lem, it's me! Cal yelled. It's Mooney! Lowe's grimy face was not capable of a smile, but he opened his arms in welcome to Cal, who crossed the last yards between them, fearful that at any moment the curtain of smoke would part them again. It didn't. They embraced like brothers. Oh, my poet, said Lowe, his eyes reddened with tears and smoke. What a place to find you. I told you I wouldn't forget, said Cal. Didn't I say that? You did, by God. Why did they do it, Lem? Why did they burn it down? They didn't, Lem replied. I did. You? You think I'd give those bastards the pleasure of my fruit? But, Lem, the trees, all those trees. Lo was digging in his pockets and brought out handfuls of the jewed pears. Many were bruised and broken, sap glistening as it ran over Lo's fingers. Their perfume pierced the filthy air, bringing back memories of lost times. There's seeds in every one of them, poet, Lem said, and in every seed there's a tree. I'll find another place to plant. They were brave words, but he sobbed even as he spoke them. They won't defeat us, Calhoun, he said. Whatever God's name they come in, we won't kneel to them. You mustn't, said Cal, or everything's lost. As he spoke, he saw Lowe's gaze move off his face toward the rabble at the cars. We should be going, he said, stuffing the fruit back into his pocket. Will you come with me? I can't, Lem. Well, I taught your verses to my daughters, he said. I remembered them as you remembered me. They're not mine, Cal said. They're my grandfather's. They belong to us all now, Lowe said. Planted in good ground. Suddenly a shot. Cal turned. The three fire watchers had seen them and were coming their way. All were armed. Lowe snatched hold of Cal's hand for an instant and squeezed it by way of farewell. Then contact was broken as more shots followed on the first. Lowe was heading off into the darkness, away from the light of the fire. But the ground was uneven, and he fell after only a few steps. Cal went after him as the gunmen began a further round of shots. Get away from me, Lowe shouted. For God's sake, run! Lowe was scrabbling to pick up the fruit that he'd dropped from his pocket. As Cal reached him, one of the gunmen got lucky. A shot found Lowe. He cried out and clutched his side. The gunmen were almost upon their targets now. They'd given up firing to have better sport at close range. As they came within a half a dozen yards, however, the leader was felled by a missile hurled from the smoke. It struck his head, opening a substantial wound. He toppled, blinded by blood. Cal had time to see the weapon that had brought the man down, and recognize it as a radio. Then de Bono was weaving through the murky air toward the gunman. They heard him coming. He was yelling like a wild man. A shot was fired in his direction, but went well wide. He threw himself past the hunters and ran off in the direction of the fire. The leader, his hand clamped to his head, was staggering to his feet, ready to give chase. De Bono's tactics, though they'd distracted the executioners, were as good as suicidal. The gunmen had him trapped against the wall of burning trees. Cal caught sight of him, pelting through the smoke toward the fire, the killers in howling pursuit. A volley of shots was fired. He dodged them like the dancer he was. But there was no dodging the inferno ahead. Cal saw him glance around once to take in the sight of his pursuers, then— Idiot that he was, he plunged into the fire. Most of the trees were now no more than burning pillars, but the ground itself was a firewalker's heaven, hot ash and charcoal. The air shimmered with the heat, corrupting de Bono's figure until it was lost between the trees. There was no time to mourn him. His bravery had earned them a reprieve, but it would not last long. Cal turned back to Abe Lemuel. The man had gone, however, leaving a splash of blood and a few fallen fruit to mark the place he'd been. Back at the fire, the gunmen were still waiting to mow de Bono down should he re-emerge. Cal had time to get to his feet and study the conflagration for any sign of the rope dancer. There was none. Then he backed away from the pyre and took off toward the slope on which he and de Bono had fought. As he did so, a vague hope rose in him. He decided to change his route and made a run that took him around to the other side of the orchard. The air was clearer here. The wind was carrying the smoke in the opposite direction. 
He ran along the edge of the orchard, hoping against hope that maybe de Bono had outpaced the heat. Halfway along the flank of the fire, his horrified eyes found a pair of burning shoes. He kicked them over, then searched for their owner. It was only when he turned his back on the flames that he saw the figure standing in a field of high grass, two hundred yards from the orchard. Even at that distance the blonde head was recognizable. So as he drew closer was the smug smile. He'd lost his eyebrows and his lashes, and his hair was badly singed. But he was alive and well. How did you do that? Cal asked him when he got within speaking distance of the fellow. De Bono shrugged. I'd rather firewalk than rope dance any day of the week, he said. I'd be dead without you, Cal said. Thank you. De Bono was clearly uncomfortable with Cal's gratitude. He shooed it away with a wave of his hand, then turned his back on the fire and waded off through the grass, leaving Cal to follow. Do you know where we're going? Cal called after him. It seemed they were striking off in another direction to the one they'd been following when they'd first come upon the fire. But he couldn't have sworn to it. De Bono offered a reply, but the wind blew it away. And Cal was too weary to ask a second time. Chapter 10 Unearthly Delights 1. The journey became a torment thereafter. Events at the orchard had drained Cal of what few reserves of strength he could still lay claim to. The muscles in his legs twitched as if they were about to go into spasm. The vertebrae in his lower back seemed to have lost their cartilage and were grinding against each other. He tried not to think of what would happen if and when they finally reached the firmament. In the best of conditions, he and De Bono would scarcely be Shadwell's equal. Like this, they'd be fodder. The occasional wonders the starlight had uncovered. A ring of stones linked by bands of whispering fog. What appeared to be a family of dolls, their identical faces pale, smiling beatifically from behind a silent waterfall. To these he gave no more than a cursory glance. The only sight that could have brought joy to his lips at that moment was a feather mattress. But even the mysteries dwindled after a time as De Bono led him up a dark hillside with a soft wind moving in the grass around their feet. The moon was rising through a bank of cumulus, making a ghost of De Bono as he forged on up the steep slope. Cal followed like a lamb, too weary to question their route. But by degrees he became aware that the sighs he heard were not entirely the voice of the wind. There was an oblique music in them, a tune that came and fled again. It was De Bono who finally came to a halt and said, do you hear them, Cal? Yes, I hear them. They know they've got visitors. Is this the firmament? No, said De Bono softly. The firmament's for tomorrow. We're too tired for that. Tonight we stay here. Where's here? Can't you guess? Don't you smell the air? It was lightly perfumed, honeysuckle and night-blooming jasmine. And feel the earth? The ground was warm beneath his feet. This, my friend, is Venus Mountain. Two. He should have known better than to trust De Bono. For all his heroics, the fellow was wholly unreliable, and now they'd lost precious time. Cal glanced behind him to see if the route they'd come was discernible, but no. The moon had slipped into the cloud bank for a little while, and the mountainside was in darkness. When he looked back, De Bono had vanished. Hearing laughter a little way off, Cal called his guide's name. The laughter came again. It sounded too light to be De Bono, but he couldn't be certain. Where are you? He asked, but there was no reply, so he went in the direction of the laughter. As he advanced, he stepped into a passage of warm air. Startled, he retreated, but the tropical warmth came with him, the honey scent now strong in his nostrils. It made him feel lightheaded. His aching legs threatened to fold beneath him from the sheer swooning pleasure of it. A little further up the incline he saw another figure, surely that of De Bono, moving in the gloom. Again he called the man's name, and this time he was granted a reply. De Bono turned and said, Don't fret, Cuckoo. His voice had taken on a dreamy quality. We've got no time, Cal protested. Can't do... can't do anything. De Bono's voice came and went like a weak radio signal. Can't do anything tonight. Except love. The last word faded, and so did De Bono, melting into the darkness. Cal about turned. He was certain that De Bono had been speaking from farther up the mountain, which meant that if he turned his back on the spot and walked, he'd be returning the way they'd come. 
The warmth went with him as he about turned. I'll get a new guide, he vaguely thought. Get a guide and find a firmament. He had an appointment to keep with somebody. Who was it? His thoughts were going the way of de Bono's voice. Oh, yes, Susanna. At the mental formulation of her name, the warmth somehow conspired with his limbs to draw him down to the ground. He wasn't sure how it happened. He didn't trip. He wasn't pushed. But in an instant, he had his head on the ground, and oh, the comfort of it. It was like returning to a lover's bed on a morning of frost. He stretched out, indulging his weary limbs, telling himself he'd just lie here long enough to gain some strength for the trials ahead. He might well have fallen asleep, but that he heard his name called. Not Cal, nor even Calhoun, but... Mooney! It was not Bono's voice, but a woman's. Susanna? He tried to sit up, but he was so heavy, so laden with the dirt of his journey, he couldn't move. He wanted to slough the weight off like a snake its tired skin, but he lay there unable to move a finger joint, while the voice called him and called him, fading as it went searching for him in higher regions. He so wanted to follow it, and without warning, he felt that yearning realized as his clothes fell away from him and he began to travel over the grass, his belly to the earth's belly. How he was transported he wasn't certain, for he felt no movement in his limbs and his breath was not quickened by effort. Indeed, he felt so removed from sensation, it was as if he'd left body and breath behind him with his clothes. One thing he had brought with him, light, a pale, cool light that illuminated the grass and the small mountain flowers nestling there, a light that traveled so close to him it might have been of him. A few yards from where he journeyed, he saw de Bono lying asleep on the grass, his mouth open like a fish's mouth. He moved toward the sleeper to question him. But before he reached the man, something else drew his attention. Mere yards from where de Bono lay, there were shafts of light springing up from the dark ground. He moved over his companion's body, his light almost stirring de Bono, then on toward this new mystery. It was easily solved. There were several holes in the earth. He went to the lip of the nearest and peered down. The entire mountain, he now saw, was hollow. Below him was a vast cavern with brightnesses moving in it. These were, presumably, the presences of which de Bono had spoken. Now the suspicion that he'd left his body behind him somewhere along the way was confirmed, for he slipped down the hole, which would not have been wide enough to allow access to his head, never mind his shoulders, and fell into the upper air of the cavern. There he hovered and gazed on the ritual being performed below. At first sight, the performers seemed to be spheres of luminous gas, perhaps forty of them, some large, some minute their colors ranging from cool pastels through to livid yellows and reds. But as he drifted down from the dome of the cavern, claimed not by gravity but by the simple desire to know, he realized that the globes were far from blank. Within their confines forms were appearing like ghosts in their perfect geometries. They were ephemeral, these visions, lasting seconds at most. Before pale clouds veiled them and new configurations took their place, but they lingered long enough for him to make sense of them. In several of the spheres he saw shapes that resembled human fetuses, their heads vast, their thread-like limbs wrapped about their bodies. No sooner seen than gone, and in their place perhaps a splash of bright blue that made the globe into a vast eyeball. In another the gases were dividing and dividing like a cell in love with itself. In a third the clouds had become a blizzard, in the depths of which he saw a forest and a hill. He was certain these entities were aware of his being in the cavern, though none broke the regime of their motion to welcome him. He was not offended at this. Their dance was elaborate, and it would cause no little confusion if one of them were to move off its course. There was an exquisite inevitability about their motion, some of the spheres repeatedly moving within a hair's breadth of collision, then swinging wide an instant before disaster struck, others proceeding in families that described complex paths around each other while simultaneously moving in a great circle that was pivoted at the center of the cavern. There was more to fascinate him here than the tranquil majesty of the dance, however, for twice in the flux of one of the larger spheres he glimpsed an image which carried an extraordinary erotic charge. A naked woman, her limbs defying all the laws of anatomy, was floating on a pillow of cloud, her position one of pure sexual display. As Cal witnessed her, she was gone, leaving him with the image of her invitation, her lips, her cunt, her buttocks. There was nothing whorish in her exhibition, 
the crime would have been in shame, which had no place in his charmed circle. The presences were too in love with being for such nonsense. They loved death, too, and as unequivocally. One sphere had a corpse in its midst, rotted and crawling with flies, disclosed with the same delight as its companion glories. But death did not interest Cal. The woman did. Can't do anything tonight, Tibono had said. Except love. And Cal knew it now to be true. But love as he'd known it above ground was not appropriate here. The woman in the sphere needed no sweet talk. Her company was offered freely. The question was, how did he express his desire? He'd left his erection behind on Venus Mountain. He needn't have concerned himself. She already knew his thoughts. As his eyes found her a third time, her glance seemed to draw him down into the midst of the dance. He found himself executing a slow, slow somersault and settling into place beside his mistress. As he attained this spot, he realized just what function he had here. The voice on the mountain had called him Mooney, and that name had not been chosen in vain. He had come from above as light, as moonlight, and here he had found his orbit in a dance of planets and satellites. Perhaps, of course, this was simply his interpretation. Perhaps the imperatives of this system pertained as much to love and snowstorms as to astronomy. In the face of such miracles, conjecture was fruitless. Tonight, being was all. The presences made another circuit, and he lost in the sheer delight of this preordained journey, tumbling over and over. No heels or head here, only the pleasure of motion. Was momentarily distracted from the woman he'd seen. But as his orbit took him out in a wide arc, he once more set eyes on the planet she haunted. She emerged even as he watched, only to be lost in cloud again. Did he perform the same rites for her, turning from humanity to abstraction and back again at the blossoming of a milky cloud? He knew so little of himself, this Mooney, in his singular orbit. All he could hope to comprehend of what he was, he had to discover from the spheres upon whose faces he shed his borrowed light. That was perhaps the condition of moons. It was enough. He knew in that moment how moons made love. By bewitching the nights of planets, by stirring their oceans, by blessing the hunter and the harvester, a hundred ways that needed only the unbound anatomies of light and space. As he thought this thought, the woman opened to bathe in him, to spread her cunt and let his light pleasure her. Entering, he felt the same heat, the same possessiveness, the same vanity, as had ever marked the animal he'd been. But in place of labor there was ease, in place of ever-imminent loss, sustenance, in place of urgency, the sense that this could last forever, or rather that a hundred human lifetimes were a moment in the span of moons, and his ride on this Empyrean carousel had made a nonsense of time. At that thought, a terrible sense of poignancy swept over him. Had all he'd left above on the mountain withered and died, while these constellations moved steadily about their business? He looked toward the center of the system, the hub about which they all described their paths, eccentric or regular, distant or intimate. And there, in the place from which he drew his light, he saw himself, sleeping on a hillside. I'm dreaming, he thought, and suddenly rose, like a bubble in a bottle, less moon than moony. The dome of the cavern, which he vaguely realized resembled the inside of a skull, was dark above him, and for an instant he thought he'd be dashed to death against it. But at the last moment the air grew bright around him, and he woke, staring up at a sky streaked with light. It was dawn on Venus Mountain. 3. Of the dream he'd had, one part was true. He had sloughed off two skins like a snake. One, his clothes lay scattered around him in the grass. The other, the accrued grime of his adventures, had been bathed away in the night, either by dew or a fall of rain. Whichever, he was quite dry now. The warmth of the ground he lay upon, that part also had been no dream, had dried him off and left him sweet-smelling. He felt nourished, too, and strong. He sat up. Balm de Bono was already on his feet, scratching his balls and staring up at the sky. A blissful combination. The grass had left an imprint on his back and buttocks. Did they please you? He said, cocking an eye at Cal. Please me? The presences? Did they give you sweet dreams? Yes, they did. De Bono grinned lewdly. Want to tell me about it? He said. I don't know how to. 
Oh, spare me the modesty. No, it's just I... I dreamed I was... The moon. You did what? I dreamed... I bring you to the nearest thing we've got to a whorehouse, and you dream about being the moon? You're a strange man, Calhoun. He picked up his vest and put it on, shaking his head at Cal's bizarreness. What did you dream of? Cal inquired. I'll tell you one of these times, said De Bono, when you're old enough. 4. They dressed in silence, then set off down the gentle slope of the mountain. Chapter 11. A Witness 1. Though the day had dawned well for Susanna with her miraculous escape from Hobart, it had rapidly deteriorated. She'd felt oddly cocooned by night. With the dawn came nameless anxieties, and some she could name. First off, the fact that she'd lost her guide. She had only the roughest idea of the direction in which the firmament lay, so elected to make her way toward the gyre, which was plainly visible at all times, and make what inquiries she could along the route. Her second source of concern, the many signs that events in the fugue were rapidly taking a turn for the worse. A great pall of smoke hung over the valley, and though there had been rain in the night, fires still burned in many places. She came upon several battle sites as she went. In one place a fire-gutted car was perched in a tree like a steel bird, blown there presumably or levitated. She couldn't know what forces had clashed the previous night, nor what weapons had been used, but the struggle had clearly been horrendous. Shadwell had divided the people of this once tranquil land with his prophetic talk, setting brother against brother. Those conflicts were traditionally the bloodiest. It should have come as no surprise, then, to see bodies left where they'd fallen, for foxes and birds to pick at, denied the simple courtesy of burial. If there was any sliver of comfort to be drawn from these scenes, it was that Shadwell's invasion had not gone undefied. The destruction of Capra's house had been a massive miscalculation on his part. What chance he'd had of taking the few with words alone had been squandered in that one tyrannical gesture. He could not now hope to win these territories by stealth and seduction. It was armed suppression or nothing. Having seen for herself what damage the Sirkind's raptures were capable of, she nurtured some faint hope that any such suppression might be subverted. But what damage, perhaps irreversible, would be done to the few while its inhabitants' freedom was being won? These woods and meadows weren't meant to host atrocities. Their innocence of such horrors was a part of their power to enchant. It was at such a spot, once untainted, now all too familiar with death, that she encountered the first living person in her travels that day. It was one of those mysterious snatches of architecture of which the few could boast several. In this case, a dozen pillars ranged around a shallow pool. On top of one of the pillars sat a stringy middle-aged man in a shabby coat, a large pair of binoculars around his neck, who looked up from the notebook in which he was scribbling as she approached. "'Looking for someone?' he inquired. No. They're all dead, anyway, he said dispassionately. See? The pavement around the pool was splashed with blood. Those that had shed it lay face up at the bottom of the water, their wounds white. Your handiwork? she asked him. Me? Good God, no. I'm just a witness. And what army are you with? I'm with nobody, she said. I'm on my own. This he wrote down. I don't necessarily believe you he said as he wrote. But a good witness sets down what he sees and hears, even if he doubts it. What have you seen? she asked him. Confusion, he said. People everywhere, and nobody sure who was who, and bloodletting the like of which I never thought to see here. He peered at her. You're not seer kind, he said. No. Just wandered in by chance, did you? Something like that. Well, I'd wander back out again if I were you. Nobody's safe. A lot of folks have packed their bags and gone into the kingdom rather than be slaughtered. So who's left fighting? Wild men? I know I shouldn't venture an opinion, but that's the way it looks to me. Barbarians raging around. Even as he spoke, she heard shouting a little way off. With their breakfast done, the wild men were at work already. What can you see from up there? she asked him. A lot of ruins, he said, and occasional glimpses of the factions. He put his binoculars to his eyes and made a sweep of the terrain, pausing here and there as he caught sight of some interesting detail. There's been a battalion out of none such in the last hour, he said, looking much the worse for wear. There's rebels over toward the steps. 
and another band to the northwest of here. The prophet left the firmament a little while ago. I can't say exactly when my watch was stolen, and there's several squads of his evangelists preceding him to clear the way. The way where? To the gyre, of course. The gyre? My guess is that was the prophet's target from the outset. He's not a prophet, said Susanna. He's called Shadwell. Shadwell? Go on, write that down. He's a cuckoo and a salesman. You know this for certain, the man said. Tell me all. No time, Susanna replied, much to his aggravation. I've got to get to him. Oh, so he's a friend. Far from it, she said, her eyes straying back to the bodies in the pool. You'll never get near his throat if that's what you're hoping, the man told her. He's guarded day and night. I'll find a way, she said. You don't know what he's capable of. If he's a cuckoo and he tries stepping into the gyre, that'll be the end of us. That I do know. Still, it'll give me a last chapter, eh? And who'll be left to read it? Two. She left him up on his pillar like some lonely penitent, pondering the remark. Her thoughts were grimmer for the conversation. Despite the presence of the menstruum in her system, she knew very little of how the forces that had made the weave world worked but it didn't take genius to see that for Shadwell to trespass on the rapturous ground of the gyre would prove cataclysmic. He was all that rarefied region, and its makers despised. He was corruption. Perhaps the gyre could destroy itself rather than give him access to its secrets, and if it ceased to exist, wouldn't the fugue, the unity of which was preserved by the power there, be lost to the maelstrom? That, she feared, was what the witness had meant with his pronouncements. If Shadwell entered the gyre, the world would end. There'd been no sign of animal or bird life since she'd left the vicinity of the pool. The trees and bushes were deserted. The undergrowth was hushed. She summoned the menstruum up until it brimmed in her, ready to be used in her defense, should the occasion arise. There was no time left for niceties now. She would kill anyone who tried to prevent her from getting to Shadwell. A noise from behind a partially demolished wall drew her attention. She stood her ground and challenged the observer to make himself known. There was no reply forthcoming. I won't ask you again, she said. Who's there? At this there was a fall of brick shards, and a boy of four or five, naked but for socks and dust, stood up and clambered over the rubble toward her. Oh, my God, she said, her heart going out to the child. In the instant her defenses fell, there was movement to right and left of her, and she found herself surrounded by a ragged selection of armed men. The child's forlorn expression dropped as one of the soldiers summoned him to his side. The man put a grimy hand through the boy's hair and gave him a grim smile of approval. Name yourself, someone demanded of her. She had no idea which side these men were on. If they were of Shadwell's army, admitting her name would be an instant death sentence. But desperate as things were, she couldn't bring herself to unleash the menstruum against men and a child, whose allegiance she didn't even know. Shoot her, the boy said. She's with them. Don't you dare, said a voice at her back. I know her. She turned as her savior spoke her name, and there, of all people, was Nimrod. The last time they'd met he'd been a convert to Shadwell's unholy crusade. All talk of glorious tomorrows. Time and circumstance had humbled him. He was a picture of wretchedness, his clothes tattered, his face full of hurt. Don't blame me, he said, before she could even speak. I don't, she said. There'd been times she'd cursed him, but they were history now. Truly, I don't. Help me, he said suddenly, and came to her. She hugged him. He concealed his tears behind their embrace until the others left off watching the reunion and slipped back into hiding. Only then did he ask, have you seen Jericho? He's dead, she said. The sisters killed him. He drew away from her and covered his face with his hands. It wasn't your fault, she told him. I knew, he said quietly. As soon as things went sour, I knew something terrible had happened to him. You can't be blamed for not seeing the truth. Shad was a brilliant performer, and he was selling what people wanted to hear. Wait said Nimrod, looking up at her. Are you telling me Shadwell's the prophet? Yes, I am. He made a small shake of the head. A cuckoo, he said, his tone still half disbelieving. A cuckoo. 
It doesn't mean he isn't strong, Susanna cautioned. He's got raptures all his own. You've got to come back to the camp, Nimrod said with fresh urgency. Talk to our commander before we leave for the gyre. Make it quick, she said. He was already away, leading her into the rockier terrain that concealed the rebels. There's only me and Apolline left alive, he said as they went. From the first wakened, the rest are gone. My Lilia, then Freddy Camel, now Jericho. Where's Apolline now? She went out into the kingdom, the last I heard. What about Cal? Is he with you? We were going to meet up at the firmament, but Shadwell's already on his way to the gyre. Which is as far as he'll get, Nimrod said. Whatever raptures he's stolen, he's still just a man. And men bleed. So do we all, she thought, but left the thought unspoken. Chapter 12 One Fell Swoop 1. Nimrod's brave talk was undercut by what she found at the camp. It was more like a hospital than a military establishment. Well over three-quarters of the fifty or so soldiers, men and women, who were gathered in the shelter of the rocks, had sustained some wound or other. Some were still capable of fighting, but many were clearly at death's door, tended with soft words in their failing minutes. In one corner of the camp, out of sight of the dying, a dozen bodies were laid beneath makeshift shrouds. In another, a cache of captured armaments was being sorted through. It made a chilling display. Machine guns, flamethrowers, grenades. On this evidence, Shadwell's followers had come prepared to destroy their homeland if it resisted their deliverance. Against these horrors and the zeal with which they were wielded, the profoundest raptures were a frail defense. If Nimrod shared her doubts, he chose not to show them, but talked ceaselessly of the previous night's victories as if to keep a telling silence at bay. We even took prisoners, he boasted, leading Susanna to a muddy pit among the boulders, where maybe a dozen captives sat bound at ankles and wrists, guarded by a girl with a machine gun. They were a forlorn mob. Some were wounded, all were distressed, weeping and muttering to themselves as though Shadwell's lies no longer blinded them, and they were waking up to the iniquity of what they'd done. She pitied them and their self-contempt. She knew all too well the powers of beguilement Shadwell possessed. In her time she'd almost succumb to them herself. These were his victims, not his allies. They'd been sold a lie they'd had no power to refuse. Now disabused of his teachings, they were left to brood on the blood they'd spilled and despair. Has anybody talked with them? she asked Nimrod. Maybe they've got some grasp of Shadwell's weaknesses. The commander forbade it, said Nimrod. They're diseased. Don't talk nonsense, Susanna replied and climbed down into the pit with the prisoners. Several turned their troubled faces toward her. One, at the sight of a face that bore some sign of lenience, started to sob loudly. I'm not here to accuse you, she told them. I just want to talk with you. At her side, a man with blood-caked features said, Are they going to kill us? No, she told him. Not if I can help it. What happened? Another inquired, his voice slurred and dreamy. Is the prophet coming? Someone tried to shush him, but he rambled on. He must come soon, mustn't he? He must come and take us into Capra's hands. He isn't coming, said Susanna. We know that, said the first prisoner. At least most of us do. We've been cheated. He told us— I know what he told you, Susanna said, and I know how he cheated you. Now you've got to make good the damage by helping me. You can't overthrow him, the man said. He's got powers. Shut your mouth, said one nearby, who was clutching a rosary so tightly his knuckles looked ready to pop. You mustn't say anything against him. He hears. Let him hear, the other spat back. Let him kill me if he chooses. I don't care. He turned back to Susanna. He's got demons with him. I've seen them. He feeds the dead to them. Nimrod, who was standing behind Susanna, listening to this evidence, now spoke up. Demons? he said. You've seen them? No, said the white-faced man. I have, said another. Describe them, Nimrod demanded. It was surely the by-blows the man spoke of, Susanna thought, grown to monstrous proportions. But as the man began to tell what he knew, she was distracted by the sight of a prisoner she hadn't previously noticed, squatting in the filthiest part of the compound, face turned to the rock. It was a woman, to judge by the hair that fell to the middle of her back, 
and she'd not been bound like the rest, simply left to grieve in the dirt. Susanna made her way through the captives toward her. As she approached, she heard mutterings, and saw that the woman had her lips pressed to the stone, and was talking to it as if seeking comfort there. Her supplication faltered as Susanna's shadow fell on the rock, and she turned. It took a heartbeat only for Susanna to see beyond the dried blood and excrement on the face that now looked up toward her. It was Immaculata. On her maimed face was the look of a tragedienne. Her eyes were swollen with tears and brimming now with a fresh flood. Her hair was unbraided and thick with mud. Her breasts were bared for all to see, and in every sinew there was a terrible bewilderment. Nothing of her former authority remained. She was a mad woman squatting in her own shit. Contrary feelings fought in Susanna. Here, trembling before her, was the woman who'd murdered Mimi in her own bed, part architect of the calamities that had overtaken the fugue. The power behind Shadwell's throne, the source of countless deceits and sorrows, the devil's inspiration. Yet she could not feel for Immaculata the hatred she'd felt for Shadwell or Hobart. Was it because the incantatrix had first given her access to the menstruum, albeit unwillingly? Or was it that they were, as Immaculata had always claimed, somehow sisters? Might this under other skies have been her fate to be lost and mad? Don't look at me, the woman said softly. There was no sign of recognition in her bloodshot eyes. Do you know who you are? Susanna asked her. The woman's expression didn't change. After a few moments her answer came. The rock knows, she said. The rock? It'll be sand soon. I told it so because it's true. It'll be sand. The Macalotta took her gaze off her questioner and began to stroke the rock with her open palm. She'd been doing this for some while, Susanna now saw. There were streaks of blood on the stone where she'd rubbed the skin from her palm as if attempting to erase the lines. Why will it be sand? Susanna asked. It must come, said Immaculata. I've seen it, the scourge. It must come, and then we will all be sand. She stroked more furiously. I told the rock. Will you tell me? Immaculata glanced around and then back to the rock. For a little while, Susanna thought the woman had forgotten the questioner until the words came again, haltingly. The scourge must come, she said. Even in its sleep it knows. She stopped wounding her hand. Sometimes it almost wakes, she said. And when it does, we'll all be sand. She laid her cheek against the bloodied rock and made a low sobbing sound. Where's your sister? Susanna said. At this the sobbing faltered. Is she here? I have no sisters, Immaculata said. There was no trace of doubt in her voice. What about Shadwell? Do you remember Shadwell? My sisters are dead. All gone to sand. Everything. Gone to sand. The sobs began again, more mournful than ever. What's your interest in her? Nimrod, who'd been standing at Susanna's shoulder for several seconds, wanted to know. She's just another lunatic. We found her among the corpses. She was eating their eyes. Do you know who she is? Susanna said. Nimrod. That's Immaculata. His face grew slack with shock. Shadwell's mistress. I swear it. You're mistaken, he said. She's lost her mind, but I swear that's who it is. I was face to face with her less than two days ago. So what's happened to her? Shadwell, maybe. The name was echoed softly by the woman at the rock. Whatever happened, she shouldn't be here, not like this. You'd better come speak to the commander. You can tell it all to her. Two. It seemed it was to be a day of reunions. First Nimrod, then the incantatrix, and now, leading this defeated troop, Yolanda Dorr, the woman who'd so vehemently fought the reweaving, back when Capra's house was still standing. She, too, had changed. Gone the strutting confidence of the woman. Her face looked pale and clammy. Her voice and manner were subdued. She wasted no time with courtesies. If you've got something to tell me, spit it out. One of your prisoners, Susanna began. I've no time to hear appeals, came the reply, especially from you. This isn't an appeal. I still won't hear it. You must, and you will, Susanna responded. 
Forget how you feel about me. I don't feel anything, was Yolanda's retort. The council condemned themselves. You were just there to carry their burden for them. If it hadn't been you, it would have been somebody else. This outburst seemed to pain her. She slipped her hand inside her unbuttoned jacket, clearly nursing a wound there. Her fingers came away bloody. Susanna persevered, but more softly. One of your prisoners, she said, is Immaculata. Yolanda looked across at Nimrod. Is that true? It's true, Susanna said. I know her better than any of you. It's her. She's lost, insane maybe. But if we could get some sense from her, we might use her to reach Shadwell. Shadwell? The prophet. They were allies once, him and Immaculata. I won't conspire with corruption like that, Yolanda replied. We'll hang her when the proper time comes. Well, at least let me talk to her. Maybe I can coax something from her. If she's lost her mind, why should we trust a word she says? No. Let her rot. It's a wasted chance. Don't tell me about wasted chances, Yolanda said bitterly. There was clearly no hope of persuading her. We move toward the Madeline in an hour, she stated. If you want to swell our ranks, do so, or else get about your business. This said, she turned her back on them both. Come on, said Nimrod, and took his leave. But Susanna lingered. For what it's worth, she said, I hope we have time to talk when all this is over. Yolanda didn't turn back. Leave me alone, she said. Susanna did just that. 3. For several minutes after Susanna's departure from the prisoner's compound, Immaculata sat in the murk of her forgetfulness. Sometimes she wept. Sometimes she stared at the silent rock in front of her. The violation Shadwell had visited upon her at the firmament, following as it had upon the destruction of her wraith sister, had driven her mind into a wilderness. But she'd not been alone there. Somewhere in those wastes she'd been reacquainted with a specter that had haunted her so often in the past. The scourge. She who'd been happiest where the air was thickest with decay, who'd made necklaces of entrails and soulmates of the dead. She had found in the presence of that abomination nightmares even she'd prayed to wake from. It still slept, which was some small consolation in her terror. But it would not sleep forever. It had tasks unfinished, ambitions unfulfilled. Very soon it would rise from its bed and come looking to finish its business. And on that day... All sand, she told the stone. This time it didn't answer her. It was sulking because she'd been indiscreet, talking to the woman with the gray eyes. Immaculata rocked back and forth on her heels, and as she rocked, the woman's words drifted back to her, tantalizing her. She only remembered a little of what the woman had said, a phrase, a name, or rather, one name in particular. It echoed in her head now. Shadwell. It was like an itch beneath her scalp, an ache in her skull. She wanted to dig through her eardrum and pull it out, grind it underfoot. She rocked faster to soothe the name away, but it wouldn't leave her head. Shadwell. Shadwell. And now there were other names rising to join the ranks of the remembered. The Magdalene. The Hag. She saw them before her as clear as the rock. Clearer. Her sisters, her poor, twice-slaughtered sisters and beneath their dead heels she saw a land, a somewhere she'd conspired to spoil for such a long, weary time. Its name came back to her, and she spoke it softly. The Fugue. That's what they'd called it, her enemies. How they'd loved it, how they'd fought for its safety, and in the process wounded her. She put her hand out to the rock and felt it tremble at her touch. Then she hauled herself to her feet, while the name that had begun this flood filled her head, washing forgetfulness away. Shadwell. How could she ever have forgotten her beloved Shadwell? She'd given him raptures. And what had he done in return? Betrayed and befouled her. Used her for as long as it had suited his purposes, then pitched her away into the wilderness. He hadn't thrown her far enough. Today she'd found her way back. And she came with killing news. 4. The screams began suddenly and mounted cries of disbelief, then shouts of horror the like of which Susanna had never heard. Ahead of her Nimrod was already running toward the source of the din. She followed, and stepped into a scene of the bloodiest chaos. We're attacked! 
Nimrod yelled at her as rebels ran in all directions, many bearing fresh wounds. The ground was already littered with bodies. More were falling with every moment. Before Nimrod could plunge into the fray, however, Susanna took hold of his jacket. They're fighting each other, she shouted to him above the bedlam. What? Look, she said. It took him only a few seconds to confirm what she'd seen. There was no sign of any outside attack. The rebels were at each other's throats. No quarter was being given on any side. Men were murdering men they'd moments ago been sharing a cigarette with. Some had even risen from their deathbeds and were beating at the heads of those who'd nursed them. Nimrod stepped onto the battlefield and dragged one of these sudden lunatics from the throat of another. What in God's name are you doing? he demanded. The man was still struggling to reach his victim. That bastard! the man shrieked. He raped my wife! What are you talking about? I saw him! Right there! He jabbed his finger at the ground. There! Your wife's not here! Nimrod yelled, shaking the man violently. She's not here! Susanna scanned the battlefield. The same delusion, or something similar, had seized hold of all of these people. Even as they fought, they wept, and howled their accusations at each other. They'd seen their parents trampled underfoot, their wives abused, and their children slaughtered. Now they wanted to kill the culprits. Hearing this collective delusion voiced, she looked for its maker, and there, standing on a high rock surveying the atrocities, was Immaculata. Her hair remained unbraided. Her breasts were still bare, but she was obviously no longer a stranger to her history. She'd remembered herself. Susanna began to move toward her, trusting that the menstruum would keep this terrible rapture from curdling her brains. It did so. Though she had to be nimble to avoid the brutalities on every side, she reached the vicinity of the rock without harm. The Macalotta seemed not to see her. Head back, teeth bared in a grin of appalling ferocity. Her attention was entirely upon the mayhem she'd given birth to. Forget them, Susanna called up to her. At these words, the head dropped a fraction, and Susanna felt the incantatrix's gaze come to rest on her. Why are you doing this? she said. They've done you no harm. You should have left me to my emptiness, the incantatrix replied. You made me remember. Then for my sake, Susanna said, leave them be. Behind her the shouts had begun to wane, only to be replaced by the moans of the dying and the sobs of those who'd woken from this delusion, to find their knives buried in the hearts of their friends. Whether the rapture had faltered because Immaculata had done her worst, or because she'd responded to Susanna's appeal, was of little importance. At least the death-dealing had stopped. There was a moment's respite only, however, before a shot punctuated the sobs. The bullet struck the rock between Immaculata's bare feet. Susanna turned to see Yolanda Dor striding through the mortuary that had once been her little army, taking fresh aim at the incantatrix as she did so. Immaculata was not prepared to play target. As the second of the shots peeled against the rock, the incantatrix rose into the air and floated toward Yolanda. Her shadow, passing over the battlefield like that of a carrion bird, was fatal. At its touch, the wounded, unable to run before it, turned their faces to the blood-sodden ground and breathed their last. Yolanda didn't wait for the shadow to reach her, but fired at the creature over and over again. The same power that held Immaculata aloft simply threw the bullets aside. Susanna yelled for Yolanda to retreat, but her warning went unheard or ignored. The incantatrix swept down upon the woman and snatched her up, the menstruum wrapping them both in light, then threw her across the field. Her body hit the face of the rock upon which Immaculata had been standing with a sickening thud and dropped, broken, to the ground. None of the surviving rebels made a move to go to their commander's aid. They stayed, frozen in terror, as the incantatrix floated a yard above the ground, across the arena of bodies, her shadow claiming those failing few who'd not been silenced by it on its outward journey. Susanna knew that what slim chance of mercy she'd won from the incantatrix had been forfeited by Yolanda's attack. She would now leave none living among her sometime captors. Without any time to formulate a defense, she threw the menstruum's living glance toward the woman. Its power was minuscule beside that of Immaculata, but she dropped her guard after killing Yolanda, and the blow found her vulnerable. Struck in the small of the back, she was flung forward. It took her seconds only to regain her equilibrium, however, and turned, still hovering like some perverse saint, toward her attacker. There was no fury in her face, only mild amusement. 
Do you want to die? she asked. No, of course not. Didn't I warn you how it would be, sister? Didn't I tell you? All grief, I said. All loss. Is that how it is? Susanna wasn't entirely humoring the woman when she nodded her head. The incantatrix made a long, soft sigh. You made me remember, she said. I thank you for that. And in return... She opened her hand as if presenting some invisible gift. Your life. The hand became a fist. And now the debt's paid. As she spoke, she began to descend once more, until her feet were on solid ground. There will come a time, she said, looking at the bodies in whose midst they stood, when you will take comfort in the company of such as these, as I have, as I do. Then she turned her back on Susanna and started to walk away. Nobody made any move to challenge her as she climbed the rocks and disappeared from sight. The survivors just watched and gave up a prayer to whichever deities they held dear, that the woman from the wilderness had passed them by. Chapter 13 A Fleeting Glimpse 1. Shadwell had not slept well, but then he supposed aspirant deities seldom did. With godhood came a great burden of responsibility. Should he be so surprised, then, that his slumbers were uneasy? Yet he'd known from the time that he'd stood in the watchtower and studied the mantle of the gyre that he had nothing to fear. He could feel the power hidden behind that cloud calling him by name, inviting him to step into its embrace and be transformed. A little before dawn, however, as he was preparing to leave the firmament, he was brought unsettling news. Hobart's forces in Nunsuch had been decimated by raptures that had driven most of them to lunacy. Nor was Hobart entirely free of the taint. When he arrived, an hour after the messenger, the inspector had about him the air of a man who he wasn't certain could trust himself any longer. From elsewhere, the news was better. Wherever the prophet's forces had faced the native population in natural warfare, they had triumphed. It was only when the soldiers had failed to strike swiftly that the seer kind had found a window through which to work their raptures, and when they had, the results were the same as they'd been in none such. Men had either lost their minds or woken from their evangelical zeal and joined the enemy. Now that enemy was gathering at the narrow bright, warned either by rumor or rapture that the prophet was intending to breach the gyre, and prepared to defend its integrity to the death. There were several hundreds of them, but they scarcely constituted an army. They were, by all reports, an unarmed, unregimented collection of old men, women, and children. The only problem they presented was in the ethics of decimating them. But he decided, as his entourage left the firmament for the gyre, that such moral niceties were beneath him now. The greater crime by far would be to ignore the call he'd heard from beyond the mantle. When the moment came, as it soon would, he'd summon the by-blows and let them devour the enemy, children and all. He would not shirk. Godhood called, and he went fleet-footed to worship at his own altar. 2. The sense of physical and spiritual well-being Cal had felt when he woke on Venus Mountain did not falter as he and Debono made their way down the slope toward the firmament but his fine mood was soon spoiled by the agitation in the landscape around them, a distressing but unfixable anxiety in every leaf and blade of grass. What shreds of birdsong there were sounded shrill, more alarms than music-making. Even the air buzzed around his head, as though for the first time he was alive to the news it carried. Bad news, no doubt, yet there was not much of consequence to be seen. A few smoldering fires, little more, and even those signs of strife petered out as they approached the firmament itself. This is it, said Cal, as Debono led him through the trees toward a tall, but in truth, quite unexceptional building. It is. All the doors stood open. There was neither sound nor movement from within. They quickly scrutinized the exterior, searching for some sign of Shadwell's occupancy, but there was none visible. After one circuit, Debono spoke what Cal had been thinking. It's no use us waiting out here. We have to go in. Hearts hammering, they climbed the steps and entered. Cal had been told to expect the miraculous, and he wasn't disappointed. Each room he put his head into showed him some new glory in tile and brick and paint. But that was all. Only miracles. There's nobody here, said Debona, when they'd made a complete search of the lower floor. Shadwell's gone. I'm going to try upstairs, Cal said. They climbed the flight and separated for speed's sake. 
At the end of one corridor, Cal discovered a room whose walls were cunningly set with fragments of mirrors, reflecting the visitor in such a fashion that he seemed to see himself behind the walls, in some place of mist and shadow, peering out from between the bricks. That was strange enough, but by some further device, the method of which was beyond him, he seemed not to be alone in that other world, but sharing it with an assortment of animals, cats, monkeys, and flying fish, all of which his reflection had apparently fathered, for they all had his face. He laughed to see it, and they all laughed with him, fish included. Indeed, it was not until his laughter died down that he heard de Bono summoning him, his shouts urgent. He left the room reluctantly and went in search of the rope dancer. The call was coming from up a further flight of stairs. I hear you, he yelled up to de Bono and began to climb. The ascent was lengthy and steep, but delivered him into a room at the top of a watchtower. Light poured through windows on every side, but the brightness couldn't dissuade him that the room had seen horrors, and recently. Whatever it had witnessed, de Bono had worse to show him. I found Shadwell, he announced, beckoning Cal over. Where? At the narrow bright. Cal peered through the window adjacent to de Bono. Not that one, he was told. This one brings it nearer a telescopic window, and through it is seen to make his pulse pick up its pace, its backcloth, the seething mantle cloud, its subject, massacre. He's going to breach the gyre, de Bono said. It clearly wasn't just the conflict that had paled the youth. It was the thought of that act. Why would he want to do that? He's a cuckoo, isn't he? came the reply. What more reason does he need? Then we have to stop him, Cal said, ungluing his gaze from the window and heading back toward the stairs. The battle's already lost, de Bono replied. I'm not going to stand and watch him occupy every damn inch of the fugue. I'll go in after him if that's what it takes. De Bono looked at Cal, a mixture of anger and despair on his face. You can't, he said. The gyre's forbidden territory, even to us. There are mysteries in there even kind aren't allowed to set eyes on. Shadwell's going in? Exactly, said de Bono. Shadwell's going in. And you know what'll happen? The gyre will revolt. It'll destroy itself. My God. And if it does, the fugue comes apart at the seams. Then we stop him or we die. Why do cuckoos always reduce everything to such simple choices? I don't know. You've got me there. But while you're thinking about it, here's another one. Are you coming or staying? Damn you, Mooney. You're coming, then. Chapter 14 the Narrow Bright 1. There were less than a dozen individuals from among Yolanda's rebel band who were firm enough of limb to make their way toward the gyre. Susanna went with them. Nimrod had requested that, though she told him in plain terms that any dream of overwhelming the enemy by force of arms was misbegotten. The enemy were many. They were few. The only hope remaining lay in her getting close to Shadwell and dispatching him personally. If Nimrod's people could clear her route to the Prophet, they might yet do service. Otherwise, she advised them to preserve themselves, in the hope that there'd be a life worth living tomorrow. They had gotten within about two hundred yards of the battle, the sound of shots and shouts and car engines deafeningly loud, when she had her first sight of Shadwell. He'd found himself a mount, a vast, vile monster that could only be one of the Magdalene's children grown to a foul adulthood, and he was sitting astride its shoulder, surveying the battle. He's protected, said Nimrod at her side. There were beasts, human and less than human, circling the prophet. We'll divert them as best we can. There'd been a moment as they approached the gyre when Susanna's spirits had risen despite the circumstance, or perhaps because of it. Because this confrontation promised to be the end game, the war that would end all wars, after which she'd have no more nights dreaming of loss. But the moment had quickly passed. Now all she felt, peering through the smoke at her enemy, was despondency. It grew with every yard they covered. Wherever she looked there were sights pitiful or nauseating. The struggle, it was clear, was already lost. The gyre's defendants had been outnumbered and outarmed. Most had been laid low, the corpses food for Shadwell's creatures. The remnants, brave as they were, could not keep the salesman from his prize any longer. I was a dragon once, she found herself thinking as she fixed her eye on the prophet. If she could only remember how it had felt, she might be one again but this time there'd be no hesitation, no moment of doubt. This time she'd devour. 2. 
The route to the gyre took Cal through territory he remembered from his rickshaw ride, but its ambiguities had fled before the invading army, or else hidden their subtle heads. And he wondered, what of the old man he'd met at the end of that ride? Had he fallen prey to the marauders? Had his throat slit defending his little corner of Wonderland? Most likely, Cal would never know. A thousand tragedies had racked the fugue in recent hours. The old man's fate was just part of a greater horror. A world was going to ash and dust around them. And up ahead, the architect of these outrages. Cal saw the salesman now, at the heart of the carnage, his face blazing with triumph. The sight made him put aside any thought of safety. With De Bono at his heels, he pitched into the thick of the battle. There was scarcely a foot of clear ground between the bodies. The closer he got to Shadwell, the thicker the smell of blood and burning flesh became. He was soon separated from De Bono in the confusion, but it didn't matter any longer. His priority had to be the salesman. Every other consideration fell away. Maybe it was this purposefulness that got him through the bloodletting alive. Though bullets filled the air like flies, his very indifference was a kind of blessedness. What he failed to notice failed in turn to notice him. Thus he went unscathed through the heart of the battle until he was within ten yards of Shadwell. He cast around among the slain at his feet in search of a weapon, and laid his hands on a machine gun. Shadwell was dismounting from the beast he'd been riding, and turning his back on the conflict. There were a mere handful of defendants left between him and the mantle, and they were already falling. He was seconds only from entering the gyre. Cal raised the gun and pointed it toward the prophet. But before his finger could find the trigger, something rose up from feasting at his side and came at him. One of the Magdalene's children flesh between its teeth. He might have tried to kill it, but recognition slurred his intent. The creature that tore the gun from his hand was the selfsame that had almost murdered him at the warehouse. His own child. It had grown. It now stood half again as tall as Cal. But for all its bulk it was no sloth. Its fingers reached for him swift as lightning, and he only ducked them by the slimmest of margins, flinging himself down amid the corpses, where it doubtless intended to lay him permanently. In desperation he sought the fallen gun, but before he could locate it the child came in fresh pursuit, its weight pulping the bodies it trod upon. Cal attempted to roll out from beneath it, but the beast was too quick and snatched hold of his hair and throat. He clutched at the corpses, seeking purchase as the creature hauled him up, but his fingers slid over their gaping faces, and he was suddenly an infant in the embrace of his own monstrous offspring. His wild eyes caught fleeting sight of the prophet, the mantle's last defenders were dead. Shadwell was yards from the wall of the cloud. Cal struggled against the beast until his bones were about ready to break, but to no avail. This time the child intended to complete its task of patricide. Cal's last breath was steadily pressed from his lungs. In extremis he clawed at the polluted mirror before him, and through the dusky air saw gobs of the child's flesh come away. There was a rush of bluish matter, like its mother's stuff, the chill of which slapped him back from dying, and he drove his fingers deeper into the beast's face. Its size had been gained at the price of durability. Its skull was wafer-thin. He made a hook of his fingers and pulled. The beast howled and dropped him, the filth of its working spilling out. Cal dragged himself to his feet, in time to hear De Bono calling his name. He looked up toward the shout, vaguely aware that the ground beneath him was trembling, and that those who could were fleeing the battlefield. De Bono had an axe in his hand, he threw it toward Cal, as the by-blow, its head cratered, came for him again. The weapon fell short, but Cal was over the bodies and to it in an instant, turning to face the beast at his back with a sideways blow that opened a wound in its flank. The carcass loosed a stinking froth of matter, but the child didn't fall. Cal swung again, opening the cut further, and again. This time the beast's hands went to the wound, and its head was lowered as it peered at the damage. Cal didn't hesitate. He raised the axe and brought it down on the child's skull. The blade divided the head to the neck, and the by-blow toppled forward, the axe still buried in its body. Cal looked about him for a sign of De Bono, but the rope dancer was nowhere to be seen. Nor was there any other living person, kind or cuckoo, visible through the smoke. The battle had ended. Those who'd survived it on either side had retreated, and with reason. The shuddering in the earth had intensified. It seemed the ground was ready to gape and swallow the field. He turned his gaze back toward the mantle. There was a raw-edged tear in the cloud. Beyond it, darkness. Shadwell, of course, had gone. Without hesitating to compute the consequences, 
Cal stumbled through the devastation toward the cloud and entered its darkness. 3. Susanna had seen the conclusion of Cal's struggle with a by-blow from a distance and might have reached him in time to prevent his going into the gyre alone. But the tremors that rocked the narrow bright had Shadwell's army in sudden panic, and she came closer to being killed in their haste to get to safe ground than if she'd been in the conflict itself. She was running against the tide through smoke and confusion. By the time the air had cleared and she'd oriented herself, Shadwell had dismounted and disappeared into the gyre, and Cal was following. She called to him, but the earth was in further convulsions, and her voice was lost beneath its roars. She cast one final look around to see Nimrod helping one of the wounded away from the bright. Then she began toward the wall of cloud into which Cal had now vanished. Her scalp tingled. The power of the place she stood before was immeasurable. There was every chance that it had already annihilated those foolhardy enough to trespass inside. But she couldn't be certain of that, and as long as there was a sliver of doubt she had to act. Cal was there, and whether he was dead or alive she had to go to him. His name on her lips, as a keepsake and a prayer, she followed where he'd gone, into the living heart of Wonderland. Part 9 Into the Gyre Upon our heels a fresh perfection treads. John Keats, Hyperion Chapter 1 Trespassers 1. Always worlds within worlds. In the kingdom of the cuckoo, the weave. In the weave, the fugue. In the fugue, the world of Mimi's book. And now this, the gyre. But nothing that she'd seen in the pages or places she'd visited could have prepared Susanna for what she found waiting behind the mantel. For one thing, though it had seemed as she stepped through the cloud curtain that there'd been only night awaiting her on the other side. That darkness had been an illusion. The landscape of the gyre was lit with an amber phosphorescence that rose from the very earth beneath her feet. The reversal upset her equilibrium completely. It was almost as if the world had turned over and she was treading the sky. And the true heavens? They were another wonder. The clouds pressed low, their innards in perpetual turmoil, as if at the least provocation they'd rain lightning on her defenseless head. When she'd advanced a few yards, she glanced behind her, just to be certain that she knew the route back. But the door and the battlefield of the narrow bright beyond had already disappeared. The cloud was no longer a curtain, but a wall. A spasm of panic clutched her belly. She soothed it with the thought that she wasn't alone here. Somewhere up ahead was Cal. But where? Though the light from the ground was bright enough for her to walk by, it, and the fact that the landscape was so barren, conspired to make a nonsense of distance. She couldn't be certain whether she was seeing twenty yards ahead of her or two hundred. Whichever, there was no sign of human presence within range of her eyesight. All she could do was follow her nose, and hope to God she was heading in the right direction. And then a fresh wonder. At her feet a trail had appeared, or rather two trails intermingled. Though the earth was compacted and dry, so much so that neither Shadwell's nor Cal's footfalls had left an indentation. Where the invaders had trodden the ground seemed to be vibrating. That was her first impression, at least. But as she followed their route, the truth became apparent. The soil along the path pursuer and pursued had taken was sprouting. She stopped walking and went down on her haunches to confirm the phenomenon. Her eyes weren't misleading her. The earth was cracking, and yellow-green tendrils, their strength out of all proportion to their size, were corkscrewing up out of the cracks, their growth so fast she could watch it happening. Was this some elaborate defense mechanism on the gyre's part? Or had those ahead of her carried seeds into this sterile world? which the raptures here had urged into immediate life. She looked back. Her own route was similarly marked, the chutes only just appearing, while those in Cal's and Shadwell's paths, with a minute or more's headway, were already six inches high. One was uncurling like a fern. Another had pods. A third was spiny. At this rate of growth they'd be trees within an hour. Extraordinary as the spectacle was, she had no time to study it. Following this trail of proliferating life, she pressed on. 2. Though she'd picked up her pace to a trot, there was still no sign of those she was following. The flowering path was the only proof of their passing. She was soon obliged to run well off the trail, for the plants, growing at exponential rate, were spreading laterally as well as vertically. As they swelled, it became clear how little they had in common with the kingdom's flora. If they had sprung from seeds brought in on human heels, 
The enchantments here had wrought profound changes in them. Indeed, the resemblance was less to a jungle than to some undersea reef, not least because the plant's prodigious growth made them sway as if moved by a tide. Their colors and their forms were utterly various. Not one was like its neighbor. All they had in common was their enthusiasm, for growth, for fruitfulness. Clouds of scented pollen were being expelled like breaths. Pulsing blossoms were turning their heads to the clouds, as if the lightning was a kind of sustenance. Roots were spreading underfoot with such violence the earth trembled. Yet there was nothing threatening in this surge of life. The eagerness here was simply the eagerness of the newborn. They grew for the pleasure of growing. Then, from off to her right, she heard a cry, or something like a cry. Was it Cal? No, there was no sign of the trail dividing. It came again somewhere between a sob and a sigh. It was impossible to ignore, despite her mission. Promising herself only the briefest of detours, she followed the sound. Distance was so deceptive here. She'd advanced perhaps two dozen yards from the trail when the air unveiled the source of the sound. It was a plant, the first living thing she'd seen here beyond the limits of the trail, with which it shared the same multiplicity of forms and brilliance of color. It was the size of a small tree, its heart and knot of boughs so complex she suspected it must be several plants growing together in one spot. She heard rustling in a blossom-laden thicket, and among the serpentine roots, but she couldn't see the creature whose call had brought her here. Something did become apparent, however, that the knot at the center of the tree all but lost among the foliage was a human corpse. If she needed further confirmation, it was in plain sight. Fragments of a fine suit hanging from the boughs like the sloughed skins of executive snakes. A shoe, parceled up in tendrils. The clothes had been shredded so that the dead flesh could be claimed by Flora. Green life springing up where red had failed. The corpse's legs had grown woody and sprouted knotted roots. Shoots were exploding from its innards. There was no time to linger and look. She had work to do. She made one circuit of the tree and was about to return to the path when she saw a pair of living eyes staring out at her from the leaves. She yelped. They blinked. Tentatively, she reached forward and parted the twigs. The head of the man she'd taken for dead was on almost back to front, and his skull had been cracked wide open. But everywhere the wounds had bred sumptuous life. A beard, lush as new grass, grew around a mossy mouth that ran with sap. Floret-laden twigs broke from the cheeks. The eyes watched her intently, and she felt moist tendrils reaching up to investigate her face and hair. Then, its blossoms shaking as it drew breath, the hybrid spoke. One long, soft word. Am I alive? Was it naming itself? When she'd overcome her surprise, she told it she didn't understand. It seemed to frown. There was a fall of petals from its crown of flowers. The throat pulsed, and then regurgitated the syllables, this time better articulated. Am I alive? Are you alive? She said, comprehending now. Of course. Of course you're alive. I thought I was dreaming, it said, its eyes wandering from its perusal of her a while, then returning. Dead or dreaming. Or both. One moment, bricks in the air breaking my head. Shearman's house, she said. Ah, you were there? The auction. You were at the auction. It laughed to itself, and its humor tingled against her cheek. I always wanted to be inside he said, inside. And now she understood the how and why of this. Though it was odd to think, odd, it was incredible that this creature had been one of Shadwell's party. That was what she construed. Injured or perhaps killed in the destruction of the house, he'd somehow been caught up in the gyre, which had turned his broken body to this flowering purpose. Her face must have registered her distress at his state, for the tendrils empathized and grew jittery. So I'm not dreaming, then, the hybrid said. No. Strange, came the reply. I thought I was. It's so like paradise. She wasn't sure she'd heard correctly. Paradise, she said. I never dared hope. Life would be such pleasure. She smiled. The tendrils were soothed. This is Wonderland, the hybrid said. Really? Oh, yes. We're near to where the weave began, near to the temple of the loom. 
Here everything transforms, everything becomes. Me? I was lost. Look at me now. How I am. Hearing his boast, her mind went back to the adventure she'd had in the book. How in that no man's land between words and the world. Everything had been transforming and becoming. And her mind, married in hatred with Hobart's, had been the energy of that condition. She the warp to his weft. Thoughts from different skulls, crossing and making a material place from their conflict. It was all part of the same procedure. The knowledge was slippery. She wanted an equation in which she could fix the lesson, in case she could put it to use. But there were more pressing issues now than the higher mathematics of the imagination. I must go, she said. Of course you must. There are others here. I saw, said the hybrid, passing overhead. Overhead? Toward the loom. Three. Toward the loom. She retraced her steps to the trail with fresh enthusiasm. The fact of the buyer's existence in the gyre, apparently accepted by the forces here, even welcomed, gave her some hope that the mere presence of a trespasser was not sufficient to make the gyre turn itself inside out. Its sensitivity had apparently been overestimated. It was strong enough to deal with an invading force in its own inimitable fashion. Her skin had begun to itch, and there was a restlessness in her gut. She tried not to think too hard of what this signified, but the irritation increased as she again followed the trail. The atmosphere was thickening now, the world around her darkening. It wasn't night's darkness coaxing sleep. The murk buzzed with life. She could taste it, sweet and sour. She could see it, busy behind her eyes. She'd gone only a little way when something ran across her feet. She looked down to see an animal— an unlikely cross between squirrel and centipede, eyes bright, legs innumerable, cavorting between the roots. Nor she now realized was the creature alone. The forest was inhabited. Animals as numerous and as remarkable as the plant life were spilling out from the undergrowth, changing even as they hopped and squirmed, more ambitious by the breath. Their origins? The plants. The flora had parented its own fauna, its buds flowering into insects, its fruits growing fur and scales, a plant opened and butterflies rose in a flickering cloud. In a thorn thicket birds were fluttering into life. From a tree trunk white snakes poured like sentient sap. The air was so thick now she could have sliced it, new creatures crossing her path with every yard she advanced, only to be eclipsed by the murk. Something that was a distant relation of the armadillo waddled in front of her. Three variations on the theme of ape came and went, a golden dog cavorted among the flowers, and so on and so forth. She had no doubt now why her skin itched. It longed to join this game of changes, to throw itself back into the melting pot and find a new design. Her mind, too, was half seduced by the notion. Among such joyous invention it seemed churlish to cleave to a single anatomy. Indeed, she might have succumbed in time to these temptations of the flesh. But that ahead of her a building now emerged from the fog, a plain brick building which she caught sight of for an instant before the air enclosed it again. Plain as it was, this could only be the temple of the loom. A huge parrot swooped in front of her, speaking in tongues, then flitted away. She began to run. The golden dog had elected to keep pace with her. It panted at her heels. Then the shock wave. It came from the direction of the building, a force that convulsed the living membrane of the air and rocked the earth. She was thrown off her feet amid sprawling roots, which instantly attempted to incorporate her into their design. She disengaged them from around about her and pulled herself to her feet. Either the contact with the earth or the wave of energy from the temple had sent her into paroxysms. Though she was standing quite still, her whole body seemed to be dancing. There was no other word for it. Every part of her, from eyelash to marrow, had caught the rhythm of power here. Its percussion ordered her heart to a different beat. Her blood sped, then slowed. Her mind soared and plummeted by turns. But that was only flesh. Her other anatomy, the subtle body that the menstruum had quickened, was beyond the control of the forces here, or else was already in such accord with them it was left to its own work. She occupied it now, telling it to keep her feet from rooting and her head from sprouting wings and flying off. It soothed her. She'd been a dragon and emerged again, hadn't she? This was no different. Yes, it is, said her fears. This is flesh and bone business. The dragon was all in my mind. Haven't you learned yet, came the reply. There is no difference. 
As the answer rang in her head, the second shockwave struck. And this time it was no petit mal, but the full fit. The ground beneath her began to roar. She started to run toward the temple once more as the noise mounted. But she'd gotten five yards at best, when the roar became the hard din of breaking stone. And a zigzag crack appeared to the right of her, and to the left another, and another. The gyre was tearing itself apart. Chapter 2 The Temple 1. Though Shadwell had a good lead on Cal, the thick air of the gyre did not conceal him. The salesman's jacket stood out like a beacon, and Cal followed it as fast as his jittery limbs would carry him. Though his struggle with the by blow had left him weak, he was still much the fitter man, and steadily closed the gap between them. More than once he caught Shadwell glancing behind him, his face a smear of anxiety. After all the chases and crusades, the beasts and the armies, it had come down to the two of them, racing toward a goal beyond the articulation of either. They were equals at last. Or at least so Cal had thought. It was only when they came in sight of the temple that the salesman turned and stood his ground. Either his fingers or the air had clawed his disguise from his face. He was the prophet no longer. Fragments of the illusion clung to his chin and around his hairline. But this was recognizably the man Cal had first confronted in that haunted room in Rue Street. Come no further, Mooney, he instructed. He was so breathless the words were barely audible, and the light from the earth made him look sick. I don't want to shed blood, he told Cal. Not here. There are forces around us that wouldn't take kindly to that. Cal had stopped running. Now as he listened to Shadwell's speech he felt a twitching beneath the soles of his feet, and looked down to see shoots springing up between his toes. Go back, Mooney, said Shadwell. My destiny isn't with you. Cal was only half listening to the salesman. The sudden growth beneath his feet intrigued him, and he saw now that it spread across the ground, following Shadwell's footsteps to where he stood. The barren soil had suddenly produced all manner of plant life, which was growing at a phenomenal rate. Shadwell had seen it, too, and his voice was hushed as he said, Creation. See that, Mooney? Pure creation. We shouldn't be here said Cal. Shadwell's face carried a lunatic grin. You have no place here, he said. I grant you that. But I've waited all my life for this. An ambitious plant burst the earth beneath Cal's foot, and he stepped aside to let it grow. Shadwell read the movement as an attack. He opened his jacket. For an instant Cal thought he was going to try the old trick, but his solution was far simpler. He pulled a gun from his inside pocket and pointed it at Cal. Like I said, I don't want to spill blood. So go back, Mooney. Go on. Go on. Back the way you came or so help me I'll blow your brains out. He meant it. Of that Cal had not the least doubt. Raising his hands to chest height, he said, I hear you. I'm going. Before he could move, however, three things happened in quick succession. First, something flew overhead, its passage almost hidden by the clouds that pressed upon the roof of the temple. Shadwell looked up and Cal, taking the chance, ran at the man, reaching to knock the gun from his grip. The third event was the shot. It seemed to Cal he saw the bullet break from the barrel on a plume of smoke, saw it cleave the space between the gun and his body. It was slow, as in a nightmare of execution. But he was slower still. The bullet hit his shoulder, and he was thrown backward, landing among flowers that had not existed thirty seconds before. He saw droplets of his blood rise over his head, as if claimed for the sky. He let the puzzle go. There was only energy enough to hold on to one problem at a time, and he had to make life his priority. His hand went to the wound which had shattered his clavicle. He put his palm against the hole to stop the blood coming as the pain spread down across his body. Above him the clouds roiled on, thundering, or was the clamor he heard only in his head? Groaning, he rolled onto his side to see if he could get a glimpse of what Shadwell was up to. The pain almost blinded him but he fought to focus on the building up ahead. Shadwell was entering the temple. There was no guard at the threshold, just an archway in the brick, through which he was disappearing. Cal inched himself up onto two knees and a hand, the other still clamped to his shoulder, and from there got to his feet and began to stagger toward the temple door to claim the salesman from his victory. 2. What Shadwell had told Mooney was true. He had no wish to shed blood in the gyre. 
The secrets of creation and destruction dwelled here. If he'd needed confirmation of that fact, he'd seen it spring up beneath their feet. A fabulous fecundity that brought with it the promise of heroic decay. That was the nature of any exchange. A thing gained, a thing lost. He, a salesman, had learned that lesson as a stripling. What he sought now was to stand beyond such commerce, inviolate. That was the condition of gods. They had permanence and purpose everlasting. They could not be spoiled in their prime, nor shown wonders only to have them snatched away. They were eternal, unchanging. And here inside this bald citadel he would join that pantheon. It was dark over the threshold. No sign here of the shining earth outside, just a shadowy passageway, its floor, walls, and ceiling built of the same bare brick, without mortar between. He advanced a few yards, his fingertips running over the wall. It was an illusion, no doubt, but he had a curious sensation walking here, that the bricks were grinding upon each other, as his first mistress had ground her teeth in her sleep. He withdrew his fingers from the walls, advancing to the first turn in the passage. At the corner, a welcome discovery. There was a light source somewhere up ahead. He would not have to stumble in darkness any farther. The passage ran for forty-five yards or so, before making another ninety-degree turn. Again, it was the same featureless brick. But halfway down it, he was presented with a second archway, and stepping through, found himself in an identical corridor, but that it was shorter by twice the breadth of the first. He followed it, the light brightening around one corner and along another bare passage, then around a second corridor, which again had a door in it. Now he grasped the architect's design. The temple was not one building, but several, set within each other, a box containing a slightly smaller box, which then contained a third. The realization unnerved him. The place was like a maze, a simple one perhaps, but nevertheless designed to confound or delay. Once again he heard the walls grinding, and pictured the whole construction closing in on him, and he was suddenly unable to find his way out before the walls pressed him to bloody dust. But he couldn't turn back now, not with the luminescence tempting him to turn one more corner. Besides, there were noises reaching him from the world outside, strange disfigured voices, as if the inhabitants of some forgotten bestiary were prowling around the temple, scraping at the brick, padding across the roof. He had no choice but to press on. He'd sold his life away for a glimpse of godhood. He had nothing to return to now but the bitterest defeat. Forward, then, into hell with the consequences. Three. As Cal came within a yard of the temple door, his strength gave out. He could no longer command his legs to bear him up. He stumbled, throwing out his right arm to prevent his falling too heavily, and hit the ground. Unconsciousness claimed him, and he was grateful for it. Escape lasted seconds only, however, before the blackness lifted and he was delivered back into nausea and agony. But now, and not for the first time in the fugue, his blood-starved brain had lost its grasp on whether he was dreaming or being dreamed. That ambiguity had first visited him in Lemuel Lowe's orchard, he remembered waking from a dream of the life he'd lived, to find himself in a paradise he'd only ever expected to encounter in sleep. And then later on Venus Mountain, or beneath it, living the life of planets, and passing a millennium in that revolving state, only to wake a mere six hours older. Now here was the paradox again at death's door. Had he awakened to die, or was dying true wakefulness? Round and round the thoughts went in a spiral with darkness at its center and he fleeing into that darkness, wearier by the moment. His head on the earth, which was trembling beneath him, he opened his eyes and looked back toward the temple. He saw it upside down, the roof sitting in a foundation of clouds, while the bright ground shone around it. Paradox upon paradox, he thought, as his eyes drifted closed again. Cal! Somebody called him. Cal! Irritated to be summoned this way, he opened his eyes only reluctantly. It was Susanna who was bending over him, saying his name. She had questions, too, but his lazy mind couldn't grasp them. Instead, he said, Inside. Shadwell. Hold on, she told him. You understand me? She put her hand on his face. It was cool. Then she bent down and kissed him, and somewhere at the back of his skull, he remembered this happening before. His lying on the ground and her giving him love. I'll be here he said. She nodded. You'd better be, she replied, and crossed to the door of the temple. This time he did not let his eyes close. 
Whatever dream waited beyond life, he would postpone its pleasure till he saw her face again. Chapter 3 The Miracle of the Loom Outside the temple the quake tremors were worsening. Inside, however, an uneasy peace reigned. Susanna started to advance down the darkened corridors, the itching in her body subdued now that she was out of the turbulence, in this the eye of the hurricane. There was light ahead. She turned a corner and another, and finding a door in the wall slipped through into a second passageway, as spartan as the one she'd left. The light was still tantalizingly out of reach. Around the next corner, it promised, just a little farther, a little farther. The menstruum was quiet inside her as though it feared to show itself. Was that the natural respect one miracle paid to a greater? If so, the raptures here were hiding their faces with no little skill. There was nothing about these corridors suggestive of revelation or power. Just bare brick. Except for the light. That coaxed her still, through another door and along further passageways. The building, she now realized, was built on the principle of a Russian doll. One within another. Worlds within worlds. They couldn't diminish infinitely, she told herself. Or could they? Around the very next corner she had her answer, or at least part of it, as a shadow was thrown up against the wall and she heard somebody shouting, What in God's name? For the first time since setting foot here, she felt the ground vibrate. There was a fall of brick dust from the ceiling. Shadwell, she said. As she spoke, it seemed she could see the two syllables, Shadwell, carried along the corridor toward the next door. A fleeting memory came, too, of Jericho speaking his love to her, word as reality. The shadow on the wall shifted, and suddenly the salesman was standing in front of her. All trace of the prophet had gone. The face revealed beneath was bloated and pale, the face of a beached fish. Gone, he said. He was shaking from head to foot. Sweat droplets decorated his face like pearls. It's all gone. Any fear she might once have had of this man had disappeared. He was here unmasked as ludicrous, but his words made her wonder. What had gone? She began to walk toward the door he'd stepped through. It was you, he said, his shakes worsening. You did this. I did nothing. Oh, yes. As she came within a yard of him, he reached for her, his clammy hand suddenly about her neck. There's nothing there, he shrieked, pulling her close. His grip intended harm, but the menstruum didn't rise to her aid. She was left with only muscle power to disengage him, and it was not enough. You want to see? He screamed into her face. You want to see how I've been cheated? I'll show you. He dragged her toward the door and pitched her through into the room at the heart of the temple the inner sanctum in which the miracles of the gyre had been generated, the powerhouse which had held the many worlds of the fugue together for so long. It was a room some fifteen feet square, built of the same naked brick as the rest of the temple, and high. She looked up to see that the roof had a skylight of sorts, open to the heavens. The clouds that swirled around the temple roof shed a milky brightness down, as if the lightning from the gyre was being kindled in the womb of troubled air above. The clouds were not the only movement overhead, however. As she gazed up, she caught sight of a form in the corner of the roof. Before her gaze could focus on it, Shadwell was approaching her. Where is it? he demanded. Where's the loom? She looked around the sanctum and discovered now that it was not entirely bare. In each of the four corners a figure was sitting, gazing toward the center of the room. Her spine twitched. Though they sat bolt upright on their high-backed chairs, the quartet were long dead, their flesh like stained paper on their bones, their clothes hanging in rotted rags. Had these guardians been murdered where they sat, so that thieves could remove the loom unchallenged? So it seemed. Yet there was nothing in their posture that suggested a violent death, nor could she believe that this charmed place would have sanctioned bloodshed. No, something else had happened here. Was happening still, perhaps, some essential point both she and Shadwell could not yet grasp. He was still muttering to himself, his voice a decaying spiral of complaint. She was only half listening. She was far more interested in the object she now saw lying in the middle of the floor. There it lay, the kitchen knife Cal had brought into the auction room all those months ago. The commonplace domestic tool, which the look between them had somehow drawn into the weave, to this very spot, to the absolute center of the fugue. 
Seeing it, pieces of the riddle began to slot together in her head. Here, where the glances of the sentinels intersected, lay the knife that another glance, between herself and Cal, had empowered. It had entered this chamber and somehow cut the last knot the loom had created, and the weave had released its secrets, all of which was well and good except that the sentinels were dead, and the loom, as Shadwell kept repeating, was gone. You were the one, he growled. You knew all along. She ignored his accusations, a new thought forming. If the magic had gone, she reasoned, why did the menstruum hide itself? As she shaped the question, Shadwell's fury drove him to attack. I'll kill you, he yelled. His assault caught her unawares, and she was flung back against the wall. The breath went out of her in a rush, and before she could defend herself, his thumbs were at her throat, his bulk trapping her. Thieving bitch, he said. You cheated me. She raised her hands to beat him off, but she was already growing weak. She struggled to draw breath, desperate for a mouthful of air, even if it was the flatulent breath he was expelling. But his grip on her throat prevented so much as a mouthful reaching her. I'm going to die, she thought. I'm going to die looking into this curdled face. And then her upturned eyes caught a glimpse of movement in the roof, and a voice said, The loom is here. Shadwell's grip on Susanna relaxed. He turned and looked up at the speaker. Immaculata, her arms spread out like a parachutist in free fall, was hovering above them. Do you remember me? she asked Shadwell. Jesus Christ. I missed you, Shadwell, though you were unkind. Where's the loom? he said. Tell me. There is no loom, she replied. But you just said. The loom is here. Where, then? Where? There is no loom. You're out of your mind, he yelled up at her. Either there is or there isn't. The incantatrix had a skull smile as she gazed down on the man below. You're the fool, she said mildly. You don't understand, do you? Shadwell put on a gentler tone. Why don't you come down, he said. My neck aches. She shook her head. It cost her effort to hang in the air that way, Susanna could see. She was defying the sanctity of the temple by working her raptures here. But she flew in the face of such edicts, determined to remind Shadwell of how earthbound he was. Afraid, are you? said Shadwell. Immaculata's smile did not falter. I'm not afraid, she said, and began to float down toward him. Keep out of his way, Susanna willed her. Though the incantatrix had done terrible harm, Susanna had no desire to see her felled by Shadwell's mischief. But the salesman stood face to face with the woman and made no move. He simply said, You reached here before me. I almost forgot you, Immaculata replied. Her voice had lost any trace of stridency. It was full of sighs. But she reminded me. She glanced at Susanna. It was a fine service you did me, sister, she said, to remind me of my enemy. Her eyes went back at Shadwell. You drove me mad, she said, and I forgot you. But I remember now. Suddenly the smile and the sighs had gone entirely. There was only ruin and rage. I remember very well. Where's the loom? Shadwell demanded. You were always so literal, Immaculata replied contemptuously. Did you really expect to find a thing, another object to be possessed? Is that your godhood, Shadwell? Possession? Where the fuck is it? She laughed then, though the sound from her throat had nothing to do with pleasure. Her ridicule pressed Shadwell to breaking point. He flung himself at her. But she was not about to let herself be touched by his hands. As he snatched hold of her, it seemed to Susanna that her whole ruined face cracked open, spilling a force that might once have been the menstruum, the cool, bright river Susanna had first plunged into at Immaculata's behest but was now a damned and polluted stream, breaking from the wounds like pus. It had force, nevertheless. Shadwell was thrown to the ground. Overhead the clouds threw lightning across the roof, freezing the scene below by its scalpel light. The killing blow could only be a glance away, surely. But it didn't come. The incantatrix hesitated, the broken face leaking tainted power, and in that instant Shadwell's hand closed on the kitchen knife at his side. Susanna cried a warning, but Immaculata either failed to hear or chose not to. 
Then Shadwell was on his feet, his ungainly rise offering his victim a moment to strike him down, which was missed, and drove the blade up into her abdomen, a butcher's stroke that opened a traumatic wound. At last she seemed to know he meant her death, and responded. Her face began to blaze afresh, but before the spark could become fire, Shadwell's blade was dividing her to the breasts. Her innards slid from the wound. She screamed and threw back her head, the unleashed force wasted against the sanctum walls. On the instant the room was filled with a roaring that seemed to come from both the bricks and the innards of Immaculata. Shadwell dropped the blood-slicked knife and made to retreat from his crime, but his victim reached out and pulled him close. The fire had entirely gone from Immaculata's face. She was dying and quickly. But even in her failing moments her grip was strong. As the roaring grew louder she granted Shadwell the embrace she'd always denied him, her wound besmirching his jacket. He made a cry of repugnance, but she wouldn't let him go. He struggled and finally succeeded in breaking her hold, throwing her off and staggering from her, his chest and belly plastered with blood. He cast one more look in her direction, then started toward the door, making small moans of horror. As he reached the exit, he looked up at Susanna. I didn't, he began, his hands raised, blood trickling between his fingers. It wasn't me. The words were as much appeal as denial. It was magic, he said, tears starting to his eyes. Not of sorrow she knew, but of a sudden righteous rage. Filthy magic, he shrieked. The ground rocked to hear its glory denied. He didn't wait to have the roof fall on his head, but fled from the chamber as the roars rose in intensity. Susanna looked back at Immaculata. Despite the grievous wounding she'd sustained, she was not yet dead. She was standing against one of the walls, clinging to the brick with one hand and keeping her innards from falling with the other. Blood's been spilled, she said, as another tremor, more fierce than any that had preceded it, unknitted the foundations of the building. Blood's been spilled in the temple of the loom. She smiled that terrible, twisted smile. The fugue's undone, sister, she said. What do you mean? I came here intending to spill his blood and bring the gyre down. Seems it's me who's done the bleeding. It's no matter. Her voice grew weaker. Susanna stepped close to hear her better. It's all the same in the end. The fugue is finished. It'll be dust. All dust. She pushed herself off from the wall. Susanna reached and kept her from falling. The contact made her palm tingle. They're exiles forever, Immaculata said, and frail as it was, there was triumph in her voice. The fugue ends here, wiped away as if it had never been. At this, her legs buckled beneath her. Pushing Susanna away, she stumbled back against the wall. Her hand slipped from her belly, her guts unspooled. I used to dream, she said. Terrible emptiness. She stopped speaking as she slid down the wall, strands of her hair catching on the brick. Sand and nothingness, she said. That's what I dreamed. Sand and nothingness. And here it is. As if to bear out her remark, the din grew cataclysmic. Satisfied with her labors, Immaculata sank to the ground. Susanna looked toward her escape route, as the bricks of the temple began to grind upon each other with fresh ferocity. What more could she do here? The mysteries of the loom had defeated her. If she stayed, she'd be buried in the ruins. There was nothing left to do but get out while she still could. As she moved to the door, two pencil beams of light sliced through the grimy air and struck her arm. Their brightness shocked her, more shocking still their source. They were coming from the eye sockets of one of the sentinels. She stepped out of the path of the light, and as the beam struck the corpse opposite, lights flared there too, then in the third sentinel's head, and the fourth. These events weren't lost on Immaculata. The loom, she whispered, her breath failing. The intersecting beams were brightening, and the fraught air was soothed by the sound of voices, softly murmuring words so unfixable they were almost music. You're too late, said the incantatrix, her comment made not to Susanna but to the dead quartet. You can't save it now. Her head began to slip forward. Too late, she said again. Then a shudder went through her. The body vacated by spirit keeled over. She lay dead in her blood. Despite her dying words, the power here was still building. Susanna backed toward the door to clear the beam's root completely. 
With nothing to bar their way, they immediately redoubled their brilliance, and from the point of collision threw up new beams at every angle. The whispering that filled the chamber suddenly found a fresh rhythm. The words, though still alien to her, ran like a melodious poem. Somehow they and the light were part of one system, the raptures of the four families, Aya, Lo, Yimi, and Babu, working together, word music accompanying a woven dance of light. This was the loom, of course. This was the loom. No wonder Immaculata had poured scorn on Shadwell's literalism. Magic might be bestowed upon the physical, but it didn't reside there. It resided in the word which was mind-spoken, and in motion which was mind-made manifest, in the system of the weave and the evocations of the melody, all mind. Yet, damn it, this recognition was not enough. Finally she was still only a cuckoo, and all the puzzle-solving in the world wouldn't help her mellow the rage of this desecrated place. All she could do was watch the loom's wrath shake the fugue and all it contained apart. In her frustration her thoughts went to Mimi, who had brought her into this adventure, but it died too soon to entirely prepare her for it. Surely even she would not have predicted this, the fugue's failing and Susanna at its heart, unable to keep it beating. The lights were still colliding and multiplying, the beams growing so solid now she might have walked upon them. Their performances transfixed her. She felt she could watch them forever and never tire of their complexities. And still they grew more elaborate, more solid, until she was certain they would not be bound within the walls of the sanctum, but would burst out into the few where she had to go, out to where Cal was lying to comfort him as best she could in the imminent maelstrom. With this thought came another, that perhaps Mimi had known or feared that in the end it would simply be Susanna and the magic and that maybe the old woman had after all left a signpost. She reached into her pocket and brought out the book. Secrets of the Hidden Peoples. She didn't need to open the book to remember the epigraph on the dedication page. What can be imagined need never be lost. She'd tussled with its meaning repeatedly, but her intellect had failed to make much sense of it. Now she forsook her analytical thinking and let subtler sensibilities take over. The light of the loom was so bright it hurt her eyes, and as she stepped out of the sanctum she discovered that the beams were exploiting chinks in the brick, either that or eating at the wall and breaking through. Needle-thin lines of light stratified the passageway. Her thoughts as much on the book in her hand as on her safety. She made her way back via the route she'd come, door and passageway, door and passageway. Even the outer layers of corridor were not immune to the loom's glamour. The beams had broken through three solid walls and were growing wider with every moment. As she walked through them, she felt the menstruum stir in her for the first time since she'd entered the gyre. It rose not to her face, however, but through her arms and into her hands, which clasped the book as though charging it. What can be imagined? The chanting rose, the light beams multiplied. Need never be lost. The book grew heavier, warmer, like a living thing in her arms, and yet so full of dreams. A thing of ink and paper in which another world awaited release. Not one world, perhaps, but many. Or as her and Hobart's time in the pages had proved, each adventurer reimagined the stories for themselves. There were as many wild woods as there were readers to wander there. She was out into the third corridor now, and the whole temple had become a hive of light and sound. There was so much energy here waiting to be channeled. If she could only be the catalyst that turned its strength to better ends than destruction. Her head was full of images or fragments thereof. She and Hobart in the forest of their story, exchanging skins and fictions. She and Cal in the auction room, there glanced the engine that turned the knife above the weave. And finally, the sentinel sitting in the loom chamber, eight eyes that had even in death the power to unmake the weave, and make it again. Suddenly she wasn't walking any longer. She was running, not for fear that the roof would come down on her head, but because the final pieces of the puzzle were coming clear and she had so little time. Redeeming the fugue could not be done alone. Of course not. No rapture could be performed alone. Their essence was an exchange. That was why the family sang and danced and wove. Their magic blossomed between people, between performer and spectator, maker and admirer. And wasn't there rapture at work between her mind and the mind in the book she held? Her eyes scanning the page and soaking up another soul's dreams? It was like love, or rather love was its highest form. Mind shaping mind, visions pirouetting on the threads between lovers. Cal! 
She was at the last door and flinging herself into the turmoil beyond. The light in the earth had turned to the color of bruises, blue, black, and purple. The sky above writhed, ripe to discharge its innards. From the music and the exquisite geometry of light inside the temple, she was suddenly in bedlam. Cal was propped against a wall of the temple. His face was white, but he was alive. She went to him and knelt by his side. What's happening? he said, his voice lazy with exhaustion. I've no time to explain, she said, her hand stroking his face. The menstruum played against his cheek. You have to trust me. Yes, he said. Good. You have to think for me, Cal. Think of everything you remember. Remember? As he puzzled at her, a crack fully a foot wide opened in the earth, running from the threshold of the temple like a messenger. The news it carried was all grim. Seeing it, doubts filled Susanna. How could anything be claimed from this chaos? The sky shed thunder. Dust and dirt were flung up from the crevasses that gaped on every side. She endeavored to hold on to the comprehension she'd found in the corridors behind her. Tried to keep the images of the loom in her head. The beams intersecting. Thought over and under thought. Minds filling the void with shared memories and shared dreams. Think of everything you remember about the fugue, she said. Everything? Everything. All the places you've seen. Why? Trust me, she said. Please, God, Cal, trust me. What do you remember? Just bits and pieces. Whatever you can find, every little piece. She pressed her palm to his face. He was feverish, but the book in her other hand was hotter. In recent times, she'd shared intimacies with her greatest enemy, Hobart. Surely she could share knowledge with this man, whose sweetness she'd come to love. Please, she said. For you, he replied, seeming to know at last all she felt for him. Anything. And the thoughts came. She felt them flow into her and through her. She was a conduit, the menstruum, the stream on which his memories were carried. Her mind's eye saw glimpses only of what he'd seen and felt here in the fugue, but they were things fine and beautiful. An orchard, firelight, fruit, people dancing, singing. A road, a field, De Bono and the rope dancers. The firmament, rooms full of miracles. A rickshaw, a house, with a man standing on the step. A mountain and planets. Most of it came too fast for her to focus upon, but her comprehension of what he'd seen wasn't the point. She was just part of a cycle, as she'd been in the auction room. Behind her she felt the beams breaking through the last wall, as though the loom was coming to meet her, its genius for transfiguration momentarily at her disposal. They didn't have long. If she missed this wave, there'd be no other. Go on, she said to Cal. He had his eyes closed now, and the images were still pouring out of him. He'd remembered more than she'd dared hope. And she, in her turn, was adding sights and sounds to the flow. The lake, Capra's house, the forest, the streets of Nonsuch. They came back razor sharp, and she felt the beams pick them up and speed them on their way. She'd feared the loom would reject her interference, but not at all. It married its power to that of the menstruum, transforming all that she and Cal were remembering. She had no control over these processes. They were beyond her grasp. All she could do was be a part of the exchange between meaning and magic, and trust that the forces at work here comprehended her intentions better than she did. But the power behind her was growing too strong for her. She could not channel its energies much longer. The book was getting too hot to hold, and Cal was shuddering beneath her hand. Enough, she said. Cal's eyes flew open. I haven't finished. Enough, I said. As she spoke, the structure of the temple began to shudder. Cal said, Oh, God. Time to go, said Susanna. Can you walk? Of course I can walk. She helped him to his feet. There were roars from within, as one after another the walls capitulated to the rage of the loom. They didn't wait to watch the final cataclysm, but started away from the temple, brick shards whining past their heads. Cal was as good as his word. He could indeed walk, albeit slowly. But running would have been impossible in the wasteland they were now obliged to cross. As creation had been the touchstone of the outward journey, wholesale destruction marked their return. The flora and fauna that had sprung into being in the footsteps of the trespassers were now suffering a swift dissolution. Flowers and trees were withering. The stench of their rot carried on the hooligan winds that scoured the gyre. With the earth-like dim, the scene was murky, 
the gloom further thickened by dust and airborne matter. From the darkness animal cries rose as the earth opened and consumed the very creatures it had produced mere minutes before. Those not devoured by the bed from which they'd sprung were subject to a fate still more terrible, as the powers that had made them unknitted their children. Pale, skeletal things that had once been bright and alive now littered the landscape, breathing their last. Some turned their eyes up to Cal and Susanna, looking for hope or help, but they had none to offer. It was as much as they could do to keep the cracks in the earth from claiming them, too. They stumbled on, arms about each other, heads bowed beneath a barrage of hailstones which the mantle, as though to perfect their misery, had unleashed. How far? Cal said. They halted, and Susanna stared ahead. She could not be certain they were not simply walking in circles. The light at their feet was now all but extinguished. Here and there it flared up, but only to illuminate another pitiable scene, the last racking moments of the glory that their presence there had engendered. Then, There, she said, pointing through the curtain of hail and dust. I see a light. They set off again as fast as the suppurating earth would allow. With every step their feet sank deeper into a swamp of decaying matter in which the remnants of life still moved, the inheritors of this Eden, worms and cockroaches. But there was distinctly light at the end of the tunnel. She glimpsed it again through the thick air. Look up, Cal, she said. He did just that, though only with effort. Not far now. A few more steps. He was becoming heavier by the moment but the tear in the mantle was sufficient to spur them on over the last few yards of treacherous earth. And finally they stepped out into the light, almost spat from the entrails of the gyre as it went into its final convulsions. They stumbled away from the mantle, but not far before Cal said, I can't, and fell to the ground. She knelt beside him, cradling his head, then looked around for help. Only then did she see the consequences of events in the gyre. Wonderland had gone. The glories of the fugue had been shredded and torn, their tatters evaporating even as she watched. Water, wood, and stone, living animal tissue and dead seer kind, all gone as though it had never been. A few remnants lingered, but not for long. As the gyre thundered and shook, these last signs of the fugue's terrain became smoke and threads, then empty air. It was horribly quick. Susanna looked behind her. The mantle was receding, too. Now that it had nothing left to conceal, its retreat uncovering a wasteland of dirt and fractured rock, even its thunder was diminishing. Susanna! She looked back to see Dubono coming toward her. What happened in there? Later, she said. First we have to get help for Cal. He's been shot. I'll fetch a car. Cal's eyes flickered open. Is it gone? He murmured. Don't think about it now, she said. I want to know, he demanded with surprising vehemence and struggled to sit up. Knowing he wouldn't be placated, Susanna helped him. He moaned, seeing the desolation before them. Groups of seer kind, with a few of Hobart's people scattered among them, stood in the valley and up the slopes of the surrounding hills, neither speaking nor moving. They were all that remained. What about Shadwell? said Cal. Susanna shrugged. I don't know, she said. He escaped the temple before me. The din of a revved car engine cancelled further conversation as de Bono drove one of the invader's vehicles across the dead grass, bringing it to a halt a few feet from where Cal lay. I'll drive, said Susanna, once Cal had been laid on the back seat. What do we tell the doctors? Cal said, his voice getting fainter. I've got a bullet in me. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, said Susanna. As she got into the driver's seat which de Bono had only reluctantly vacated, somebody called her name. Nimrod was running toward the car. Where are you going? he said to her. She directed his attention to the passenger. My friend, he said, seeing Cal. You look the worse for wear. He tried a smile of welcome, but tears came instead. It's over, he said, sobbing. Destroyed. Our sweet land. He wiped his eyes and nose with the back of his hand. What do we do now? He said to Susanna. We get out of harm's way, she told him, as quickly as we can. We still have enemies. It doesn't matter anymore, he said. The fugue's gone. Everything we ever possessed, lost. We're alive, aren't we? She said. As long as we're alive. Where will we go? We'll find a place. 
You have to lead us now, said Nimrod. There's only you. Later. First we have to help Cal. Yes, he said. Of course. He'd taken hold of her arm and was loath to let her go. You will come back? Of course, she said. I'll take the rest of them north, he told her. Two valleys from here. We'll wait for you there. Then move, she said. Time's wasting. You will remember, he said. She would have laughed his doubts off, but that remembering was all. Instead she touched his wet face, letting him feel the menstruum in her fingers. It was only as she drove away that she realized she'd probably blessed him. Chapter 4 Shadwell The salesman had fled the gyre as the first dissolution began in the fugue outside. His escape had therefore not only gone unchallenged but unseen. With the fabric of their homeland coming apart on every side, nobody paid the least attention to the shabby, blood-stained figure that stumbled away through the mayhem. Once only was he obliged to stop and find a place in the chaos where he could give vent to his nausea. The vomit splattered his once fine shoes, and he spent a further moment cleaning them with a handful of leaves which began to evaporate in his hands even as he put them to the task. Magic! How it revolted him now! The fugue had enticed him with its promises. It had flaunted its so-called enchantments in front of him until he, poor cuckoo that he was, had been blinded to all sense. Then it had led him a merry dance, made him dress in borrowed skin, made him deceive and manipulate, all for love of its lies. And lies they were, he saw that now. Even as he'd reached to embrace his prize, it had evaporated, denying him ownership and leaving him to look like the guilty party. The fact that it had taken him so long to see how he'd been used, however, was proof positive of his innocence in all of this. He'd intended no harm to any living thing. He'd wanted only to bring truth and stability into a place sorely deficient in both. For his pains he'd been cheated and connived against. What could history accuse him of, then, other than naivete, a forgivable sin? No, the true villains in this tragedy were the seer kind, the wielders of rapture and unreason. They it was who'd twisted his benign ambition out of true, and so invited these horrors upon them all, a grim spiral of destruction that had ended in the gyre, with him, a victim of circumstance, driven to murder. He made his way out through the decaying fugue and began to climb up from the valley. The wind was cleaner on the slopes, and it shamed him. He stank of fear and frustration while it smelled of the sea. Inhaling it, he knew that in such cleanliness lay his only hope of sanity. Disgusted by his condition, he pulled off his bloody jacket. It was excrement, corrupted and corrupting. In accepting it from the incantatrix, he'd made his first error. From that, all subsequent misdirections had sprung. In his repugnance, he tried to tear at the lining, but it resisted his strength. So he simply bundled the jacket up and threw it high into the air. It rose a little way, then fell again, tumbling down a rocky slope, its passage starting a minor avalanche of pebbles and came to rest spread-eagled like a legless suicide. At last it was where it had belonged from the start, in the dirt. The seer kind belonged with it, he thought. But they were survivors. Deception was in their blood. Though their territories had been destroyed, he didn't put it past them to have another trick or two up their sleeves. As long as they lived, these defilers, he would not rest easy in his bed. They'd made a fool and a butcher of him, and there was no health for him now until every last one of them was laid low. Standing on the hill, looking down into the valley below, he felt a breath of new purpose. He'd been tricked and humiliated, but he was at least alive. The battle was not yet over. They had an enemy, these monsters. The Macalotta had dreamed of it often, and spoken of the wilderness where it resided. The Scourge, she'd called it. If he was to destroy the seer kind, he would need an ally. And what better than that nameless power from which they'd hidden an age ago? They could never hide again. They had no land to conceal themselves in. If he could find this scourge and wake it from its wilderness, it and he would cleanse them at a stroke. The scourge. He liked the sound of the word mightily. But he'd like better the silence that would come when his enemies were ash. Chapter 5 A Fragile Peace 1. Cal was happy to sleep for a while, happy to be at ease in the embrace of gentle hands and gentle words. The nurses came and went, a doctor as well, smiling down at him and telling him all would be well, while De Bono at the man's side nodded and smiled too. 
A night later he woke to find Susanna with him in the room, mouthing words which he was too weary to hear. He slept, happy that she was near, but when he woke again she'd gone. He asked after her, and after de Bono, too, and was told that they'd be back, and that he wasn't to concern himself. Sleep, the nurse told him. Sleep, and when you wake all will be well. He vaguely knew this advice had failed someone he knew and loved, but his drugged mind couldn't quite remember who. So he did as he was told. It was a sleep rich with dreams, in many of which he had a starring role, though not always wearing his own skin. Sometimes he was a bird— Sometimes a tree, his branches laden with fruits, each of which were like little worlds. Sometimes he was the wind, or like the wind, and ran unseen but strong over landscapes made of upturned faces, rock faces, flower faces, and streams in which he knew every silver fish by name. And sometimes he dreamed he was dead, was floating in an infinite ocean of black milk, while presences invisible but mighty distressed the stars above him, and threw them down in long arcs that sang as they fell. Comfortable as it was, this death, he knew he was only dreaming it, indulging his fatigue. The time would come soon when he'd have to wake again. When he did, Nimrod was by his bed. You needn't worry, he told Cal. They won't ask you any questions. Cal's tongue was sluggish, but he managed to say, How did you do that? A little rapture, Nimrod said, unsmiling. I can still manage the occasional deceiving. How are things? Bad, came the reply. Everyone's grieving. I'm not a public griever myself, so I'm not very popular. And Susanna? He made an equivocal look. I like the woman myself, he said, but she's having problems with the families. When they're not grieving, they're arguing among themselves. I get sick of the din. Sometimes I think I'll go find Marguerite. Forget I was ever seer kind. You can't. You watch me. It's no use being sentimental, Cal. The fugue's gone, once and for all. We may as well make the best of it. Join the cuckoos, let bygones be bygones. Good God, we won't even be noticed. There are stranger things than us in the kingdom these days. He pointed to the television in the corner of the room. Every time I turn it on, something new. Something different. I might even go to America. He slipped off his sunglasses. Cal had forgotten how extraordinary his eyes were. Hollywood could use a man with my attributes, he said. Despite Nimrod's quiet despair, Cal couldn't help but smile at this. And, indeed, perhaps the man was right. Perhaps the seer kind had no choice now but to enter the kingdom and make whatever peace they could with it. I must go, he was saying. There's a big meeting tonight. Everyone has a right to have their say. We'll be talking all night, most likely. He went to the door. I won't go to California without saying goodbye he remarked, and left the patient alone. Two. Two days passed and nobody came. Cal was getting better quickly, and it seemed that whatever rapture Nimrod had worked on the staff had indeed diverted them from making any report of their patient's wound to the police. By the afternoon of the third day, Cal knew he was much improved, because he was getting restless. The television, Nimrod's new love, could provide only soap opera and a bad movie. The latter, the lesser of the two banalities, was playing when the door opened and a woman dressed in black stepped into the room. It took Cal a moment before he recognized his visitor as a Pauline. Before he could offer a welcome, she said, No time to talk, Calhoun, and approaching the bed, thrust a parcel at Cal. Take it, she said. He did so. I have to be away quickly, she went on. Her face softened as she gazed at him. You look tired, my boy, she said. Take a holiday and with that advice retreated to the door. Wait, he called after her. No time, no time, she said, and was away. He took the string and brown paper from around his present, and discovered inside the book of fairy tales that Susanna had found in Rue Street. With it there was a scrawled note. Cal, it read, keep hold of this for me, will you? Never let it out of your sight. Our enemies are still with us. When the time is safe, I'll find you. Do this for us all. I'm kissing you. Susanna. He read the letter over and over, moved beyond telling by the way she'd signed off. I'm kissing you. But he was confounded by her instructions. The book seemed an unremarkable volume, its binding torn, its pages yellowed. The text was in German, which he had no command of whatsoever. Even the illustrations were dark and full of shadows, 
and he'd had enough shadows to hurt him a lifetime. But if she wanted him to keep it safe, then he'd do so. She was wise, and he knew better than to take her instructions lightly. 3. After the visit from Apolline, nobody else came. He was not altogether surprised. There had been an urgency in the woman's manner, and yet more in the letter from Susanna. Our enemies are still with us, she'd written. If she wrote that, then it was true. They discharged him after a week, and he made his way back to Liverpool. Little had changed. The grass still refused to grow in the churned earth where Lilia Palicia had died. The train still ran north and south. The china dogs on the dining room sill still looked for their master, their vigil rewarded only with dust. There was dust, too, on the note that Geraldine had left on the kitchen table. A brief missive saying that until Cal learned to behave like a reasonable human being, he could expect none of her company. There were several other letters awaiting him. One from his section leader at the firm, asking him where the hell he was and stating that if he wished to keep his job, he'd better make some explanation of his absence post-haste. The letter was dated the 11th. It was now the 25th. Cal presumed he was out of a job. He couldn't find it in him to be much concerned by unemployment nor indeed by Geraldine's absence. He wanted to be alone, wanted the time to think through all that had happened. More significantly, he found feelings about anything hard to come by. As the days passed, and he made a stab at reassembling his life, he rapidly came to see that his time in the gyre had left him wounded in more ways than one. It was as though the forces unleashed at the temple had found their way into him, and left a little wilderness where there'd once been a capacity for tears and regret. Even the poet was silent though Cal could still remember Mad Mooney's verses by heart. They were just sounds to him now. They failed to move. There was one comfort in this, that perhaps his newfound stoicism suited better the function of solitary librarian. He would be vigilant, but he would anticipate nothing, neither disaster nor revelation. That was not to say he would give up looking to the future. True, he was just a cuckoo, scared and weary and alone. But so in the end were most of his tribe. It didn't mean all was lost as long as they could still be moved by a minor chord or brought to a crisis of tears by scenes of lovers reunited, as long as there was room in their cautious hearts for games of chance and laughter in the face of God, that must surely be enough to save them at the last. If not, there was no hope for any living thing.